Book five, part one of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, part two, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book five, part one. Madame de Chateaubriand had been very ill during my travels. Her friends had often given her up for lost. In some notes, which M. de Clausel has written for his children, and which he has been good enough to permit me to look through, I find this passage. M. de Chateaubriand left on his journey to Jerusalem in the month of July 1806. During his absence, I went every day to Madame de Chateaubriand. Our traveller did me the kindness to write me a letter of several pages from Constantinople, which you will find in the drawer in our library at Cousergues. During the winter of 1806 to 1807, we knew that M. de Chateaubriand was at sea, on his way back to Europe. One day I had gone for a walk in the garden of the Tuileries with M. de Fontaine, in a terrible west wind. We had taken shelter on the terrace by the waterside. M. de Fontaine said to me, Perhaps at this minute a blast of this horrible storm will wreck your ship. We learnt since that this presentiment was very nearly realised. I make a note of this to express the lively friendship the interest in M. de Chateaubriand's literary fame, which was to increase by this voyage, the noble, the deep and rare sentiments, which animated M. de Fontaine, an excellent man whom I, too, have to thank for great services, and whom I urge you to remember in your prayers to God. If I were destined to live, and if I could cause to live in my works all the persons who are dear to me, how gladly would I take with me all my friends, full of hope, I brought home my handful of gleanings. My period of repose did not last long. By a series of arrangements, I had become the sole proprietor of the Mercure. Towards the end of June 1807, Monsieur Alexandre de Laborde published his journey in Spain. In July, I wrote the article in the Mercure, from which I have quoted certain passages, when speaking of the death of the Duc d'Enghien, when in the silence of abjection, etc. Bonaparte's successes, far from subduing me, had revolted me. I had gathered fresh energy in my opinions, and in the storms. I did not in vain carry a face bronzed by the sun, nor had I exposed myself to the wrath of the heavens, to tremble with darkened brow before man's anger. If Napoleon had done with the kings, he had not done with me. My article, falling in the midst of his successes and of his wonders, stirred France. Copies in manuscript were distributed broadcast. Several subscribers to the Mercure cut out the article and had it bound separately. It was read in the drawing-rooms and walked about from house to house. One must have lived at that time to form an idea of the effect produced by a voice resounding alone amid the silence of the world. The noble sentiments thrust down at the bottom of men's hearts revived. Napoleon flew out. One is less irritated by reason of the offence received than by reason of the idea one has formed of oneself. What? To despise his very glory? to brave for a second time the man at whose feet the universe lay prostrate. Does Chateaubriand think that I am an idiot, that I don't understand him? I will have him cut down on the steps of the Tuileries. He gave the order to suppress the Mercure and to arrest me. My property perished, my person escaped by a miracle. Bonaparte had to occupy himself with the world. He forgot me, but I remained under the burden of the threat. My position was a deplorable one. When I felt bound to act according to the inspiration of my sense of honour, I found myself burdened with my personal responsibility, and with the trouble which I caused my wife. Her courage was great, but she suffered none the less for it, and those storms successively called down upon my head disturbed her life. She had suffered so much for me during the revolution. It was natural that she should long for a little rest, the more so in that Madame de Chateaubriand admired Bonaparte unreservedly. She had no illusions as to the legitimacy. She never ceased predicting what would happen to me on the return of the Bourbons. The first book of these memoirs is dated from the Valais au Loup on the 4th of October, 1811. I there give a description of the little retreat which I bought to hide me at that time. Leaving our apartment at Madame de Coilin, we went first to live in the Rue des Saint-Pères in the Hôtel de la Valette, which took its name from the master and mistress of the hotel. Monsieur de la Valette was thick-set, wore a plum-coloured coat, and carried a gold-headed cane. He became my man of business, if I have ever had any business. He had been an officer of the buttery to the king, and what I did not eat up, he drank. 
At the end of November, seeing that the repairs to my cottage were not progressing, I determined to go and superintend them. We arrived at the valley in the evening. We did not take the ordinary road, but went in through the gate at the foot of the garden. The soil of the drives, soaked through with rain, prevented the horses from going. The carriage upset. A plaster bust of Homer placed beside Madame de Chateaubriand dashed through the window and broke its neck. A bad omen for the martyrs, at which I was then working. The house, full of workmen laughing, singing and hammering, was warm by blazing shavings and lighted by candle-ends. It looked like a hermitage illuminated at night by pilgrims in the woods. Delighted to find two rooms made fairly comfortable, in one of which supper had been laid, we sat down to table. The next morning, awakened by the sound of the hammers and the songs of the husbandmen, I saw the sun rise with less anxiety than the master of the Tuileries. I was in an endless enchantment. Without being Madame de Sévigné, I went, provided with a pair of wooden clogs, to plant my trees in the mud, to pass up and down the same walks, to look again and again at every smallest corner, to hide wherever there was a tuft of brushwood, saying to myself that this would be my park in the future, for then the future was not lacking, when, striving to-day by force of memory to reopen the closed horizon, I no longer find the same, but I meet with others. I lose myself in my vanished thoughts. The illusions into which I fall are perhaps as fair as their predecessors, only they are no longer so young. What I used to see in the splendour of the South, I now perceive by the light of the sunset. If, nevertheless, I could cease to be harassed by dreams, Bayard, summoned to surrender a place, replied, Wait till I have made a bridge of dead bodies to pass over with my garrison. I fear that, to go out, I shall need to pass over the bodies of my fancies. My trees, being as yet small, did not gather the sounds of the autumn winds, but in spring the breezes which inhaled the breath of the flowers of the neighbouring fields retained it and poured it over my valley. I made some additions to my cottage. I improved the appearance of its brick walls with a portico supported by two black marble columns and two white marble caryatids. I remembered that I had been to Athens. My plan was to add a tower to the end of my pavilion. Meantime I made counterfeit battlements on the wall, separating me from the road. I thus anticipated the medieval mania, which is stupefying us at present. The valley au is the only thing that I regret of all that I have lost. It is written that nothing shall remain to me. After the loss of my valley, I planted the infirmerie de Marie-Thérèse, which also I have lately left. I defy fate now to fix me to the smallest morsel of earth. Henceforth I shall have for a garden only those avenues, honoured with such fine names, around the Avalide, among which I stroll with my one-armed or limping colleague. Not far from those walks, Madame de Beaumont's cypress lifts its head. In those deserted spaces, the great and frivolous Duchesse de Châtillon once leant upon my arm. Now I give my arm only to time. It is very heavy. I worked with delight at my memoirs, and the martyrs made progress. I had already read some books to Monsieur de Fontaine. I had settled down in the midst of my memories, as in a large library. I consulted this and then that, and next closed the register with a sigh, for I perceived that the light, in penetrating into it, destroyed its mystery. Light up the days of life, and they will no longer be what they are. In the month of July I fell ill, and was obliged to return to Paris. The doctors rendered the illness dangerous. In the time of Hippocrates there was a dearth of dead in the lower regions, says the epigram. Thanks to our modern Hippocrates, there is an abundance to-day. This was perhaps the only moment at which, when near death, I felt a desire to live. When I felt myself lapsing into faintness, which often happened, I used to say to Madame de Chateaubriand, Do not be alarmed, I shall come too. I lost consciousness, but with great inward impatience, for I clung to God knows what. I also passionately longed to complete what I believed, and still believed, to be my most correct work. I was paying the price of the fatigue which I had undergone during my journey to the Levant. Giraudet had put the finishing touches to my portrait. He made me dark, as I then was but he put all his genius into the work. M. de Norme received the masterpiece for the salon. Like a noble-hearted courtier, he prudently put it out of sight. When Bonaparte took his view of the gallery, after examining the pictures, he asked, Where's the portrait of Chateaubriand? He knew that must be there. They were obliged to bring the outlaw from his hiding-place. Bonaparte, whose fit of generosity had evaporated, said, on inspecting the portrait, He looks like a conspirator coming down the chimney. One day, on returning alone to the valet, I was told by Benjamin the gardener 
that a fat strange gentleman had come and asked for me that finding me out he had said he would wait for me that he had had an omelette made for him and that afterwards he had flung himself on my bed i went upstairs entered my room and saw something enormous asleep shaking that mass i cried hi hi who are you the mass gave a start and sat up its head was covered with a woollen cap it wore a smock and trousers of spotted wool all in one piece its face was smeared with snuff and its tongue hung out it was my cousin moreau i had not seen him since the camp at thionville he was back from russia and wanted to enter the excise my old chicherone in paris went to die at nantes thus disappeared one of the early characters of these memoirs i hope that stretched on a couch of daffodils he still talks of my verses to madame de chastenay if that agreeable shade has descended to the elysian fields the martyrs appeared in the spring of eighteen o nine it was a conscientious piece of work i had consulted critics of taste and knowledge messieurs de fontaine bertin boissonnade Maltebrun, and i had accepted their judgment hundreds and hundreds of times i had written unwritten and rewritten the same page of all my writings this is the most noted for the correctness of the language i had made no mistake in the scheme of the book at present when my ideas have become general no one denies that the struggles of two religions one ending the other commencing afford one of the richest most fruitful and most dramatic subjects for the muses i thought therefore that i might venture to cherish some all too foolish hopes but i was forgetting the success of my first book in this country you must never reckon on two close successes one destroys the other if you have some sort of talent for prose beware of showing any for poetry if you are distinguished in literature lay no claim to politics such is the french spirit and its poverty the self-loves alarmed the jealousy surprised by an author's good fortune at the outset combine and lie in wait for the poet's second publication to take a signal vengeance tous la main dans l'encre jour de se venger i must pay for the silly admiration which i had obtained by trickery at the time of the appearance of the genie du christianisme i must be made to restore what i had stolen alas they need not have taken such pains to rob me of that which i myself did not think that i deserved if i had delivered christian rome i asked only for an obsidian crown a plat of grass culled in the eternal city the execution of the justice of the vanities was m hoffmann to whom may god grant peace the journal des débats was no longer free its proprietors had no power in it and the census registered my condemnation in its pages m hoffmann however forgave the battle of the franks and some other pieces in the work but if he thought sima d'ossé attractive he was too excellent a catholic not to grow indignant at the profane conjunction of the truths of christianity and the fables of mythology Belader did not save me it was imputed to me as a crime that i had changed tacitus german druidess into a gallic woman as though i had wanted to borrow anything beyond an harmonious name and behold we see the christians of france to whom i had rendered such great services by setting up their altars again stupidly taking it into their heads to be scandalized on the gospel word of m hoffmann the title of the martyrs had misled them they expected to read a martyrology and the tiger who tore only a daughter of homer to pieces seemed to them a sacrilege the real martyrdom of pope pius the seventh whom bonaparte had brought as a prisoner to paris did not scandalize them but they were quite roused by my unchristian fictions as they called them and it was monsieur the bishop of chartres who undertook to punish the horrible impieties of the author of the genie du christianisme alas he must realize that to-day his zeal is wanted for very different contests monsieur the bishop of chartres is the brother of my excellent friend monsieur de clausel a very great christian who did not allow himself to be carried away by so sublime a virtue as the critic his brother i thought it my duty to reply to my censors as i had done in the matter of the genie du christianisme montesquieu with his defence of the esprit des lois encouraged me i was wrong authors who are attacked might say the finest things in the world and yet excite merely the smiles of impartial minds and the ridicule of the crowd they place themselves on a bad ground the defensive position is antipathetic to the french character when in reply to objections i pointed out that in stigmatizing this or that passage they had attacked some fine relic of antiquity beaten on the facts they extricated themselves by next saying that the martyrs was a mere patchwork when i justified the simultaneous presence of the two religions by the authority of the fathers of the church themselves the reply was that at the period in which i placed the action of the martyrs 
paganism no longer existed among great minds. I believed in good faith that the work had fallen flat. The violence of the attack had shaken my conviction as an author. Some of my friends consoled me. They maintained that the prescription was unjustified, that sooner or later the public would pronounce another verdict. M. de Fontaine especially was firm. I was no Racine, but he might be a Boileau, and he never ceased saying to me, he'll come back to it. His persuasion in this regard was so deep-rooted that it inspired him with some charming stanzas, le tasse, errant de ville en ville, etc., without fear of compromising his taste or the authority of his judgment. The Martyrs has in fact retrieved itself, has obtained the honour of four consecutive editions, and has even enjoyed particular favour with men of letters. Appreciation has been shown me of a work which bears evidence of serious study, of some pains towards style, of a great reverence for language and taste. Criticism of the subject matter was promptly abandoned. To say that I had mixed profane with sacred things, because I had depicted two cults which existed side by side, and which had each its beliefs, its altars, its priests, its ceremonies, was equivalent to saying that I ought to have renounced history. For whom did the martyrs die? For Jesus Christ. To whom were they immolated? To the gods of the empire. Therefore, there were two religions. The philosophical question, namely whether under Diocletian the Greeks and Romans believed in the gods of Homer, and whether public worship had undergone any changes, was a question that did not concern me as a poet. As an historian, I might have had many things to say. All this no longer matters. The martyrs has lived, contrary to my first expectation, and I have had to occupy myself only with the care of revising its text. The fault of the martyrs has to do with the wonderful directness which, owing to what remained of my classical prejudices, I had unadvisedly employed. Startled at my own innovations, I thought it impossible to dispense with a heaven and a hell. Yet the good and bad angels sufficed to carry on the action, without delivering it to worn-out machinery. If the Battle of the Franks, Veleda, Jérôme, Augustin, Eudor, Simodosse, if all these, and the descriptions of Naples and Greece, are unable to obtain pardon for the martyrs, hell and heaven will not save it. One of the passages which most pleased M. de Fontaine was the following. Simodosse sat down at the window of the prison, and resting her head, adorned with a martyr's veil, on her hand, sighed forth these harmonious words. Cleave the calm and dazzling sea, O swift vessels of Osonia! Release the sail, O slaves of Neptune, to the amorous breath of the winds, and bend over the agile oars. Bring me back to the care of my husband and my father, on the happy shores of the Pemysus. Fly, O birds of Libya, whose supple necks so gracefully bend, fly to the summit of Ithamus, and say that the daughter of Homer shall see again the laurels of Messenia. When shall I see once more my bed of ivory, the light of day so dear to mortals, the meadow studded with flowers which a clear water bathes, which modesty adorns with her breath? The Génie du Christianisme will remain my great work, because it produced, or decided, a revolution and commenced the new era of the literary age. The case is different with the martyrs, it came after the revolution had been worked, and was only a superabundant proof of my doctrines. My style was no longer a new thing, and, except in the episode of Veleda and the picture of the manners of the Franks, my poem even feels the influence of the places which it has frequented. In it the classical dominates the romantic. Lastly, the circumstances no longer existed which contributed to the success of the Génie du Christianisme. The government, far from being favourable to me, had become hostile. The martyrs meant to me a redoubling of persecution. The frequent allusions in the portrait of Galerius and in the picture of the court of Diocletian could not fail to arouse the attention of the imperial police, the more so inasmuch as the English translator, who had no reason to observe any circumspection, and who cared not at all whether he compromised me or not, had called attention to the allusions in his preface. The publication of the martyrs was coincident with a fatal occurrence. This did not disarm the Aristarchs, thanks to the ardour with which we are animated for the powers that be. They felt that a literary criticism which tended to diminish the interest attached to my name might be agreeable to Bonaparte. The latter, like the millionaire bankers who give splendid banquets and charge their customers postage, did not disdain small profits. Armand de Chateaubriand, whom you have seen as the companion of my childhood, who appeared before you again in the Prince's army with the deaf and dumb liver, had remained in England. He married in Jersey and was charged with the correspondence of the princess. Setting sail on the 25th of September, 1808, he was landed at eleven o'clock in the same evening on the coast of Brittany, near St. Cast. The boat's crew consisted of eleven men. 
two only were frenchmen roussel and quintal armand proceeded to the house of m de launay boise lucas the elder who lived in the village of st gast where the english had once been driven back to their ships his host advised him to go back but the boat had already taken its homeward course to jersey armand having come to an arrangement with m boise lucas son handed him the dispatches with which he had been entrusted by m henri la riviere the prince's agent i went to the coast on the twenty ninth of september he says in answer to an interrogatory and waited there two nights without seeing my boat as the moon was very bright i withdrew and returned on the fourteenth or fifteenth of the month i remained till the twenty fourth of the said month i spent every night in the rocks but to no purpose my boat did not come and by day i went to the boise lucas the same boat with the same crew to which roussel and quintal belonged was to come to fetch me with regard to the precautions taken with boise lucas the elder there were none besides those which i have already enumerated the dauntless armand landed at a few steps from his paternal fields as though on the inhospitable coast of torida in vain turned his eyes over the billows by the light of the moon in search of the bark which could have saved him in former days after i had already left combourg with the intention of going to india i had cast my mournful gaze over the same billows from the rocks of st gast where armand lay from the cape of the vard where i had sat a few leagues of the sea over which our eyes have wandered in opposite directions have witnessed the cares and divided the destinies of two men joined by ties of name and blood it was also in the midst of the same waves that i met geriel for the last time often in my dreams i see geriel and armand washing the wound in their foreheads in the deep while red into my very feet stretches the sea with which we used to play in our childhood armand succeeded in embarking in a boat purchased at st malo but driven back by the north-west wind he was again obliged to put back at last on the sixth of january assisted by a sailor called jean brien he launched a little stranded boat and got hold of another which was afloat he thus describes his voyage which bears an affinity to my star and my adventures in his examination on the eighteenth of march from nine o'clock in the evening when we started till two o'clock in the morning the weather favoured us judging then that we were not far from the rocks called the manquier we lay to on our anchor intending to wait for daylight but the wind having freshened and fearing that it would grow still stronger we continued our course a few minutes later the sea became very heavy and our compass having been broken by a wave we remained uncertain as to the course we were taking the first land that came into sight on the seventh it might then be midday was the coast of normandy which obliged us to tack about and we again returned and lay to near the rocks called Ecreho, situated between the coast of normandy and jersey strong and contrary winds obliged us to remain in that position the whole of the rest of that day and of the next the eighth on the morning of the ninth as soon as it was light i said to despain that it appeared to me that the wind had decreased seeing that our boat was not working much and to look which way the wind was blowing he told me that he no longer saw the rocks near which we had dropped the anchor i then decided that we were drifting and that we had lost our anchor the violence of the storm left us no alternative but to make for the coast as we saw no land i did not know at what distance we were from it it was then that i flung my papers into the sea having taken the precaution to fasten a stone to them we then scudded before the wind and made the coast at about nine o'clock in the morning at bretville sur eye in normandy we were received on the coast by the customs officers who took me out of my boat almost dead my feet and legs were frozen we were both lodged with the lieutenant of the brigade of bretville two days later despain was taken to the prison at coutances and i have not seen him since that day a few days after i myself was transferred to the jail at that town the next day i was taken by the quartermaster to st lo and remained for eight days with the said quartermaster i appeared once before monsieur the prefect of the department and on the twenty sixth of january i left with the captain and quartermaster of the gendarme to be taken to paris where i arrived on the twenty eighth they took me to the office of monsieur de Maret at the ministry of the general police and from there to the prison of the grand force armand had the wind the waves and the imperial police against him bonaparte was in connivance with the storms the gods made a very great expenditure of wrath against a paltry existence the packet flung into the sea was cast back by it on the beach of notre dame d'alou near valognes the papers contained in this packet served as documents for the conviction there were thirty-two of them quintal returning to the sands of brittany with his boat to fetch armand had also through an obstinate fatality 
been shipwrecked in Norman waters a few days before my cousin. The crew of Quintal's boat had spoken. The prefect of saint lo had learned that M. de Chateaubriand was the leader of the prince's enterprises. When he heard that a cutter, manned with only two men, had run ashore, he had no doubt that Armand was one of the two shipwrecked men, for all the fishermen spoke of him as the most fearless man at sea that had ever been known. On the 20th of January, 1809, the prefect of the Mange reported Armand's arrest to the general police. His letter commences. My conjectures have been completely verified. Chateaubriand is arrested. It was he who landed on the coast at Bretville, and who had taken the name of John Fall. Uneasy at finding that, in spite of the very precise orders which I had given, John Fall did not arrive at saint lo I instructed Quartermaster Maudry of the Gendarme, a trustworthy and extremely active man, to go to fetch this John Fall, wherever he might be, and bring him before me, in whatever condition he was. He found him at Coutances at the moment when they were arranging to transfer him to the hospital, to treat him for his legs which were frozen. Fall appeared before me to-day. I had had Le Lièvre put in a separate room, from which he could see John Fall arrive without being observed. When Le Lièvre saw him come up a flight of steps placed near this apartment, he cried, striking his hands together and changing colour, It's Chateaubriand! However did they catch him? Le Lièvre was in no way forewarned. This exclamation was drawn from him by surprise. He asked me afterwards not to say that he had mentioned Chateaubriand's name, because he would be lost. I did not let John Fall see that I knew who he was. Armand carried to Paris and lodged at the force, underwent a secret interrogation at the military jail of the Abbey. General Hulin, who was now military commander of Paris, appointed Bertrand, a captain in the first demi-brigade of veterans, judge advocate of the military commission, instructed by a decree of the 25th of February to inquire into Armand's case. The persons implicated were Monsieur de Goyen, who had been sent by Armand to Brest, and M. de Boisé Lucas the Younger, charged to hand letters from Henri La Rivière to Messieurs Laya and Sicard in Paris. In a letter of the 13th of March, addressed to Fouché, Armand said, Let the Emperor deign to restore to liberty men now languishing in prison for having shown me too much interest. Whatever happens, let their liberty be restored to all of them alike. I recommend my unfortunate family to the Emperor's generosity. These mistakes of a man with human bowels, addressing himself to an hyena, are painful to see. Bonaparte, besides, was not the lion of Florence. He did not give up the child on observing the tears of the mother. I had written to ask Fouché for an audience. He granted me one, and assured me, with all the self-possession of revolutionary frivolity, that he had seen Armand, that I could be easy, that Armand had told him that he would die well, and that, in fact, he wore a very resolute air. Had I proposed to Fouché that he should die, would he have preserved that deliberate tone and that superb indifference with regard to himself? I applied to Madame de Remissa, begging her to remit to the Empress a letter containing a request for justice, or for mercy, to the Emperor. Madame la Duchesse de saint lier told me, at Arenberg, of the fate of my letter. Josephine gave it to the Emperor, he seemed to hesitate on reading it, and then, coming upon some words which offended him, he impatiently flung it into the fire. I had forgotten that one should show pride only on one's own behalf. Monsieur de Goyon, condemned with Armand, underwent his sentence. Yet Madame la Baronne Duchesse de Montmorency had been induced to interest herself in his favour. She was the daughter of Madame de Matignon, with whom the Goyons were allied. A Montmorency in service ought to have obtained anything, if the prostitution of a name were enough to win over an old monarchy to a new power. Madame de Goyon, though unable to save her husband, saved young Boisé Lucas. Everything combined towards this misfortune, which struck only unknown persons. One would have thought that the downfall of a world was in question, Storms upon the waves, ambushes on land, Bonaparte, the sea, the murderers of Louis XVI, and perhaps some passion, the mysterious soul of mundane catastrophes. People have not even perceived all these things. It all struck me alone, and lived in my memory only. What mattered to Napoleon, the insects crushed by his hand upon his diadem? On the day of execution, I wished to accompany my comrade on his last battlefield. I found no carriage and hastened on foot to the Plan de Grenelle. I arrived all perspiring, a second too late. Armand had been shot against the surrounding wall of Paris. His skull was fractured, a butcher's dog was licking up his blood and his brains. I followed the cart which took the bodies of Armand and his two companions, plebeian and noble, Quintal and Goyon, to the Vaugirard Cemetery, where I had buried Monsieur de la Harpe. I saw my cousin for the last time, without being able to recognise him. The lead had disfigured him. He had no face left. I could not remark the ravages of years in it, nor even see death within its shapeless and bleeding orb. 
He remained young in my memory as at the time of the siege of Thionville. He was shot on Good Friday. The crucifix appears to me at the extremity of all my misfortunes. When I walk on the rampart of the Plain de Grenelle, I stop to look at the imprint of the firing still marked upon the wall. If Bonaparte's bullets had left no other traces, he would no longer be spoken of. Strange concatenation of destinies. General Hulin, the military commander of Paris, appointed the commission which ordered Armand's brains to be blown out. He had in former days been appointed president of the commission which shattered the head of the Duc d'Enghien. Ought he not to have abstained after his first misfortune from all connection with courts martial? And I have spoken of the death of the descendant of the great Condé, without reminding General Hulin of the part which he played in the execution of the humble soldier, my kinsman. No doubt I, in my turn, had received from heaven my commission to judge the judges of the tribunal of Vincennes. The year 1811 was one of the most remarkable in my literary career. I published the Itinéraire de Paris à Jerusalem, I accepted M. de Chenier's place at the Institute, and I began to write the memoirs which I am now finishing. The success of the Itinéraire was as complete as that of the martyrs had been disputed. There is no scribbler, however inconsiderable, but receives letters of congratulation on the appearance of his farrago. Among the new compliments which were addressed to me, I do not feel at liberty to suppress the letter of a man of virtue and merit, who has produced two works of recognised authority, leaving hardly anything to be said on Bossuet and Fenelon. The Bishop of Alais, Cardinal de Bosset, is the biographer of those two great prelates. He goes beyond all praise with reference to me. That is the accepted usage in writing to an author, and does not count. But the Cardinal at least shows the general opinion of the moment on the itinéraire. He foresees, with respect to Carthage, the objections of which my geographical feeling might be the object. In any case, that feeling has prevailed, and I have set Dido's ports in their places. My readers will be interested to recognise in this letter the diction of a select society, a style rendered grave and sweet by politeness, religion and manner, an excellence of tone from which we are so far removed to-day. The Moisson by Longjumeau, saint et 25th March, 1811. You should, sir, have received, and you have received, the just tribute of the public gratitude and satisfaction. But I can assure you that not one of your readers has enjoyed your interesting work with a truer sentiment than myself. You are the first and only traveller, who has had no need of the aid of engraving and drawing to place before the eyes of his readers the places and monuments which recall fine memories and great images. Your soul has felt all, your imagination depicted all, and the reader feels with your soul and sees with your eyes. I could convey to you but very feebly the impression which I received from the very first pages when skirting in your company the coast of Corfu, and when witnessing the landing of all those eternal men whom opposite destinies have successively driven thither. A few lines have sufficed you to engrave the traces of their footsteps for all time. They will always be found in your itinéraire, which will preserve them more faithfully than so many marbles, which have been incapable of keeping the great names confided to them. I now know the monuments of Athens in the way in which one likes to know them. I had already seen them in beautiful engravings, I had admired them, but I had not felt them. One too often forgets that, if architects need exact descriptions, measurements, and proportions, men need to recognise the mind and the genius which have conceived the idea of those great monuments. You have restored to the pyramids that noble and profound intention which frivolous declaimers had not even perceived. How thankful I am to you, sir, for delivering to the just execration of all time that stupid and ferocious people which, since twelve hundred years, has afflicted the fairest countries of the earth. One smiles with you at the hope of seeing it return to the desert whence it came. You have inspired me with a passing feeling of indulgence for the Arabs, for the sake of the fine comparison which you have drawn between them and the savages of North America. Providence seems to have led you to Jerusalem to assist at the last representation of the first scene of Christianity. If it be no longer granted to the eyes of men to behold that tomb, the only one which will have nothing to give up on the last day, Christians will always find it again in the Gospels, and meditative and sensitive minds in the pictures which you have drawn. The critics will not fail to reproach you with the men and incidents with which you have covered the ruins of Carthage, and which you could not have seen, since they no longer exist. But I implore you, sir, confine yourself to asking them if they themselves would not have been very sorry not to find them in those engaging pictures. You have the right, sir, to enjoy a form of glory, which belongs to you exclusively by a sort of creation, but there is an enjoyment still more satisfying to a character like yours, that is, to have endowed the creations of your genius with the nobility of your soul and the elevation of your sentiments. 
it is this which at all times will ensure to your name and memory the esteem the admiration and the respect of all friends of religion virtue and honour it is on this score that i beg you sir to accept the homage of all my sentiments l f de bosset ex bishop of alais m de chenier died on the tenth of january eighteen eleven my friends had the fatal idea of pressing me to take his place in the institute they urged that exposed as i was to the hostilities of the head of the government to the suspicions and annoyances of the police it was necessary that i should enter a body then powerful through its fame and through the men composing it that sheltered behind that buckler i should be able to work in peace i had an invincible repugnance to occupying a place even outside the government i had too clear a recollection of what the first had cost me chenier's inheritance seemed fraught with peril i should not be able to say all save by exposing myself i did not wish to pass over a regicide in silence while the cambaceres was the second person in the state i was determined to make my demands heard in favour of liberty and to raise my voice against tyranny i wanted to have my say on the horrors of seventeen ninety three to express my regrets for the fallen family of our kings to bemoan the misfortunes of those who had remained faithful to them my friends replied that i was deceiving myself that a few praises of the head of the government obligatory in the academical speech praises of which in one respect i thought bonaparte worthy would make him swallow all the truths i might wish to utter and that i should at the same time enjoy the honour of having maintained my opinions and the happiness of putting an end to the terrors of madame de chateaubriand by dint of their besetting me i yielded weary of resistance but i assured them that they were mistaken that bonaparte would not be taken in by commonplaces on his son his wife and his glory that he would feel the lesson but the more keenly for them that he would recognise the man who resigned on the death of the duc d'enghien and the writer of the article that caused the suppression of the mercure that lastly instead of ensuring my repose i should revive the persecutions directed against me they were soon obliged to recognise the truth of my words true it is that they had not foreseen the audacity of my speech i went to pay the customary visits to the members of the academy madame de vintimille took me to the abbe morellet we found him sitting in an armchair before his fire he had fallen asleep and the itinerary which he was reading had dropped from his hands waking with a start at the sound of my name announced by his man-servant he raised his head and exclaimed there are passages so long so long i told him laughing that i saw that and that i would abridge the new edition he was a good-natured man and promised me his vote in spite of atala when later the monarchie selon la charte appeared he could not recover from his astonishment that such a political work should have the singer of the daughter of the floridas for its author had grotius not written the tragedy of adam and eve and montesquieu the tombe de guide true i was neither grotius nor montesquieu the election took place i was elected by ballot with a fairly large majority i at once set to work on my speech i wrote and rewrote it a score of times never feeling satisfied with myself at one time wishing to make it possible for me to read i thought it too strong at another my anger returning i thought it too weak i did not know how to measure out the dose of academic praise if in spite of my antipathy for napoleon i had tried to render the admiration which i felt for the public portion of his life i should have gone far beyond the peroration milton whom i quote at the commencement of the speech furnished me with a model in his second defence of the people of england he made a pompous eulogy of cromwell not only the actions of our kings he says but the fabled exploits of our heroes are overcome by your achievements reflect then frequently how dear like the trust and the parent from whom you have received it that to your hands your country has commended and confided her freedom that what she lately expected from her choicest representatives she now expects now hopes from you alone o oh, reverence this high expectation this hope of your country relying exclusively upon yourself reverence the glances and the gashes of those brave men who have so nobly struggled for liberty under your auspices as well as the shades of those who perished in the conflict reverence finally yourself and suffer not that liberty for the attainment of which you have endured so many hardships and encountered so many perils to sustain any violation from your own hands or any encroachment from those of others without our freedom in fact you cannot yourself be free for it is justly ordained by nature that he who invades the liberty of others shall in the very outset lose his own and be the first to feel the servitude which he has induced johnson quoted only the praises given to the protector in order to place the republican in contradiction with himself the fine passage which i have just translated contains its own qualification of those praises johnson's criticism is forgotten milton's defence has remained 
all that belongs to the strife of parties and the passions of the moment dies like them and with them end of book five part one volume three Book five, part two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book five, part two. When my speech was ready, I was sent for to read it to the committee appointed to hear it. It was rejected by the committee, with the exception of two or three members. It was a sight to see the terror of the bold Republicans who listened to me, and who were alarmed by the independence of my opinions. They shuddered with indignation and fright at the mere word of liberty. M. Daru took the speech to St. Cloud. Bonaparte declared that, if it had been delivered, he would have closed the doors of the Institute, and flung me into a subterranean dungeon for the rest of my life. I received the following note from M. Daru st cloud twenty eighth april eighteen eleven i have the honour to inform monsieur de chateaubriand that when he has the time or occasion to come to st cloud i shall be able to return to him the speech which he was good enough to entrust to me i take this opportunity to repeat to him the assurance of the high consideration with which i have the honour to salute him daru i went to st cloud monsieur daru returned me the manuscript crossed out in places and scored ab irato with parentheses and pencil marks by bonaparte the lion's claw had been dug in everywhere, and I experienced a sort of pleasure of irritation in imagining that I felt it in my side. M. Daru did not conceal Napoleon's anger from me, but he told me that, if I kept the peroration, with the exception of a few words, and changed almost the whole of the rest, I should be received with great applause. The speech had been copied out at the palace. Some passages had been suppressed and others interpolated. Not long after, it appeared in the provinces printed in that fashion this speech is one of the best proofs of the independence of my opinions and the consistency of my principles m surat who was free and firm said that if it had been read in the open academy it would have brought down the rafters of the hall with applause can you indeed imagine the warm praises of liberty uttered in the midst of the servility of the empire i had kept the scored manuscript with religious care ill fortune willed that when i left the infirmerie de marie therese it was burnt with a heap of papers nevertheless the readers of these memoirs shall not be deprived of it one of my colleagues had the generosity to take a copy of it here it is when milton published paradise lost not a voice was raised in the three kingdoms of great britain to praise a work which in spite of its numerous defects remains nevertheless one of the noblest monuments of the human mind the english homer died forgotten and his contemporaries left to futurity the task of immortalizing the singer of eden have we here one of the great instances of literary injustice of which examples are presented by nearly every century no gentlemen the english but recently escaped from the civil wars were unable to bring themselves to celebrate the memory of a man who was remarked for the ardour of his opinions in a time of calamity what shall we reserve they asked for the tomb of the citizen who devotes himself to the safety of his country if we lavish honours upon the ashes of him who at most is entitled to claim our generous indulgence posterity will do justice to milton's memory but we owe a lesson to our sons we must teach them by our silence that talents are a baleful gift when allied with the passions and that it is better to condemn oneself to obscurity than to achieve celebrity through one's country's misfortunes shall i gentlemen imitate this memorable example or shall i speak to you of the person and works of m chenier to reconcile your usages and my opinions i feel it my duty to adopt a middle course between absolute silence and a thorough consideration but whatever the words I may utter, no rancour will poison this address. Should you find in me the frankness of my fellow countryman Duclos, I hope also to prove to you that I possess the same loyalty. Doubtless it would have been curious to see what a man in my position, holding my principles and my opinions, could have to say of the man whose place I occupy to-day. It would be interesting to examine the influence of revolutions upon literature, to show how systems can mislead talent and direct it into fallacious ways which seem to lead to fame and only end in oblivion if milton despite his political aberrations has left works which posterity admires it is because milton without repenting his errors withdrew from a society which was withdrawing from him to seek in religion the assuagement of his ills and the source of his glory 
deprived of the light of heaven he created for himself a new earth a new sun and quitted so to speak a world where he had seen naught save misery and crime he set in the bars of eden that primitive innocence that blessed felicity which reigned beneath the tents of jacob and rachel and he placed in the lower regions the torments passions and remorse of the men whose furies he had shared unfortunately the works of m chenier though they show the germ of a remarkable talent glow with neither that antique simplicity nor that sublime majesty the author was distinguished for an eminently classical mind none better understood the principles of ancient and modern literature the stage eloquence history criticism satire he embraced all these but his writings bear the impress of the disastrous days that witnessed his birth too often dictated by the spirit of party they have been applauded by factions shall i in discussing my predecessor's works separate what has already passed away like our discords and what will perhaps survive like our glory here we find the interests of society and the interests of literature confounded i cannot forget the first sufficiently to occupy myself solely with the second wherefore gentlemen i am obliged either to keep silence or to raise political questions there are persons who would make of literature an abstract thing and isolate it in the midst of human affairs such persons will say to me why keep silence treat m chenier's works only from the literary point of view that is to say gentlemen that i must abuse your patience and my own by repeating commonplaces which you can find anywhere and which you know better than i man is changed with the times heirs to a long series of peaceful years our foreigners were able to indulge in purely academic discussions which were even less a proof of their talent than of their happiness but we who remain the victims of a great shipwreck no longer have what is needed to relish so perfect a calm our ideas our minds have taken a different direction the man has in us taken the place of the academician by divesting literature of all its futility we now behold it only in the light of our mighty memories and of the experience of our adversity what after a revolution which has caused us in a few years to live through the events of many centuries shall the writer be forbidden all lofty considerations shall he be denied the right to examine the serious side of objects shall he spend a trivial life occupied with grammatical quibbles rules of taste petty literary judgments shall he grow old bound in the swaddling clothes of his cradle shall he not show at the end of his days a brow furrowed by his long labours by his grave reflections and often by those manly sufferings which add to the greatness of mankind what important cares then will have whitened his hair the miserable sorrows of self-love and the puerile sports of the mind surely gentlemen that would be treating ourselves with a very strange contempt speaking for myself i cannot thus belittle myself nor reduce myself to the condition of childhood at the age of strength and reason i cannot confine myself within the narrow circle which they would trace around the writer for instance gentlemen if i wish to pass a eulogy on the man of letters on the man of the court who presides over this meeting do you believe that i would content myself with praising in him the light and ingenious french wit which he received from his mother and of which he displays to us the last model no assuredly i should wish to make glow once more in all its brilliancy the noble name which he bears i should mention the duc de boufflet who forced the austrians to raise the blockade of genoa i should speak of the marshal his father of the governor who held the ramparts of lille against the enemies of france and who by that memorable defence consoled a great king's unhappy old age it was of that companion of turenne that madame de maintenon said in him the heart was the last to die lastly i should go back to that louis de boufflet called the robust who displayed in combat the vigour and valour of hercules thus at the two extremities of this family i should find force and grace the knight and the troubadour they say that the french are sons of hector i would rather believe that they descend from achilles for like that hero they wield both the lyre and the sword if i wish gentlemen to talk to you of the celebrated poet who sang the charms of nature in such brilliant tones do you think that i would confine myself to pointing out to you the admirable flexibility of a talent which succeeded in rendering with equal distinction the regular beauties of virgil and the less correct beauties of milton no i would also show you the poet refusing to part from his unfortunate countrymen accompanying them with his lyre to foreign shores singing their sorrows to console them an illustrious exile among that crowd of banished men whose number i increased it is true that his age and his infirmities his talents and his glory had not protected him against persecution in his own country men tried to make him purchase peace with verses unworthy of his muse and his muse could sing only the redoubtable immortality of crime and the reassuring immortality of virtue rassurez-vous vous êtes immortel if again i wish to speak to you of a friend very dear to my heart 
one of those friends who, according to Cicero, render prosperity more brilliant and adversity less irksome, I shall extol the refinement and purity of his taste, the exquisite elegance of his prose, the beauty, the strength, the harmony of his verses, which, while formed after the great models, are nevertheless distinguished by their original character. I should extol that superior talent which has never known the feelings of envy, that talent made happy by every success other than its own, that talent which, for ten years, has felt all that has happened to me of an honourable nature, with a deep and simple joy known only to the most generous characters and the liveliest friendship. But I should not omit my friend's political side, I should depict him at the head of one of the principal bodies of the state, delivering those speeches which are masterpieces of propriety, moderation, and exaltedness. I should represent him sacrificing the gentle commerce of the muses to occupations which would no doubt be without charm, if one did not abandon oneself to them, in the hope of forming children capable of one day following the example of their fathers and avoiding their errors. In speaking of the men of talent of whom this meeting is composed, I could not therefore prevent myself from considering them from the point of view of morality and society. One is distinguished among you by a refined, delicate, and sagacious wit, by an urbanity nowadays so rare, and by the most honourable constancy in his moderate opinions. Another, under the ice of age, found the warmth of youth, wherewith to plead the cause of the unfortunate. A third, an elegant historian and agreeable poet, becomes more venerable and more dear to us by the memory of a father, and a son, both mutilated in the service of the country. Yet another, by restoring their hearing to the deaf, their speech to the dumb, recalls to us the miracles of the Gospels, to the cult of which he has devoted himself. Are there not, gentlemen, among you some witnesses of your former triumphs, who can tell the worthy heir of the Chancelier d'Agso how his grandsire's name was once applauded in this assembly? I pass to the favourite nurslings of the Nine Sisters, and I see the venerable author of Oedipe retired in his solitude, and Sophocles forgetting at Colonus, the glory that calls him back to Athens. How greatly must we cherish the other sons of Melpomene, who have interested us in the misfortunes of our fathers? Every French heart has throbbed anew at the presentiment of the death of Henry the Fourth. The tragic muse has re-established the honour of those gallant knights, dastardly betrayed by history, and nobly revenged by one of our modern Euripides. Coming to the successors of Anacreon, I would pause at the amiable man, who, similar to the veteran of Teos, still retells, after fifteen lustra, those love-songs, which one begins to write at fifteen years. I would also, gentlemen, go to seek your renown on the stormy seas which were formerly guarded by the giant Adamastor, and which became appeased by the charming names of Eleanor and Virginie, tibi redent e quora. Alas, too many of the talents in our midst have been wandering and restless. Has poetry not sung in harmonious verse of the art of Neptune, that so fatal art which transported it to distant shores, and has not French eloquence, after defending the altar and the state, withdrawn, as though into its source, to the land where St. Ambrose first saw the light? Why can I not here place all the members of this assembly in a picture the colours of which have not been embellished by flattery? For if it be true that envy sometimes obscures the estimable qualities of men of letters, it is still more true that this class of men is distinguished by lofty sentiments, by disinterested virtues, by the hatred of oppression, devotion to friendship, and fidelity to misfortune. It is thus, gentlemen, that I love to consider a subject from all its aspects, and that I love especially to give a serious character to literature, by applying it to the most exalted subjects of morality, philosophy, and history. With this independence of mind I must needs abstain from touching upon works which it is impossible to examine without irritating the passions. Were I to speak of the tragedy of Charles IX, could I refrain from avenging the memory of the Cardinal de Lorraine, and discussing the strange lesson there given to kings, Caius Gracchus, Callus, Henri the Eighth, Fenelon, would in many respects present to me a distortion of history upon which to rest the same doctrines. When I read the satires, I there find immolated men occupying places in the first ranks of this assembly. Nevertheless, written as they are in a pure, elegant, and easy style, they agreeably recall the school of Voltaire, and I should take the more pleasure in praising them inasmuch as my own name has not escaped the author's malice. But let us leave on one side works which would give rise only to painful recriminations. I will not disturb the memory of a writer who was your colleague, and who still numbers friends and admirers among you. He will owe to religion, which appeared to him so contemptible in the writings of those who defend it, the peace which I wish to his tomb. But even here, gentlemen, shall I not have the misfortune to strike upon a rock? For, in offering to M. Chenier this tribute of respect, which is due to all the dead, I fear to meet beneath my steps ashes very differently illustrious 
If ungenerous interpretations would impute this involuntary emotion to me as a crime, I should take refuge at the foot of those expiatory altars, which a powerful monarch erects to the manes of outraged dynasties. Ah, how much happier would it have been for M. Chenier not to have taken part in those public calamities, which at last fell back upon his head, he has known like myself what it means to lose in the storms a fondly cherished brother. What would our unhappy brothers have said had God summoned them on the same day before his tribunal? If they had met at the hour of death, before mingling their blood, they would doubtless have cried to us, Cease your intestine wars, return to thoughts of love and peace, death strikes all parties alike, and your cruel divisions cost us our youth and our life. That would have been their fraternal cry. If my predecessor could hear these words, which now console only his shade, he would appreciate the tribute which I am here paying to his brother. For he was by nature generous. It was even this generosity of character which drew him into new ideas. Very seductive, no doubt, since they promised to restore to us the virtues of Fabricius. But soon, deceived in his hopes, he found his mood becoming embittered, his talent changing its nature. Removed from the poet's solitude into the midst of factions, how could he have abandoned himself to those sentiments which make the charm of life? Happy had he seen no sky save the sky of Greece, under which he was born, had he set eyes upon no ruins save those of Sparta and Athens. I should perhaps have met him in his mother's beautiful country, and we would have sworn mutual friendship on the banks of the Permessus. Or else, since he was to return to his paternal fields, why did he not follow me to the deserts upon which I was flung by our tempests? The silence of the forest would have calmed that troubled soul, and the huts of the savages would perhaps have reconciled him to the palaces of kings. Vain wish! M. Chenet remained upon the stage of our excitements and our sorrows, attacked while still in his youth by a mortal malady. You have seen him, gentlemen, droop slowly towards the tomb, and leave for ever. I have not been told of his last moments. None of us who have lived through the troubles and excitement shall escape the eyes of history. Who can flatter himself that he shall be found stainless in a time of frenzy, when none has the entire use of his reason? Let us then be full of indulgence for others. Let us excuse that of which we cannot approve. Such is human weakness that talent, genius, virtue itself are sometimes able to overstep the limits of duty. M. Chenier worshipped liberty. Can we ascribe it to him as a crime? The knights themselves, were they to issue from their tombs, would follow the light of our century. We should see that illustrious alliance formed between honour and liberty, as under the reign of the Valois, upon our monuments. Gothic battlements crowned with infinite grace, the orders borrowed from the Greeks. Is not liberty the greatest of benefits and the first of man's needs? It kindles genius, it elevates the heart. It is as necessary to the friend of the muses as the air he breathes. The arts are, to a certain point, able to live in dependence, because they make use of a language apart, which is not understood by the crowd. But letters, which speak an universal language, pine and perish in irons. How shall one compose pages worthy of the future, if one must forbid oneself in writing every magnanimous sentiment, every great and powerful thought? Liberty is so naturally the friend of science and literature, that she takes refuge with them when she is banished from the midst of the peoples. And it is we, gentlemen, whom she charges to write her annals and to revenge her on her enemies, to hand down her name and her cult to posterity for all time. To prevent any mistake in the interpretation of my thought, I declare that I am here speaking only of the liberty which is born of order and gives birth to laws, and not of that liberty which is the daughter of license and the mother of slavery. The wrong of the author of Charles the Ninth did not therefore lie in offering his incense to the form of these divinities, but in believing that the rights which she gives us are incompatible with a monarchical form of government. A Frenchman displays in his opinions that independence which other nations show in their laws. Liberty is for him a sentiment rather than a principle, and he is a citizen by instinct and a subject by choice. If the writer whose loss you are mourning had made this reflection, he would not have embraced in one and the same love the liberty that creates and the liberty that destroys. Gentlemen, I have finished the task which the customs of the Academy have laid upon me. On the point of ending this speech I am struck with an idea which saddens me. It is not long since M. Chenier pronounced upon my writing some findings which he was preparing to publish, and to-day it is I who am judging my judge. I say, in all the sincerity of my heart, that I would rather continue exposed to the satire of an enemy, and live peacefully in solitude, than bring home to you by my presence in your midst the rapid succession of men upon earth, the sudden apparition of that death which overthrows our projects and our hopes, which snatches us away at a stroke, and which sometimes hands over our memory to men entirely opposed to us in sentiment and principle. 
This platform is a sort of battlefield in which talents come by turns to shine and die. What diverse geniuses has it not seen pass? Corneille, Racine, Boileau, La Bruyère, Bossuet, Fenelon, Voltaire, Buffon, Montesquieu. Who would not be afraid, gentlemen, to think that he is about to form a link in the chain of that illustrious lineage? Overcome by the weight of those immortal names, and unable to make myself recognised through my talents as the lawful heir, I will at least try to prove my descent by my sentiments. When my turn shall have come to yield my place to the orator who is to speak on my tomb, he may treat my work severely, but he will be obliged to say that I love my motherland passionately, that I would have endured a thousand ills rather than cost my country a single tear, that I would without hesitation have made the sacrifice of my days to those noble sentiments which alone give value to life and dignity to death. But what a moment have I chosen, gentlemen, to speak to you of mourning and obsequies? Are we not surrounded by scenes of festivity? A solitary traveller, I was meditating a few days since, on the ruin of the destroyed empires, and now I see a new empire arise. Scarce have I quitted the graves in which the buried nations sleep, and I perceive a cradle laden with the destinies of the future. The acclamations of the soldier resound on every hand. Caesar mounts to the capital. The nations tell of marvels, of monuments upraised, cities beautified, the frontiers of the country bathed by those distant seas which bore the ships of Scipio, and by those remote waters which Germanicus did not see. While the triumpher advances surrounded by his legions, what shall the tranquil children of the muses do? They will go before the car to add the olive branch of peace to the palms of victory, to mingle with the warlike recitals the touching images which caused Aemilius Paulus to weep over the misfortunes of Perseus. And you, daughter of the Caesars, come forth from your palace with your young son in your arms. Come, to add mercy to greatness, come, to soften victory and to temper the glitter of arms, by the gentle majesty of a queen and a mother. In the manuscript which was handed back to me, the commencement of the speech, which relates to the opinions of Milton, was struck out from one end to the other by Bonaparte's hand. A part of my protest against the isolation from affairs of state, in which it was desired to keep literature, was also stigmatised with the pencil. The eulogy of the Abbé de Lille, which recalled the emigration, and the fidelity of the poet to the misfortunes of the royal family, and to the sufferings of his companions in exile, was placed between brackets. The eulogy of M. de Fontaine had a cross set against it. Almost all that I said of M. Chenier, of his brother, of my own, of the expiatory altars which were being prepared at Saint-Denis, was slashed with pencil marks. The paragraph commencing with the words, M. Chenier worshipped liberty, etc., had a double longitudinal line drawn through it. Nevertheless, the agents of the empire, when publishing the speech, kept this paragraph pretty correctly. All was not ended when they had handed me back my speech. They wanted to force me to write a second. I declared that I stood by the first, and that I would write no other. The committee then declared to me that I should not be received into the academy. Gracious, generous, and courageous persons, unknown to myself, interested themselves in me. Mrs. Lindsay, who at the time of my return to France in 1800, had brought me from Calais to Paris, talked to Madame Gay. The latter addressed herself to Madame Regnaud de Saint-Jean d'Angely, who asked the Duc de Rovigo to leave me alone. The women of that time interposed their beauty between power and misfortune. All this perturbation was prolonged by the decennial prizes until the year 1812. Bonaparte, who was persecuting me, sent to the Academy to ask, in the matter of those prizes, why they had not put the Genie du Christianisme on their list. The Academy explained. Several of my colleagues wrote their unfavourable judgment of my work. I might have said what a Greek poet said to a bird. Daughter of Attica, nurtured on honey, thou who singest so well, Thou snatchest a grasshopper, a fine songstress like thyself, and carriest her for food to thy young ones. Both of you have wings, both inhabit these regions, both celebrate the birth of spring. Will thou not restore to her her liberty? It is not just that a songstress should die by the beak of one of her fellows. This mixture of anger against and attraction for me displayed by Bonaparte is constant and strange. But now he threatens, and suddenly he asks the Institute why it has not mentioned me on the occasion of the decennial prizes. He goes further, he declares to Fontaine that, since the Institute does not think me worthy to compete for the prizes, he will give me one, that he will appoint me superintendent-general of all the libraries of France, a superintendence with a salary attached to a first-class embassy. Bonaparte's original idea of employing me in a diplomatic career did not leave him. He would not admit, for a reason well known to himself, that I had ceased to form part of the Ministry of External Relations, and yet, in spite of this proposed munificence, his prefect of police invited me some time later to remove myself from Paris, and I went to continue my memoirs at Dieppe. 
Bonaparte stooped to play the part of a teasing schoolboy. He disinterred the essai sur les révolutions and delighted in the war which he brought down upon me on this subject. A certain M. Damas de Raymond constituted himself my champion. I went to thank him in the Rue Vivienne. He had a death's head on his mantelpiece among his knick-knacks. Some time later he was killed in a duel, and his charming features went to join the frightful face that seemed to call to him. Everyone fought in those days. One of the police spies charged with the arrest of Georges received a bullet in the head from him. To cut short my powerful adversary's unfair attack, I applied to that M. de Pomerel, of whom I spoke to you at the time of my first arrival in Paris. He had become director-general of the state printing works and of the department of books. I asked him for leave to reprint the essay in its entirety. My correspondence and the result of that correspondence can be seen in the preface to the 1826 edition of the Essai sur les Révolutions, volume 2 of the complete works. Moreover, the imperial government was exceedingly right to refuse its assent to the reprinting of the work in its entirety. The essay was not, having regard both to the liberties and to the legitimate monarchy, a book which should be published while despotism and usurpation held sway. The police gave itself airs of impartiality by allowing something to be said in my favour, and it laughed while preventing me from doing the only thing capable of defending me. On the return of Louis the Eighteenth, the essay was exhumed anew, as in the time of the empire they had wished to make use of it against me in a political respect so in the days of the restoration they tried to plead it against me in a religious respect i have made so complete an apology for my errors in the notes to the new edition of the essay historique that there is nothing left wherewith to reproach me posterity will come and will pronounce on both book and commentary if such old trash is still able to interest it I venture to hope that it will judge the essay as my grey head has judged it, for, as one advances in life, one assumes the equity of the future towards which one approaches. The book and the notes place me before the eyes of men, such as I was at the commencement of my career, and such as I am at the close of that career. Moreover, this work which I have treated with pitiless rigour offers the compendium of my existence as a poet, a moralist, and a future politician. The pith of the work is overflowing. The boldness of the opinions urged as far as it will go. It must needs be admitted that, in the various roads upon which I have embarked, I have never been guided by prejudice, that I have never been blind in whatsoever cause, that no interest has led me on, that the sides which I have taken have always been those of my choice. In the essay, my independence in matters of religion and politics is complete. I examine everything. A republican, I serve the monarchy. A philosopher, I honour religion. These are not contradictions. They are forced consequences of the uncertainty of theory and the certainty of practice among men. My mind, constructed to believe in nothing, not even in myself, constructed to despise everything, splendours and miseries, peoples and kings, has nevertheless been dominated by an instinct of reason, which commanded it to submit to all that is recognised as fine, religion, justice, humanity, equality, liberty, glory, that which people to-day dream concerning the future, that which the present generation imagines itself to have discovered concerning a society yet to be born, founded upon principles quite different from those of the old society, is announced positively in the essay. I have anticipated by thirty years those who call themselves the proclaimers of an unknown world. My acts have belonged to the ancient city, and my thoughts to the new, the former to my duty, the latter to my nature. The essay was not an impious book, it was a book of doubt and sorrow. I have already said so. For the rest, I have had to exaggerate my fault to myself, and to redeem with ideas of order so many passionate ideas strewn over my works. I fear lest, at the commencement of my career, I may have done harm to youth. I owe it a reparation, and at least I owe it other lessons. Let it learn that one can struggle successfully with a troubled nature. I have seen moral beauty, the divine beauty, superior to every earthly dream. It needs but a little courage to reach it and keep to it. In order to finish what I have to say touching my literary career, I must mention the work which commenced it, and which remained in manuscript until the year in which I inserted it in my complete works. At the beginning of the Natchez, the preface described how the work was recovered in England, thanks to the trouble and the obliging research of Messieurs de Tuisy. A manuscript from which I have been able to extract Atala, René, and several descriptions included in the Génie du Christianisme, is not absolutely barren. This first manuscript was written in one piece, without sections. All the subjects were confused in it, journeys, natural history, the dramatic portion, etc., but, besides this manuscript, composed in one stroke, there existed another, divided into books. In this second work, I had not only proceeded to the separation of the matter, but I had also changed the character of the composition, by altering it from the romantic to the idyllic. 
a young man who promiscuously heaps up his ideas his inventions his studies and the results of his reading is bound to produce chaos but also in this chaos there is a certain fecundity which belongs to the potency of his age to me happened that which has perhaps happened to no other author i read again after a lapse of thirty years a manuscript which i had totally forgotten i had one danger to fear in repassing the brush over the picture i might wipe out the colours a surer but less rapid hand ran the risk while obliterating some incorrect features of causing the liveliest touches of youth to disappear it was necessary to preserve the independence and so to speak the passion of the composition the foam must be left on the bit of the youthful courser if in the natchez there are things which i would hazard only in trembling to-day there are also things which i would no longer write especially rene's letter in the second volume it is in my first manner and reproduces all rene i do not know that the renes who followed in my steps can have said anything more nearly approaching folly the natchez opens with an invocation to the desert and to the star of the night the supreme divinities of my youth in the shade of the american forests i will sing airs of solitude such as mortal ears have not yet heard i will relate your adversities o natchez o nation of louisiana of whom naught save the memories remain should the misfortunes of an obscure dweller in the woods have less claim upon our tears than those of other men and are the mausoleums of the kings in our temples more touching than the tomb of an indian under his native oak and thou torch of meditation star of the night be for me the star of pindus go before my steps across the unknown regions of the new world to reveal to me by thy light the enchanting secrets of those deserts my two natures lie mingled in this singular work particularly in the primitive original in it are found political incidents and romantic intrigues but across the narrative there is heard throughout a voice that sings and that seems to come from an unknown region from eighteen twelve to eighteen fourteen but two years are wanting to end the empire and those two years of which we have seen something by anticipation were employed by me in researches into french history and in the writing of some books of these memoirs but i did not print anything more my life of poetry and erudition was really closed by the publication of my three great works the genie du christianisme the martyrs and the itinéraire my political writings began with the restoration with those writings also began my active political existence here therefore ends my literary career properly so called carried away by the flood of years i had omitted it not until this year eighteen thirty nine have i recalled the bygone times of eighteen hundred to eighteen fourteen this literary career as you have been free to convince yourselves was no less disturbed than my career as a traveller and a soldier there were also labours, encounters, and blood in the arena. All was not muses and Castalian spring. My political career was even stormier. Perhaps some remains may mark the spot where stood my gardens of Academus. The genie du Christianisme commences the religious revolution against the philosophism of the eighteenth century. I was at the same time preparing the revolution which threatens our language, for there can be no renewal of ideas without an accompanying renewal of style. Will there be no other forms of art at present unknown when i am gone will it be possible to start from our studies of to-day in order to make progress as we ourselves have taken a step forward by starting from past studies are there limits which one could not overstep because one would then run against the nature of things do not those limits lie in the division of the modern languages in the decay of those same languages in human vanities such as modern society has made it languages do not follow the movement of civilization until they are on the point of attaining the period of their perfection having reached the zenith they remain stationary for a moment and then descend without being able to ascend again now the story which i am finishing joins the first books of my political life written previously at different dates i feel a little more courage on returning to the finished portions of my edifice when i resume my work i tremble lest the old son of Celis should see the golden trowel of the builder of troy turn into a trowel of lead and yet it seems to me that my memory when bidden to pour me out my recollections has not failed me too greatly have you felt the ice of winter to a great extent in my narrative do you find an enormous difference between the extinct ashes which i have striven to revive and the living persons whom i have shown you in telling you of my early youth my years are my secretaries when one of them comes to die he passes the pen to his younger brother and i continue to dictate as they are of one family they write very nearly the same hand. End of Book 5, Part 2
Books one and two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume three, Part the third. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume three, Part three, by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Books one and two, the last days of the empire youth is a charming thing it sets out at life's commencement crowned with flowers as did the athenian fleet going to conquer sicily and the delightful plains of enna the prayers offered aloud by the priest of neptune libations are made from goblets of gold the crowd lining the coast unites its invocations to those of the pilot the paean is sung while the sail is unfurled to the rays and to the breath of dawn Alcibiades, arrayed in purple and beautiful as love, is noticeable on the triremes, proud of the seven chariots which he has launched on the Olympian race-course. But scarce is the isle of Alcinous passed, when the illusion vanishes. Alcibiades, banished, goes to grow old far away from his country, and to die pierced with arrows on Timandra's bosom. The companions of his early hopes, enslaved at Syracuse, have nothing to alleviate the weight of their chains but a few verses of Euripides. You have seen my youth quitting the shore. It had not the beauty of the pupil of Pericles, educated upon the knees of Aspasia, but it had the same morning hours, and longings, and dreams, God knows. I have described those dreams to you. Today, returning to land after many an exile, I have nothing more to tell you but truths, sad as my age. If at times I still sound the chords of the lyre, these are the last harmonies of the poet seeking to cure himself of the wounds caused by the arrows of time, or to console himself for the slavery of years. You know how changeable was my life during my condition as a traveller and a soldier. You know of my literary existence from 1800 to 1813, the year in which you left me at the Valais aux Loups, which still belonged to me when my political career opened. We are about to enter into that career, before penetrating into it I must needs revert to the general facts which I have overlooked while occupying myself solely with my works and my personal adventures. Those facts are of Napoleon's making. Let us therefore pass to him. Let us speak of the huge edifice which was being built outside my dreams. I now turn historian without ceasing to be an autobiographer. A public interest is about to support my private confidences. My own smaller recitals will group themselves around my narrative. When the war of the revolution broke out, the kings did not understand it. They saw a revolt where they ought to have seen the changing of the nations, the end and the commencement of a world. They flattered themselves that for them there was a question only of enlarging their states, with a few provinces taken from France. They believed in bygone military tactics, in bygone diplomatic treaties, in cabinet negotiations, and conscripts were about to set Frederick's grenadiers to flight. Monarchs were about to come to sue for peace in the anterooms of a few obscure demagogues, and awful revolutionary opinion was about to unravel the intrigues of old Europe upon the scaffolds. That old Europe thought it was fighting only France. It did not perceive that a new age was marching upon it. Bonaparte, in the course of his ever-increasing successes, seemed called upon to change the royal dynasties, to make his own the oldest of them all. He had made kings of the electors of Bavaria, Württemberg, and Saxony. He had given the crown of Naples to Murat, that of Spain to Joseph, that of Holland to Louis, that of Westphalia to Jerome. His sister, Eliza Bacciocchi, was princess of Lucca. He, on his own account, was emperor of the French, king of Italy, in which kingdom were included Venice, Tuscany, Parma, and Piacenza. Piedmont was united to France. He had consented to allow one of his captains, Bernadotte, to reign in Sweden. By the Treaty of the Confederation of the Rhine he exercised the rights of the House of Austria over Germany. He had declared himself the mediator of the Helvetian Confederation. He had laid Prussia low. Without possessing a bark, he had declared the British Isles in a state of blockade. England, in spite of her fleets, was on the point of not having a port in Europe in which to discharge a bale of merchandise or post a letter. The Papal States formed part of the French Empire. The Tiber was a French department. In the streets of Paris one saw cardinals, half-prisoners, who, putting their heads through the window of their cab, asked, Is this where the King of... lives? No, replied the porter, to whom the question was put. It's higher up. 
Austria had redeemed herself only by handing over her daughter. The raider of the south demanded Honoria from Valentinian with half of the provinces of the empire. How had those miracles been worked? What qualities were possessed by the man who gave birth to them? What qualities did he lack for their achievement? I will trace the immense fortune of Bonaparte, who, notwithstanding, passed so quickly that his days fill but a short period of the time covered by these memoirs. Fastidious productions of genealogies, cold disquisitions upon facts, insipid verifications of dates, are the burdens and servitudes of the writer. In the second book of these memoirs you have read, I had then returned from my first exile to Dieppe, I have been permitted to return to my valley. The soil trembles beneath the steps of the foreign soldier. I am writing, like the last of the Romans, to the sound of the barbarian invasion. By day I compose pages as agitated as the events of the day. At night, while the rolling of the distant cannon dies away in my solitary woods, I return to the silence of the years that sleep in the grave, and to the peace of my youngest memories. Those agitated pages which I composed by day were notes relating to the events of the moment which, when collected, formed my pamphlet, De Bonaparte et des Bourbons. I had so high an opinion of the genius of Napoleon and the gallantry of our soldiers, that an invasion by the foreigner which should be successful in its ultimate result could not enter into my head. But I thought that this invasion, by making France realise the danger to which Napoleon's ambition had brought her, would lead to a movement from within and that the enfranchisement of the French would be worked by their own hands. It was with this idea that I was writing my notes, so that, if our political assemblies should stay the march of the Allies, and resolve to sever from a great man who had become a scourge, they should know to whom to resort. The shelter seemed to me to lie in the authority, modified in accordance with the times, under which our ancestors had lived during eight centuries, when, in a storm, one finds nothing within reach, but an old edifice, all in ruins though it be, one retires to it. In the winter of 1813 to 1814, I took an apartment in the Rue de Rivoli, opposite the first gate of the Garden of the Tuileries, before which I had heard the death of the Duc d'Anguien cried. As yet there was nothing to be seen in that street, except the arcades built by the government, and a few houses rising here and there, with their lateral denticulation of projecting stones. It needed nothing less than the spectacle of the calamities weighing on France to maintain the aversion which Napoleon inspired, and at the same time to protect oneself against the admiration which he caused to revive so soon as he acted. He was the proudest genius of action that ever existed. His first campaign in Italy and his last campaign in France, I am not speaking of Waterloo, are his two finest campaigns. He was Condé in the first, Turin in the second, a great warrior in the former, a great man in the latter, but they differed in their results. By the one he gained the empire, by the other he lost it. His last hours of power, all uprooted, all barefoot as they were, could not be drawn from him like a lion's tooth, save by the efforts of the arms of Europe. The name of Napoleon was still so formidable that the hostile armies crossed the Rhine in terror. They unceasingly looked behind them, in order well to assure themselves that their retreat would be possible. Masters of Paris, they trembled yet. Alexander, casting his eyes towards Russia while entering France, congratulated the persons who were able to go away, and wrote his anxieties and regrets to his mother. Napoleon beat the Russians at Saint-Dizier, the Prussians and Russians at Brienne, as though to do honour to the fields in which he had been brought up. He routed the army of Silesia at Montmirail and Champaubert, and a portion of the main army at Montereau. He made head everywhere, went and returned on his steps, repelled the columns by which he was surrounded. The Allies proposed an armistice. Bonaparte tore up the proffered preliminaries and exclaimed, I am nearer to Vienna than the Emperor of Austria is to Paris. Russia, Austria, Prussia and England, for their mutual consolation, concluded a new treaty of alliance at Chaumont. But in reality they were alarmed at Bonaparte's resistance and were thinking of retreat. At Lyon an army was forming on the Austrian flank, Marshal So was checking the English. The Congress of Châtillon, which was not dissolved until the 18th of March, was still negotiating. Bonaparte drove Blücher from the heights of Crown. The main Allied army had triumphed on the 26th of February at bar sur aube thanks only to superiority in numbers. Bonaparte, multiplying himself, had recovered Troyes, which the Allies reoccupied. From Crown he had moved upon Rheims. Tonight, he said, 
i shall go take my father-in-law at troyes on the twentieth of march an affair took place near arsis sur aube amid a rolling fire of artillery a shell having fallen in front of a square of the guards the square appeared to make a slight movement bonaparte dashed towards the projectile the fuse of which was smoking and made his horse sniff at it the shell burst and the emperor came safe and sound from the midst of the shattered bolt the battle was to recommence the following day but bonaparte yielding to the inspiration of genius an inspiration which was none the less fatal retired in order to bear upon the rear of the confederate troops separate them from their stores and swell his own army with the garrisons of the frontier places the foreigners were preparing to fall back upon the rhine when alexander by one of these heaven-inspired impulses which change a whole world took the resolve to march upon paris the road to which was becoming free napoleon thought he would draw the mass of the enemy after him and he was followed by only ten thousand men of the cavalry whom he believed to be the advance guard of the main troops whereas they masked the real movement of the prussians and muscovites he dispersed those ten thousand horse at saint dizier and vitry and then perceived that the great allied army was not behind them that army which was flinging itself upon the capital had before it only marshals marmont and mortier with about twelve thousand conscripts napoleon hurriedly made for fontainebleau there a sainted victim retiring had left the requiter and the avenger two things in history always go side by side let a man enter upon a path of injustice and he at the same time opens for himself a path of perdition in which at a given distance the first road will converge into the second men's minds were greatly agitated the hope of at all costs seeing brought to a close a cruel war which since twenty years had been weighing down upon france sated with misfortune and glory this hope carried the day among the masses over the feeling of nationality each one thought of the part he would have to take in the approaching catastrophe every evening my friends came to talk at madame de chateaubriand's to tell and comment upon the events of the day messieurs de fontaine de clausel joubert gathered with the crowd of those transient friends whom events bring and events withdraw madame la duchesse de levy beautiful peaceful and devoted whom we shall meet again at ghent kept madame de chateaubriand faithful company madame la duchesse de durat was also in paris and i often went to see madame la marquise de montcalm sister to the duc de richelieu i continued to be persuaded despite the near approach of the battlefields that the allies would not enter paris and that a national insurrection would put an end to our fears the obsession of this idea prevented me from feeling the presence of the foreign armies as keenly as i might have done but i could not keep myself from reflecting upon the calamities to which we had subjected europe when i saw europe bring them back to us i never ceased working at my pamphlet i was preparing it as a remedy when the moment of anarchy should come to burst forth it is not thus that we write nowadays when we live at our ease with only a war of broadsheets to fear at night i turn the key in my lock i place my papers under my pillow with two loaded revolvers on my table i slept between these two muses my text was in duplicate i had written it in the form of a pamphlet which it retained and in the shape of a speech differing in some respects from the pamphlet i thought that when france rose they might assemble at the hotel de ville and i had prepared myself on two topics madame de chateaubriand wrote a few notes at various periods of our common life among those notes i find the following paragraph m de chateaubriand was writing his pamphlet de bonaparte et de bourbon if that pamphlet had been seized the result was not doubtful the sentence was the scaffold nevertheless the author displayed incredible negligence in concealing it often he would go out and leave it on the table his prudence never went beyond placing it under his pillow which he used to do before his valet a very honest fellow but liable to temptation as for me i was in a mortal fright and so soon as m de chateaubriand had gone out i used to take the manuscript and place it about my person one day while crossing the tuileries i noticed that i no longer had it and being sure that i had felt it on leaving the house i had no doubt that i had lost it on the way already i saw the fatal work in the hands of the police and m de chateaubriand arrested i fell unconscious in the middle of the garden some kind people assisted me and afterwards took me home which was not far off what torture when on climbing the stairs i hovered between a fear which was almost a certainty and a slight hope that i had forgotten to take the pamphlet as i approached my husband's bedroom i felt myself fainting once more i went in at last nothing on the table i went up to the bed i first felt the pillow i perceived nothing i lifted it up and saw the roll of papers my heart beats whenever i think of it i have never experienced such a moment of joy in my life certainly i can truthfully say 
that it would not have been so great had I seen myself released at the foot of the scaffold, for after all, it was someone dearer to me than myself whom I saw released from it. How unhappy should I be if I could have caused a moment of trouble to Madame de Chateaubriand. I had nevertheless been obliged to entrust a printer with my secret. He had consented to risk the business. According to the news of the hour, he used to return the half-composed proofs to me, or come to fetch them back, as the sound of the cannon approached or drew further from Paris. I played pitch and toss with my life in this way for nearly a fortnight. The circle was drawing closer around the capital. At every moment we heard of some progress on the part of the enemy. Russian prisoners and French wounded entered promiscuously through the barriers, drawn in carts. Some half-dead fell beneath the wheels, which they stained with their blood. Conscripts called up from the interior crossed the capital in a long file, on their way to the armies. At night one heard trains of artillery pass along the outer boulevards, and one did not know whether the distant detonations announced the decisive victory or the final defeat. The war at last came and fixed itself outside the barriers of Paris. From the top of the towers of Notre Dame, one could see the head of the Russian columns appear, like the first undulations of the tide of the sea upon a beach. I felt what a Roman must have experienced when, from the ridge of the capital, he beheld the soldiers of Alaric and the old city of the Latins at his feet, as I beheld the Russian soldiers and, at my feet, the old city of the Gauls. Farewell, then, paternal gods, hearths which preserved the traditions of the country, roofs beneath which had breathed both Virginia, sacrificed by her father to modesty and liberty, and Eloise, consecrated by love to letters and religion. Paris had not since centuries seen the smoke of an enemy's camp, and it was Bonaparte who, from triumph to triumph, brought the Thebans within sight of the women of Sparta. Paris was the bourne from which he had started to conquer the earth. He returned to it, leaving behind him the huge conflagration of his useless conquests. The people rushed to the Jardin des Plantes, which, in olden times, the fortified abbey of St. Victor might have been able to protect. The small world of swans and plantain trees, to which our power had promised an eternal peace, was perturbed. From the summit of the labyrinth, looking over the great cedar, over the public granaries which Bonaparte had not had time to complete, beyond the site of the Bastille and the keep of Vincennes, spots which told the tale of our successive history, the crowd watched the infantry fire in the combat of Belleville. Montmartre was carried. The cannonballs fell as far as the boulevard du Temple. A few companies of the National Guard made a sortie, and lost three hundred men in the fields around the tomb of the martyrs. Never did military France, in the midst of her reverses, shine with a brighter glory. The last heroes were the one hundred and fifty lads of the Polytechnic School, transformed into gunners in the redoubts on the Vincennes Road. Surrounded by the enemy, they refused to surrender. They had to be torn from their pieces. The Russian grenadier seized them, blackened with gunpowder and covered with wounds. While they struggled in his arms, he lifted those young French palm branches in the air with cries of victory and admiration, and restored them all bleeding to their mothers. During that time, Camaceres was fleeing with Marie Louise, the King of Rome, and the Regency. The following proclamation was read on the walls. King Joseph, Lieutenant General of the Emperor, Command in Chief of the National Guard, Citizens of Paris. The Council of Regency has provided for the safety of the Empress and the King of Rome. I remain with you. Let us arm ourselves to defend this town, its monuments, its riches, our wives, our children, all that is dear to us. Let this far city become a camp for a short while, and let the enemy meet with his disgrace under its walls, which he hopes to surmount in triumph. Rostopchin did not pretend to defend Moscow. He burnt it down. Joseph announced that he would never leave the Parisians, and privately decamped, leaving his courage placarded at the street corners. Monsieur de Talleyrand made one of the regency appointed by Napoleon. Since the day on which the Bishop of Autun, under the Empire, ceased to be Minister of Foreign Affairs, he had dreamt of but one thing, the disappearance of Bonaparte followed by the regency of Marie-Louise, a regency of which he, the Prince de Benevent, would have been the head. Bonaparte, in appointing him a member of a provisional regency in 1814, seemed to have favoured his secret wishes. The Napoleonic death had not occurred. There remained for Monsieur de Talleyrand but to hobble at the feet of the Colossus, whom he was unable to overthrow, and to turn the moment to account on his own behalf. The genius of that man of bargains and compromises lay in contriving. The position presented difficulties. To remain in the capital was the obvious cause, but, if Bonaparte returned, the prince, separated from the fugitive regency, the prince, lagging behind, ran the risk of being shot. On the other hand, how to abandon Paris at the moment when the Allies might be entering it? Would it not be to forego the profits of success, to betray that morrow of events for which Monsieur de Talleyrand was made? 
so far from leaning towards the Bourbons, he feared them by reason of his various apostasies. However, since there was some sort of chance for them, M. de Vitrol, with the assent of the married prelate, had stealthily repaired to the Congress of Châtillon as the unavowed whisperer of the legitimacy. Having taken this precaution, the prince, in order to get clear of his difficulties in Paris, had recourse to one of those tricks of which he was a past master. M. de Laborie, who, soon after, became confidential secretary to the provisional government under M. Dupont de Nemours, went to M. de Laborde, who was attached to the National Guard, and revealed the fact of M. de Talleyrand's departure. He is preparing, said he, to follow the regency. It will perhaps appear necessary to you to arrest him, in order to be in a position to negotiate with the Allies, if need be. The comedy was played to perfection. The prince's carriages were ostentatiously got ready. He started at broad noonday on the 30th of March, on reaching the Barrière d'Enfer, he was inexorably sent back home, in spite of his protestations. In case of a miraculous return, the proofs were there, showing that the ex-minister had tried to join Marie-Louise, and that the armed force had prevented his passage. Meantime, on the advent of the Allies, the Comte Alexandre de la Borde and M. Tocton, superior officers of the National Guard, had been sent to the Generalissimo, Prince von Schwarzenberg, who had been one of Bonaparte's generals during the Russian campaign. The Generalissimo's proclamation was made known in Paris on the evening of the 30th of March. It said, For twenty years Europe has been inundated with blood and tears. The attempts made to put an end to all these sufferings have been useless, because the very principle of the government by which you are oppressed contains an insurmountable obstacle to peace. Parisians, you know the situation in which your country is placed. The preservation and the tranquillity of your city will be the object of the cares of the Allies. It is with these sentiments that Europe, in arms before your walls, addresses herself to you. What a magnificent acknowledgment of France's greatness! Europe in arms before your walls addresses herself to you. We, who had respected nothing, were respected by those whose towns we had ravaged and who, in their turn, had become the stronger. We appeared as a sacred nation in their eyes. Our lands were to them as a field of Ellis, upon which, by order of the gods, no battalion dared trample. If notwithstanding, Paris had thought fit to offer a resistance, very easily made, of four and twenty hours, the results would have been changed, but nobody, except the soldiers intoxicated with fire and glory, wanted any more of Bonaparte, and, dreading lest they should keep him, the people hastened to open the gates. Paris capitulated on the 31st of March. The military capitulation is signed, in the names of Marshals Mortier and Marmont, by Colonels Denis and Favier. The civil capitulation was made in the names of the mayors of Paris. The municipal and departmental council sent a deputation to the Russian headquarters to arrange the several clauses. My companion in exile, Christian de la Mognon, was one of the delegates. Alexander said to them, Your emperor, who was my ally, came into the very heart of my states to bring with him evils of which the traces will long remain. A just defence has brought me here. I am far from wishing to return to France the wrongs which she has done me. I am just, and I know that the French are not to blame. The French are my friends, and I wish to prove to them that I have come to return good for evil. Napoleon is my only enemy. I promise my special protection to the city of Paris. I shall protect and preserve all public institutions. I shall let only pick troops remain there. I shall preserve your National Guard, which is composed of the pick of your citizens. It is for yourselves to ensure your happiness in the future. You must give yourselves a government which will procure your repose and that of Europe. It is for you to express your wish. You will always find me ready to second your efforts. These words were punctually fulfilled. The joy of victory surmounted every other interest in the eyes of the Allies. What must have been Alexander's feelings when he caught sight of the domes of the buildings of that town where no foreigner had ever entered, except to admire us, to revel in the marvels of our civilization and our intelligence, of that inviolable city, defended by its great men during twelve centuries, of that glorious capital which Louis XIV seems still to protect with his shade, and Bonaparte with his return. End of Books 1 and 2
then in the midst of the present generation rose the hammer that struck the hour which paris had only once heard sound on the twenty fifth of december four hundred and ninety six rem announced the baptism of clovis and the gates of lutetia opened to the franks on the thirtieth of march eighteen fourteen after the baptism of blood of louis XVI, the old hammer which had so long remained motionless rose once more in the belfry of the ancient monarchy a second stroke resounded the tartars penetrated into paris in the interval of thirteen hundred and eighteen years the foreigner had insulted the walls of the capital of our empire without ever being able to enter it except when he glided in summoned by our own divisions the normans besieged the city of the parisie the parisie gave flight to the hawks which they carried on their wrists odo child of paris and future king rex futurus abon says drove back the pirates of the north the parisians let fly their eagles in eighteen fourteen the allies entered the louvre bonaparte had waged an unjust war against alexander his admirer who had begged on his knees for peace bonaparte had ordered the carnage of the moskowa he had forced the russians themselves to burn moscow bonaparte had plundered berlin humiliated its king insulted its queen what reprisals were we then to expect you shall see i had wandered in the floridas round unknown monuments devastated of old by conquerors of whom no trace remains and i was safe for the sight of the caucasian hordes encamped in the courtyard of the louvre in those events of history which according to montaigne are but weak testimonies of our worth and capacity my tongue cleaves to my palate adhere at lingua mea faucibus meis the allied army entered paris on the thirty first of march eighteen fourteen at midday ten days only after the anniversary of the death of the duc d'enghien twenty first march eighteen o four was it worth bonaparte's while to commit an action of such long remembrance for a reign which was to last so short a time the emperor of russia and the king of prussia rode at the head of their troops i saw them defile along the boulevards feeling stupefied and dumbfounded within myself as though my name as a frenchman had been torn from me to substitute for it the name by which i was thenceforth to be known in the mines of siberia i felt at the same time my exasperation increase against the man whose glory had reduced us to that disgrace nevertheless this first invasion of the allies has remained unparalleled in the annals of the world order peace and moderation reigned on every hand the shops were reopened russian guardsmen six feet tall were piloted through the streets by little french rogues who made fun of them as of jumping jacks and carnival maskers the conquered might be taken for the conquerors the latter trembling at their successes looked as though they were excusing themselves the national guard alone garrisoned the interior of paris with the exception of the houses in which the foreign kings and princes were lodged on the thirty first of march eighteen fourteen countless armies were occupying france a few months later all those troops passed back across our frontiers without firing a musket shot without shedding a drop of blood after the return of the bourbons old france found herself enlarged on some of her frontiers the ships and stores of antwerp were divided with her three hundred thousand prisoners scattered over the countries where victory or defeat had left them were restored to her after five and twenty years of fighting the clash of arms ceased from one end of europe to the other alexander departed leaving us the masterpieces which we had conquered and the liberty lodged in the charter a liberty which we owed as much to his enlightenment as to his influence the head of two supreme authorities twice an autocrat by the sword and by religion he alone of all the sovereigns of europe had understood that at the age of civilization which france had attained she could be governed only by virtue of a free constitution in our very natural hostility to the foreigners we have confused the invasion of eighteen fourteen and that of eighteen fifteen which were in no sense alike alexander looked upon himself merely as an instrument of providence and took no credit to himself when madame de steel complimented him upon the happiness which his subjects lacking a constitution enjoyed of being governed by him he made his well-known reply i am only a fortunate accident a young man in the streets of paris expressed to him his admiration at the affability with which he received the least of the citizens he replied for what else are sovereigns made he refused to inhabit the tuileries remembering that bonaparte had taken his ease in the palaces of vienna berlin and moscow looking at the statue of napoleon on the column in the place vendome he said if i were so high up i should be afraid of becoming giddy as he was going over the palace of the tuileries they showed him the salon de la paix 
of what use he asked laughing was this room to bonaparte on the day of louis the eighteenth's entry into paris alexander hid himself behind a window wearing no mark of distinction to watch the procession as it passed alexander sometimes had elegantly affectionate manners visiting a madhouse he asked a woman if there were many women mad through love not at present replied she but it is to be feared that the number has increased since the moment of your majesty's entry into paris one of napoleon's great dignitaries said to the czar your arrival has long been expected and wished for sire i should have come sooner he replied you must blame only french valour for my delay it is certain that when crossing the rhine he had regretted that he was not able to retire in peace to the midst of his family at the hotel des invalides he found the maimed soldiers who had defeated him at austerlitz they were silent and gloomy one heard nothing save the noise of their wooden legs in their deserted yard and their denuded church alexander was touched by this noise of brave men he ordered that twelve russian guns should be given back to them a proposal was made to him to change the name of the pont d'austerlitz no he said it is enough for me to have crossed the bridge with my army alexander had something calm and sad about him he went about paris on horseback or on foot without a suite and without affectation he appeared astonished at his triumph his almost melting gaze wandered over a population whom he seemed to regard as superior to himself one would have said that he thought himself a barbarian among us even as a roman felt shamefaced in athens perhaps also he reflected that these same frenchmen had appeared in his fired capital that his soldiers in their turn were masters of paris in which he might have been able to find again some of those now extinguished torches by which moscow was freed and consumed this destiny these changing fortunes this common misery of peoples and of kings were bound to make a profound impression upon a mind so religious as his what was the victor of the borodino doing so soon as he had heard of alexander's resolution he had sent orders to major maillard de lescourt of the artillery to blow up the grenelle powder magazine rostopchin had set fire to moscow but he had first sent away the inhabitants from fontainebleau to which he had returned napoleon marched to villejuif thence he threw a glance over paris foreign soldiers were guarding its gates the conqueror remembered the days in which his grenadiers kept watch on the ramparts of berlin moscow and vienna events destroy other events how poor a thing to-day appears to us the grief of henry the fourth learning of the death of gabriel at villejuif and returning to fontainebleau bonaparte also returned to that solitude he was awaited there only by the memory of his august prisoner the captive of peace had gone from the palace in order to leave it free for the captive of war so swiftly does misfortune fill up its places the regency had retired to blois bonaparte had given orders for the empress and the king of rome to leave paris saying that he would rather see them at the bottom of the seine than led back in triumph to vienna but at the same time he had enjoined joseph to remain in the capital his brother's retreat made him furious and he accused the ex-king of spain of ruining all the ministers the members of the regency napoleon's brothers his wife and his son arrived in disorder at blois swept away in the downfall military wagons baggage vans carriages everything was there the king's own coaches were there and were dragged through the mud of the boast to chambord the only morsel of france left to the heir of louis xiv some of the ministers did not stop here but proceeded as far as brittany to hide themselves while cambaceres lolled in a sedan chair in the steep streets of blois various rumours were current there was talk of two camps and of a general requisition during several days they were ignorant of what was happening in paris the uncertainty did not cease until the arrival of a wagoner whose pass was signed sacken soon the russian general shuvalov alighted at the auberge de la galere he was suddenly besieged by the grandees and entreated to obtain a visa for their stampede however before leaving blois all drew upon the funds of the regency for their travelling expenses and their arrears of salary they held their passports in one hand and their money in the other taking care at the same time to send in their adhesion to the provisional government for they did not lose their heads madame mere and her brother cardinal fesch left for rome prince esterhazy came on behalf of francis the second to fetch marie louise and her son joseph and jerome withdrew to switzerland after vainly trying to compel the empress to attach herself to their fate marie louise hastened to join her father indifferently attached to bonaparte she found means to console herself and rejoiced at being delivered from the double tyranny of a husband and a master when in the following year bonaparte revisited that confusion of flight on the bourbons the latter but lately rescued from their long tribulations 
had not enjoyed fourteen years of unequal prosperity in which to accustom themselves to the comforts of the throne however napoleon was not yet dethroned more than forty thousand of the best soldiers in the world were around him he was able to retire behind the loire the french armies which had arrived from spain were growling in the south the military population might bubble over and distribute its lava even among the foreign leaders there was still a question of napoleon or his son reigning over france for two days alexander hesitated m de talleyrand as i have said secretly leant towards the policy which tended to crown the king of rome for he dreaded the bourbons if he did not then accept entirely the plan of the regency of marie louise it was because since napoleon had not perished he the prince de benevent feared that he would not be able to retain the mastery during a minority threatened by the existence of a restless erratic enterprising man still in the vigour of his age it was in those critical days that i threw down my pamphlet de bonaparte et des bourbons to turn the scale which result is well known i flung myself headlong into the fray to serve as a shield to liberty reviving against tyranny still subsisting with its strength increased threefold by despair i spoke in the name of the legitimacy in order to add to my words the authority of positive affairs i taught france what the old royal family was i told her how many members of that family existed what their names were and their character it was as though i had drawn up a list of the children of the emperor of china to so great an extent had the republic and the empire encroached upon the present and relegated the bourbons to the past louis the eighteenth declared as i have already often mentioned that my pamphlet was of greater profit to him than an army of one hundred thousand men he might have added that it was a certificate of existence to him i assisted in giving him the crown a second time by the fortunate issue of the spanish war from the commencement of my political career i became popular with the crowd but from that time also i failed to make my way with powerful men all who had been slaves under bonaparte abhorred me on the other side i was an object of suspicion to all who wished to place france in a state of vassalage at the first moment among the sovereigns i had none on my side except bonaparte himself he looked through my pamphlet at fontainebleau the duc de bassano had brought it to him he discussed it impartially saying this is true that is not true i have nothing to reproach chateaubriand with he resisted me when i was in power but those scoundrels so-and-so and he named them my admiration for bonaparte was always great and sincere even at the time when i was attacking napoleon with the greatest eagerness posterity is not so fair in its judgments as has been held there are passions infatuations errors of distance even as there are passions and errors of proximity when posterity admires without reserve it is scandalized that the contemporaries of the man admired should not have had the same idea of that man as itself this can be explained however the things which offended one in that person are past his infirmities have died with him all that remains of him is his imperishable life but the evil which he caused is none the less real evil in itself and in its essence and especially for those who endured it it is the style of the day to magnify bonaparte's victories the sufferers have disappeared we no longer hear the imprecations the cries of pain and distress of the victims we no longer see france exhausted with only women to till her soil we no longer see parents arrested as a pledge for their sons the inhabitants of the villages made jointly and severally responsible for the penalties applicable to a rebellious recruit we no longer see those conscription placards posted at the street corners the passers-by gathered before those enormous lists of dead seeking in consternation the names of their children their brothers their friends their neighbours we forget that the whole population bewail the triumphs we forget that the slightest allusion against bonaparte on the stage which had escaped the censors was hailed with rapture we forget that the people the court the generals the ministers napoleon's relations were weary of his oppressions and his conquests weary of that game always being won and always being played of that existence brought into question each morning anew thanks to the impossibility of repose the reality of our sufferings is demonstrated by the catastrophe itself if france had been infatuated with bonaparte would she twice have abandoned him abruptly completely without making one last effort to keep him if france owed all to bonaparte glory liberty order prosperity 
industry commerce manufactures monuments literature fine arts if before his time the nation had done nothing itself if the republic destitute of genius and courage had neither defended nor enlarged the territory then france must have been very ungrateful very cowardly to allow napoleon to fall into the hands of his enemies or at least not to protest against the captivity of so great a benefactor this reproach which might justly be made against us is not made against us however and why because it is evident that at the moment of his fall france did not desire to defend napoleon in our bitter mortification we beheld in him only the author and the contemner of our wretchedness the allies did not defeat us we ourselves choosing between two scourges renounced shedding our blood which had ceased to flow for our liberties the republic had been very cruel doubtless but every one hoped that it would pass that sooner or later we should recover our rights while retaining the preservatory conquests which it had given us on the alps and the rhine all the victories which it gained were won in our name with the republic there was no question save of france it was always france that had triumphed that had conquered it was our soldiers who had done all and for whom triumphal of funeral feasts were organized the generals and some were very great obtained an honourable but modest place in the public memory such were marceau moreau roche joubert the two last seemed destined to replace bonaparte who in the dawn of his glory suddenly crossed the path of general hoche and by his jealousy rendered illustrious that warlike pacificator who died unexpectedly after his triumphs of altkeren neuvide and kleinister under the empire we disappeared we were no longer mentioned everything belonged to bonaparte i have ordered i have conquered i have spoken my eagles my crown my family my subjects what happened however in those two positions at the same time similar and opposite we did not abandon the republic in its reverses it killed us but it honoured us we had not the disgrace of being the property of a man thanks to our efforts it was never invaded the russians defeated beyond the mountains met with their end at zurich as for bonaparte he despite his enormous acquisitions succumbed not because he was conquered but because france would have no more of him how great a lesson may it ever make us remember that there is cause of death in all that offends the dignity of man independent minds of every shade and opinion were employing uniform language at the time of the publication of my pamphlet lafayette camille jordan ducis le mercier Langinet, madame de steel chenier benjamin constant Lebrun thought and wrote as i did god in his patient eternity brings justice sooner or later at moments when heaven seems to slumber it is always a fine thing that the disapproval of an honest man should keep watch and remain as a curb upon the absolute power france will not disown the noble souls which protested against her servitude when all lay prostrate when there were so many advantages in so lying so many favours to receive in return for flattery so many persecutions to undergo in return for sincerity honour then to the lafayettes the de Stiles, the benjamin constants the camille jordans the duces the le mercier the Langinet, the cheniers who standing erect amidst the grovelling crowd of peoples and of kings dared to despise victory and protest against tyranny on the second of april the senators to whom we owe one clause only of the charter of eighteen fourteen the contemptible clause preserving their pensions decreed the deposition of bonaparte if this decree which emancipated france but brought infamy upon those who issued it offers an affront to the human race at the same time it teaches posterity the price of grandeurs and fortune when these have disdained to take their stand upon basis of morality justice and liberty decree of the conservative senate the conservative senate taking into consideration that in a constitutional monarchy the monarch exists only by virtue of the constitution or the social compact that napoleon bonaparte for some time maintaining a firm and prudent government had given the nation cause to reckon in the future upon acts of wisdom and justice but that subsequently he destroyed the compact which united him to the french people notably by levying imports and establishing taxes otherwise than by virtue of the law against the express tenor of the oath which he took on his accession to the throne in conformity with clause fifty three of the constitutions of the twenty eighth florial year twelve that he was guilty of this attempt upon the rights of the people at the very time when he had without necessity adjourned the legislative body 
and caused a report made by that body whose title and whose relation to the national representation he contested to be suppressed as criminal that he undertook a series of wars in violation of clause fifty of the act settling the constitution of the year eight which lays down that any declaration of war shall be proposed discussed decreed and promulgated like the laws that he has unconstitutionally issued several decrees bearing the penalty of death namely the two decrees of the fifth of march last tending to cause a war to be considered as national which was undertaken only in the interest of his own unmeasured ambition that he has violated the laws of the constitution by his decrees concerning the state prisons that he has annihilated the responsibility of the ministers put down all the powers and destroyed the independence of the courts of jurisdiction taking into consideration that the liberty of the press established and perpetuated as one of the rights of the nation has been constantly subjected to the arbitrary censorship of his police and that at the same time he has always made use of the press to fill france and europe with fabricated facts with false maxims with doctrines favourable to despotism and with outrages against foreign governments that acts and reports passed by the senate have undergone alterations when made public taking into consideration that instead of reigning with a sole view to the interest the happiness and the glory of the french people according to the terms of his oath napoleon has completed the misfortunes of the country by his refusal to treat on conditions which the national interest obliged him to accept and which did not compromise the honour of france by his abuse of all the means entrusted to him in men and money by his abandonment of the wounded without aid medical requisites or supplies by various measures which resulted in the ruin of the towns the depopulation of the rural districts famine and infectious disease taking into consideration that owing to all these causes the imperial government established by the senatus consultum of the twenty eighth florial year twelve or eighteenth may eighteen o four has ceased to exist and that the manifest desires of all frenchmen call into being an order of things of which the first result would be the restoration of general peace and which would also mark the epoch of a solemn reconciliation between all the states of the great family of europe the senate declares and decrees as follows napoleon deposed from the throne hereditary right abolished in his family the french people and the army released from the oath of fidelity to him the roman senate was less harsh when it declared nero a public enemy history is but a repetition of the same facts applied to varying men and times can one picture to oneself the emperor reading this official document at fontainebleau what must he have thought of what he had done and of the men whom he had summoned to be his accomplices in his oppression of our liberties when i published my pamphlet de bonaparte et des bourbons could i have expected to see it amplified and converted into a decree of deposition by the senate what prevented those legislators in the days of prosperity from discovering the evils of which they reproached bonaparte with being the author from perceiving that the constitution had been violated what zeal suddenly seized these mutes for the liberty of the press how did they who had overwhelmed napoleon with adulation upon his return from each of his wars now come to find that he had undertaken those wars only in the interest of his own unmeasured ambition how did they who had flung him so many conscripts to devour suddenly melt at the thought of the wounded soldiers abandoned without aid medical requisites or supplies there are times at which contempt should be but frugally dispensed because of the large number of those in need of it i pity them for this moment because they will need it again during and after the hundred days when i asked what napoleon at fontainebleau thought of the acts of the senate his answer was made an order of the day of fifth april eighteen fourteen not published officially but printed in different newspapers outside the capital thanked the army for its fidelity adding the senate has allowed itself to dispose of the government of france it has forgotten that it owes to the emperor the power which it is now abusing that it was he who saved one part of its members from the storms of the revolution drew the other from obscurity and protected it against the hatred of the nation the senate relies upon the clauses of the constitution to overthrow it it is not ashamed to utter reproaches against the emperor without remarking that in its capacity as the first body of the state it took part in all the events the senate is not ashamed to speak of the libels published against the foreign governments it forgets that these were drawn up in its midst so long as fortune remained faithful to their sovereign these men remained faithful and no complaint was heard of the abuses of power if the emperor had despised men as he has been reproached with doing then the world would recognize to-day that he has had reasons which justified his contempt this was a homage rendered by bonaparte himself to the liberty of the press he must have believed that there was some good in it since it offered him a last shelter and a last aid 
and I, who am struggling with time, I, who am striving to make it give an account of what it has seen, I, who am writing this so long after the events that are past, under the reign of Philip, the counterfeit heir of so great an inheritance, what am I in the hands of that time, that great devourer of the centuries which I thought fixed, of that time which makes me whirl with itself through space? Alexander had taken up his residence at Monsieur de Talleyrand's. I was not present at the cabals. You can read about them in the narratives of the Abbé de Prat and of the various intriguers who handled in their dirty and paltry paws the fate of one of the greatest men in history and the destiny of the world. I counted for nothing in politics outside the masses. There was no plotting understrapper but enjoyed far more right and favour in the antechambers than I. A coming figure in the possible restoration, I waited beneath the windows in the street. Through the machinations of the house in the Rue saint Florentin, the Conservative Senate appointed a provisional government composed of General Bernonville, Senator Jocourt, the Duc de Dalberg, the Abbé de Montesquieu, and Dupont de Nemours, the prince de benevent helped himself to the presidency on meeting this name for the first time i ought to speak of the personage who took a remarkable part in the affairs of that time but i reserve his portrait for the end of my memoirs the intrigue which kept m de talleyrand in paris at the time of the entry of the allies was the cause of his successes at the commencement of the restoration the emperor of russia knew him from having seen him at tilsit in the absence of the french authorities Alexander took up his quarters in the Hotel de l'Infantare, which the owner hastened to offer him. From that time forth, M. de Talleyrand passed for the arbiter of the world. His apartments became the centre of the negotiations. Composing the provisional government to his own liking, he there placed the partners of his rubber. The Abbé de Montesquieu figured in it only as an advertisement of the legitimacy. To the Bishop of Autun's sterility were confided the first labours of the Restoration. He infected that restoration with barrenness, and communicated to it a germ of blight and death. The first acts of the provisional government, placed under the dictatorship of its chairman, were proclamations addressed to the soldiers and to the people. Soldiers, they said to the former, France has shattered the yoke under which she and you had been groaning for so many years. See all that you have suffered at the hands of tyranny. Soldiers, the time has come to put an end to the ills of the country. You are her noblest children. You cannot belong to him who has ravaged her, who tried to make your name hated by all the nations, who might perhaps have compromised your glory, were it possible for a man who is not even a Frenchman ever to impair the honour of our arms and the generosity of our soldiers. And so, in the eyes of his most servile slaves, he who had won so many victories was no longer even a Frenchman. When, in the days of the League, Dubourg surrendered the Bastille to Henry the Fourth. He refused to doff the black scarf and to take the money which was offered him for the surrender of the stronghold. Urged to recognise the king, he replied that he was no doubt a very good prince, but that he had pledged his faith to Monsieur de Mayenne, that, moreover, Brissac was a traitor, and that, to prove it to him, he would fight him between four pikes in the king's presence and would eat the heart out of his body. A difference of times and men. On the 4th of April appeared a new address of the provisional government, to the people of France. It said, On emerging from your civil discords, you chose as your leader a man who appeared upon the world's stage endowed with the characteristics of greatness. On the ruins of anarchy, he founded only despotism. He ought at least out of gratitude to have become a Frenchman like yourselves. He has never been one. Without aim or object, he has never ceased to undertake unjust wars like an adventurer seeking fame. Perhaps he is still dreaming of his gigantic designs, even while unequal reverses are inflicting such striking punishment upon the pride and abuse of victory. He has not known how to reign, either in the national interest or even in the interest of his own despotism. He has destroyed all that he wished to create, and recreated all that he wished to destroy. He believed in force alone. Today force overwhelms him, a just retribution for an insensate ambition." incontestable truths and well-earned curses. But who was it that uttered those curses? What became of my poor little pamphlet, squeezed in between those virulent addresses? Did it not disappear entirely? On the same day, the 4th of April, the provisional government proscribed the signs and emblems of the imperial government. If the Arc de Triomphe had existed, it would have been pulled down. My, who was the first to vote for the death of Louis XVI, 
Cambacérès, who was the first to greet Napoleon by the title of emperor, eagerly recognised the acts of the provisional government. On the 6th, the Senate drafted a constitution. It rested nearly on the basis of the future charter. The Senate was preserved as an upper chamber. The senatorial dignity was declared permanent and hereditary. To the title to their property was attached the endowment of the senatorships. The constitution made those titles and properties transmissible to the descendants of the holder. Fortunately, those ignoble hereditary rights bore the fates within themselves, as the ancients used to say. The sordid effrontery of those senators who, in the midst of the invasion of their country, did not for a moment lose sight of themselves, strikes one, even in the immensity of public events. Would it not have been more convenient for the Bourbons, on attaining power, to adopt the established government, a dumb legislative body, a secret and servile senate, a fettered press? On reflection one finds the thing to be impossible. The natural liberties, righting themselves in the absence of the arm that bent them, would have resumed their vertical line under the weakness of the compression. If the legitimate princes had disbanded Bonaparte's army, as they ought to have done, this was Napoleon's opinion in the island of Elba, and if at the same time they had retained the imperial government, to break the instrument of glory in order to keep only the instrument of tyranny would have been too much. The charter was the ransom of Louis the Eighteenth. On the 12th of April the Comte d'Artois arrived in the quality of lieutenant-general of the kingdom. Three or four hundred men went on horseback to meet him. I was one of the band. He charmed one with his kindly grace, different from the manners of the empire. The French recognised with pleasure in his person their old manners, their old politeness and their old language. The crowd pressed round him, a consoling apparition of the past, a twofold protection as he was against the conquering foreigner and against the still threatening Bonaparte. Alas, the prince was setting his foot again on French soil only to see his son assassinated there, and to go back to die in the land of exile, whence he was returning. There are men round whose necks life has been flung like a chain. I had been presented to the king's brother. He had been given my pamphlet to read, otherwise he would not have known my name. He remembered to have seen me neither at the court of Louis XVI nor at the camp of Thionville, and he had doubtless never heard speak of the Genie du Christianisme. That was very simple. When one has suffered much and long, he remembers only himself. Personal misfortune is a somewhat cold, yet exacting companion. It possesses you. It leaves no room for any other feeling, never quits you, seizes hold of your knees and your couch. The day before the entry of the Comte d'Artois, Napoleon, after some useless negotiations with Alexander, through the intermediary of M. de Colincourt, had published his act of abdication. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon was the sole obstacle to the restoration of peace in Europe. The Emperor Napoleon, true to his oath, declares that he renounces for himself and his heirs the throne of France and Italy, because there is no personal sacrifice, even that of his life, which he is not ready to make to the interests of the French. To these sensational words the Emperor did not delay by his return to give a no less sensational contradiction. He needed only the time to go to Elba. He remained at Fontainebleau till the 20th of April. The 20th of April having arrived, Napoleon went down the double flight of steps leading to the peristyle of the deserted palace of the monarchy of the Capets. A few grenadiers, the remnants of the soldiers who conquered Europe, drew up in line in the great courtyard, as though on their last field of battle. They were surrounded by those old trees, the mutilated companions of Francis I and Henry IV. Bonaparte addressed the last witnesses of his fights in these words. Generals, officers, non-commissioned officers and men of my old guard. I take my leave of you. For twenty years I have been satisfied with you. I have always found you on the road of glory. The Allied powers have armed all Europe against me. A part of the army has betrayed its duty, and France herself has desired other destinies. With you and the brave men who have remained faithful to me, I could have kept up civil war for three years. But France would have been unhappy, which was contrary to the end which I proposed to myself. Be faithful to the new king whom France has chosen. Do not abandon our dear country, too long unhappy. Love her always, love her well, that dear country. Do not pity my lot. I shall always be happy when I know you to be so. I could have died, nothing would have been easier to me. But I shall never cease to follow the path of honour. I have yet to write what we have done. I cannot embrace you all, but I will embrace your general. Come, general, 
he pressed General Petit in his arms. Bring me the eagle. He kissed it. Dear eagle, may these kisses resound in the heart of all brave men. Farewell, my lads. My good wishes will always accompany you. Keep me in remembrance. These words spoken, Napoleon raised his tent, which covered the world. Bonaparte had applied to the Allies for commissaries, so that he might be protected by them on his journey to the island which the sovereigns granted him as his absolute property, and as an instalment on the future. Count Shuvalov was appointed for Russia, General Roller for Austria, Colonel Campbell for England, and Count Walberg Truxess for Prussia. The latter wrote the itinerary of Napoleon from Fontainebleau to Elba. This pamphlet and the Abbe de Prats on the Polish embassy are the two reports by which Napoleon was most pained. No doubt he then regretted the time of his liberal censorship, when he had poor Palm, the German bookseller, shot for distributing at Nuremberg, Herr von Genz's work, Deutschland in seiner tiefsten Erniedrigung. Nuremberg, at the time of the publication of this work, was still a free city, and did not belong to France. Ought not Palm to have been able to foresee that conquest? Count Wahlberg begins by relating several conversations that took place at Fontainebleau previous to the departure. He states that Bonaparte awarded the greatest praise to Lord Wellington, and inquired as to his character and habits. He excused himself for not having made peace at Prague, Dresden, and Frankfurt. He agreed that he had been wrong, but that, at that time, he had had other views. I was no usurper, he added, because I accepted the crown only in compliance with the unanimous wish of the whole nation whereas Louis the Eighteenth has usurped it, being called to the throne only by a vile senate, more than ten of whose members voted for the death of Louis XVI. Count Walberg pursues his narrative as follows. The emperor started with his four carriages, about twelve o'clock on the twenty-first, not till after he had held a long conversation with General Roller, which he commenced with these words. Well, you heard my speech to the old guard yesterday. It pleased you, and you have seen the effect it produced. That is the way to speak and act with them, and if Louis XVIII does not follow this example, he will never make anything of the French soldier. From the spot where the French troops ceased, the cries of long live the emperor also had an end. Already in Moulins we saw the white cockades, and the inhabitants saluted us with, Long live the Allies! In Lyon, which we passed through at about eleven o'clock at night, a few people collected who received the emperor with, Long live Napoleon! As he had expressed a wish to be escorted by an English frigate to the island of Elba, Colonel Campbell left us at Lyon for the purpose of procuring one either from Toulon or Marseilles. About midday on the 24th, on this side Valence, Napoleon met Marshal Augereau. Both alighted from their carriages. The Emperor saluted the Marshal, embraced him, and took off his hat to him. Augereau returned none of these civilities. The Emperor, as he asked him, Where are you off to? Are you going to the court? took the Marshal by the arm and led him forwards. Augereau replied his present journey extended only to Lyon. They walked together for a quarter of a league on the road towards Valence, and according to authentic information the Emperor reproached the Marshal for his proclamation. Among other things he observed, Your proclamation is very silly. Why those insults against myself? All you need have said was, the nation having pronounced its wish in favour of a new sovereign, the duty of the army is to conform to it. God save the king. Long lived Louis Eighteenth. Ergero, who now likewise thou'd him, reproached him, on the other hand, with his insatiate love of conquest, to which he had sacrificed the happiness of France. At length, tired of the discourse, the emperor turned suddenly towards the marshal, embraced him, again took off his hat to him, and got into the carriage. Ergero, who stood with his hands behind him, did not move his cap from his head, and as Napoleon was already in the carriage, drew one hand forwards in order to wave with a mien bordering on contempt, a kind of farewell. On the 25th, as we arrived at Orange, we were received with, Long live the King! Long live Louis XVIII! On the same morning, close to Avignon, where the relays of horses awaited us, the Emperor found a crowd assembled, whose tumultuous cries saluted him with, Long live the King! Long live the Allies! Down with Nicolas! Down with the tyrant, the scoundrel, the wretched beggar! And still coarser abuse. In compliance with our instructions, we did everything in our power to lighten the evil, but could only partially effect it. The people likewise conceived that we should not deny them the liberty of venting their indignation against the man who had made them so unhappy, and even had the intention of rendering them still more miserable. 
In Orgon, the next place where we change horses, the conduct of the populace was most outrageous. Exactly on the spot where the horses were taken out, a gallows was erected, on which a figure in French uniform sprinkled with blood was suspended. On its breast it bore a paper with this inscription, Sooner or later this will be the tyrant's fate. The rabble pressed around his carriage, and elevated themselves on both sides, in order to look and cast in their abuse. The emperor pressed into a corner behind General Bertrand, and looked pale and disfigured. But at length, through our assistance, he was happily brought off. Count Shuvalov harangued the people from the side of Bonaparte's carriage. "'Are you not ashamed,' said he, "'to insult an unfortunate who has not the means of defending himself? His situation is sufficiently humiliating for one who, expecting to give laws to the world, now finds himself at the mercy of your generosity. Leave him to himself. Behold him. You see, contempt is the only weapon you ought to employ against this man, who is no longer dangerous. It would be unworthy of the French nation to take any other vengeance.' The crowd applauded this harangue and Bonaparte, seeing the effect it produced, made signs of approbation to Count Shuvalov, and afterwards thanked him for the service he had rendered him. When he had proceeded about a quarter of a league from Orgon, he changed his dress in his carriage, put on a plain blue greatcoat, and a round hat with a white cockade, mounted a post-horse, and rode on before as a courier. As it was some time ere we overtook him, we were perfectly ignorant of his being no longer in the carriage, and in St. Cana, where the horses were again changed. We still believed him to be in the greatest danger, for the people attempted to break open the doors, which, however, were fortunately locked. Had they succeeded, they would certainly have destroyed General Bertrand, who sat there alone. Characteristic is the prayer with which some of the women assailed me. For the love of God, deliver him up as a pillage to us. He has so well deserved it, both from you and us, that nothing can be more just than our request. Having overtaken the Empress carriage about half a league on the other side of Orgon, it shortly afterwards entered into a miserable public-house, lying on the roadside, called the Calade. We followed it, and here first learnt Bonaparte's disguise, who in this attire had arrived here, accompanied by one courier only. His suite, from the generals to the scullions, were decorated with white cockades, which he appeared previously to have provided himself with. His valet de chambre, who came to meet us, begged we would conduct ourselves towards the Emperor, as if he were Colonel Campbell, for whom, on his arrival, he had given himself out. We entered and found in a kind of chamber this former ruler of the world, buried in thought, sitting with his head supported by his hand. I did not immediately recognise him and walked towards him. He started up as he heard somebody approaching, and pointed to his countenance bedewed with tears. He made a sign that I might not discover him, requested me to sit down beside him, and as long as the landlady was in the room, conversed on indifferent subjects. As soon, however, as she was gone out, he resumed his former position. We left him alone. He sent, however, to request we would pass backwards and forwards, to prevent any suspicion of his being there. We informed him it was known Colonel Campbell had passed through here the day before, on his way to Toulon, on which he determined upon assuming the name of Lord Burgesh. Here we dined, but as the dinner had not been prepared by his own cooks, he had not courage to partake of it, for fear of being poisoned. He felt ashamed, however, at seeing us all eat, both with good appetites and good conscience, and therefore helped himself from every dish, but without swallowing the least morsel. He spat everything out upon his plate, or behind his chair, a little bread and a bottle of wine taken from his carriage, and which he divided with us, constituted his whole repast. In other respects he was conversable and extremely friendly towards us. Whenever the landlady, who waited upon us at table, left the room, and he perceived we were alone, he repeated to us his apprehensions for his life and assured us the French government had indisputably determined to destroy or arrest him here. A thousand plans passed through his brain how he might escape, and what arrangements ought to be made to deceive the people of Aix, whom he had learnt awaited him by thousands at the post-house. The most eligible plan, in his estimation, would be to go back again to Lyon, and from thence strike into another road by way of Italy to the island of Elba. This, however, we should on no account have allowed, and we therefore endeavoured to persuade him to proceed either directly to Toulon, or by way of Dien to Fréjus. We assured him that, without our knowledge, it was impossible the French government would entertain such insidious intentions against him, and although the people allowed themselves the greatest improprieties, they would never charge themselves with a crime of the nature he feared. 
in order to inform us better and to convince us the inhabitants of that part of the country meditated his destruction he related to us what had happened to him as he arrived here alone the landlady who did not recognize him asked him well have you met bonaparte he replied in the negative i am curious she answered to see how he will save himself i do believe the people will murder him and it must be confessed he has well deserved it the scoundrel tell me are they going to put him on board ship for his island yes of course they will drown him i hope oh no doubt returned the emperor and so you see he added turning towards us the danger i am exposed to and now again with all his apprehensions and indecision he renewed his solicitations of counsel he even begged us to look around and see if we could not anywhere discover a private door through which he might slip out or if the window whose shutters upon entering he had half closed at the bottom was too high for him to jump out in case of need on examination i found the window was provided with an iron trellis-work on the outside and threw him into evident consternation as i communicated to him the discovery at the least noise he started up in terror and changed colour after dinner we left him alone and as we went in and out found him frequently weeping as general shivalov's adjutant had announced that the major part of the populace assembled on the road were dispersed the emperor towards midnight determined on proceeding for greater precaution however another disguise was assumed general shivalov's adjutant was obliged to put on the blue greatcoat and round hat in which the emperor had reached the inn that in case of necessity he might be regarded insulted or even murdered for him napoleon who now pretended to be an austrian colonel dressed himself in the uniform of general Rollet, with the order of theresa wore my camp cap and cast over his shoulders general shivalov's mantle after the allies had thus equipped him the carriages drove up and we were obliged to march them through the other rooms of the inn in a certain order which had been previously tried in our own chamber the procession was headed by general Drouot. then came as emperor general shivalov's adjutant upon this general Rollet, the emperor general shivalov and lastly myself to whom the honour of forming the rear guard was assigned the remainder of the imperial suite united themselves with us as we passed by and thus we walked through the gaping multitude who vainly endeavoured to distinguish their tyrant amongst us shivalov's adjutant major olivif placed himself in napoleon's carriage and the latter sat beside general Rollet in his calash still however the emperor was constantly in alarm he not only remained in general Rollet's calash but even begged he would allow the servant to smoke who sat before and asked the general himself if he could sing in order that he might dissipate through such familiar conduct any suspicion in the places where we stopped that the emperor sat with him in the carriage as the general could not sing napoleon begged him to whistle and with this singular music we made our entry into every place whilst the emperor fumigated with the incense of the tobacco pipe pressed himself into the corner of the calash and pretended to be fast asleep at st maximin he breakfasted with us and having learnt that the sub-prefect of aix was there he ordered him into his presence and received him with these words you ought to blush to see me in an austrian uniform which i have been obliged to assume to protect myself against the insults of the provencals i came among you in full confidence whilst i might have brought with me six thousand of my guard and i find nothing but a band of maniacs who put my life in danger the provencals are a disgraceful race they committed every kind of crime and enormity during the revolution and are quite ready to begin over again but when it is a question of fighting bravely then they are cowards provence has never supplied me with a single regiment with which i could be satisfied but to-morrow they will be as much against louis the eighteenth as to-day they appear to be against me etc to us he again spoke of louis the eighteenth and said he would never effect anything with the french nation if he treated them with too much forbearance he would from necessity be obliged to lay large imposts upon them and hence cause himself to be immediately hated he likewise told us that eighteen years before he had marched through this place with some thousand men to liberate two royalists who were to have been executed for wearing the white cockade in spite however of the fury of the populace with which he had to contend he fortunately saved them and to-day he continued would that man be murdered by this same populace who should refuse to wear a white cockade so contradictory and vacillating are they in everything they do having learnt that two squadrons of austrian hussars were stationed at luc 
an order was sent at his request to the commanders to await our arrival there in order to escort the emperor to Frejus. End of Book 3, Part 1book three part two of the memoirs of chateaubriand volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee the memoirs of chateaubriand volume three by francois rene de chateaubriand translated by alexander texera de matos book three part two here ends count walberg's narrative those accounts are painful to read what were the commissaries unable to afford better protection to him for whom they had the honour to be responsible who were they to affect these airs of superiority with such a man bonaparte truly said that if he had wished he might have travelled accompanied by a portion of his guard it is evident that men were indifferent to his fate they enjoyed his degradation they gladly acquiesced in the marks of indignity which the victim demanded for his safety it is so sweet to hold beneath one's feet the destiny of him who walked over the highest heads to avenge pride with insult therefore the commissaries do not expend a word not even a word of philosophic sensibility on such a change of fortune to remind man of his nothingness and of the greatness of the judgments of god in the ranks of the allies napoleon had had numerous adulators he who has gone on his knees before brute force is not entitled to triumph over misfortune prussia i admit had need of an effort of virtue to forget what she had suffered herself her king and her queen but that effort should have been made alas bonaparte had taken pity on nothing all hearts had cooled towards him the moment in which he showed himself most cruel was at jaffa the smallest on the way to elba in the first case military necessity served as his excuse in the second the harshness of the foreign commissaries changes the course of the reader's feelings and lessens his own abasement the provisional government of france does not itself seem to me quite without reproach i reject the calumnies of Mabrui. nevertheless amid the terror with which napoleon still inspired his former servants a fortuitous catastrophe might have presented itself in their eyes in the light only of a misfortune one would gladly doubt the truth of the facts reported by count walberg truxes but general collet in a sequel to walberg's itinerary has confirmed a part of his colleague's narrative. General Shuvalov, on his part, has certified, in conversation with myself, the exactness of the facts. His measured words said more than Walberg's expansive recital. Lastly, Fabri's itinéraire is composed of authentic French documents, furnished by eye-witnesses. Now that I have done justice on the commissaries and the allies, is it really the conqueror of the world whom one sees in Walberg's itinerary? the hero reduced to disguises and tears weeping under a post-boy's jacket in the corner of a back room at an inn was it thus that marius bore himself on the ruins of carthage that hannibal died in bithynia caesar in the senate how did pompey disguise himself by covering his head with his toga he who had donned the purple taking shelter beneath the white cockade uttering the cry of safety god save the king that king one of whose heirs he had had shot the master of the nations encouraging the commissaries in the humiliations which they heaped upon him in order the better to hide him delighted to have general cola whistling before him and a coachman smoking in his face compelling general chivalov's aide-de-camp to enact the part of the emperor while he bonaparte wore the dress of an austrian colonel and wrapped himself in the cloak of a russian general he must have loved life cruelly those immortals cannot consent to die moreau said of bonaparte his chief characteristics are falsehood and the love of life let me beat him and i should see him at my feet begging me for mercy moreau thought thus being unable to grasp bonaparte's nature he fell into the same error as lord byron at least at st helena napoleon dignified by the muses although petty in his quarrels with the english governor had to support only the weight of his own immensity in france the evil which he had done appeared to him personified by the widows and orphans and constrained him to tremble before the hands of a few women this is too true but bonaparte should not be judged by the rules applied to great geniuses because he was lacking in magnanimity there are men who have the faculty of rising and who have not the faculty of descending 
Napoleon possessed both faculties. Like the rebellious angel, he was able to contract his incommensurable stature so as to enclose it within a measured space. His ductility furnished him with means of safety and regeneration. With him, all was not finished when he seemed to have finished, changing his manners and costume at will, as perfect in comedy as in tragedy. This actor knew how to appear natural in the slave's tunic as in the king's mantle, in the part of Attalus or in the part of Caesar. Another moment, and you shall see, from the depth of his degradation, the dwarf raising his Briarian head. Asmodeus will come forth in a huge column of smoke from the flask into which he had compressed himself. Napoleon valued life for what it brought him. He had the instinct of that which yet remained to him to paint. He did not wish his canvas to fail him before he had completed his pictures. Writing of Napoleon's fears, Sir Walter Scott, less unfair than the commissaries, frankly remarks that the unkindness of the people made much impression on Bonaparte, that he even shed tears, that he showed more fear of assassination than seemed consistent with his approved courage. But, he adds, it must be recollected that the danger was of a new and particularly horrible description, and calculated to appall many to whom the terrors of a field of battle were familiar. The bravest soldier might shudder at a death like that of the de Witts. Napoleon was made to undergo this revolutionary anguish in the same places where he commenced his career with the terror. The Prussian general, once interrupting his recital, thought himself obliged to reveal a disorder which the emperor did not conceal. Count Wahlberg may have confused what he saw with the sufferings which M. de Ségur witnessed in the Russian campaign, when Bonaparte, compelled to alight from his horse, leant his head against the guns. Among the number of the infirmities of illustrious warriors, true history reckons only the dagger which pierced the heart of Henry the Fourth, or the ball which killed Turenne. After describing Bonaparte's arrival at Fréjus, Sir Walter Scott, rid of the great scenes, joyfully falls back upon his talent. He goes his way gossiping, as Madame de Sévigné says. He chats of Napoleon's passage to Elba, of the seduction exercised by Napoleon over the English sailors, excepting Hinton, who could not hear the praises given to the Emperor without muttering the word, Humbug. When Napoleon left the ship, Hinton wished his honour good health and better luck the next time. Napoleon typified all the littlenesses and all the greatnesses of mankind. While Bonaparte, known to the universe, was escaping amid curses from France, Louis the Eighteenth, everywhere forgotten, was leaving London under a canopy of white banners and crowns. Napoleon, on landing in the island of Elba, found back his strength there. Louis the Eighteenth, on landing at Calais, might have seen Louvel. He met General Maison, commissioned sixteen years after, to put Charles X on board at Cherbourg. Charles X, apparently to render him worthy of his future mission, later gave M. Maison the baton of a marshal of France, even as a knight before fighting, conferred knighthood upon the man of lower rank, with whom he deigned to measure swords. I dreaded the effect of Louis XVIII's appearance. I hastened to go ahead of him to the residence whence Joan of Arc fell into the hands of the English, and where I was shown a volume struck by one of the cannonballs hurled against Bonaparte. What would people think at the sight of the royal invalid, replacing the horseman who might have said with Attila, the grass no longer grows wherever my horse has passed? With no mission or taste for it, I undertook, I was clearly under a spell, a somewhat difficult task, that of describing the arrival at Compiègne, of causing the son of Saint Louis to be seen as I idealised him by the aid of the muses. I expressed myself thus. The king's coach was preceded by the generals and the marshals of France, who had gone to meet his majesty. There were no more cries of God save the king, but confused clamours, amid which one distinguished only accents of tender emotion and joy. The king wore a blue coat, marked only by a star and a pair of epaulettes. His legs were encased in wide gaiters of red velvet, edged with a narrow gold braid. Seated in his armchair with his old-fashioned gaiters, holding his cane between his knees, he suggests Louis XIV at fifty years of age, Marshals Macdonald, Ney, Moncy, Serrurier, Brune, the Prince de Neuchâtel, all the generals, all the persons present, alike received the most affectionate words from the king. So great in France is the power of the legitimate sovereign, the magic attached to the name of the king. A man arrives alone from exile, despoiled of everything, without a following, guards or riches. He has nothing to give, almost nothing to promise. 
he alights from his carriage leaning on the arm of a young woman he shows himself to captains who have never seen him to grenadiers who hardly know his name who is that man tis the king every one falls at his feet what i said above of the warriors with the object which i was proposing to attain was true as regards the leaders but i lied with respect to the soldiers i have present in my memory as though i saw it still the spectacle which i witnessed when louis the eighteenth entering paris on the third of may went to visit notre dame they had wished to spare the king the sight of the foreign troops a regiment of the old foot guards kept the line from the pont neuf to notre dame along the quai des orfèvres i do not believe that human faces ever wore so threatening and so terrible an expression those grenadiers covered with wounds the conquerors of europe who had seen so many thousands of cannonballs pass over their heads who smelt of fire and powder those same men robbed of their captain were forced to salute an old king disabled by time not war watched as they were by an army of russians austrians and prussians in napoleon's invaded capital some moving the skin of their foreheads brought down their great bearskin busbies over their eyes as though to keep them from seeing others lowered the corners of their mouth in angry scorn others again showed their teeth through their moustachios like tigers when they presented arms it was with a furious movement and the sound of those arms made one tremble never we must admit have men been put to so great a test and suffered so dire a torment if at that moment they had been summoned to vengeance it would have been necessary to exterminate them to the last or they would have swallowed the earth at the end of the line was a young hussar on horseback he held a drawn sword and made it leap and as it were dance with a convulsive movement of anger his face was pale his eyes rolled in their sockets he opened and shut his mouth by turns clashing his teeth together and stifling cries of which one heard only the first sound he caught sight of a russian officer the look which he darted at him cannot be described when the king's carriage passed before him he made his horse spring and certainly he had the temptation to fling himself upon the king the restoration committed an irreparable mistake at its outset it ought to have disbanded the army while retaining the marshals generals military governors and officers in their pensions honours and rank the soldiers would afterwards have successively returned into the reconstituted army as they have since done into the royal guard the legitimate monarchy would not then have had against it from the first those soldiers of the empire organized divided into brigades denominated as they had been in the days of their victories unceasingly talking together of the time that was past nourishing regrets and feelings hostile to their new master the miserable resurrection of the maison rouge that mixture of soldiers of the old monarchy and fighting men of the new empire augmented the evil to believe that veterans distinguished on a thousand battlefields would not be offended at seeing young men very brave no doubt but for the most part new to the calling of arms wearing symbols of high military rank without having earned them was to betray a want of knowledge of human nature alexander had been to visit louis the eighteenth during the stay which the latter made at compiegne louis eighteen offended him by his haughtiness this interview led to the declaration of saint ouen of the second of may the king said in this that he had resolved to give as the basis of the constitution which he proposed to award to his people the following guarantees representative government divided into two bodies taxes freely granted public and individual liberty liberty of the press liberty of public worship sacred inviolability of property irrevocability of the sale of national goods irremovable judges and an independent judicial bench every frenchman admissible to every employment etc etc this declaration although it was in keeping with louis the eighteenth's intelligence nevertheless pertained neither to him nor to his advisers it was simply the time which was issuing from its rest its wings had been folded its soaring suspended since seventeen ninety two it was now resuming its flight or its course the excesses of the terror the despotism of bonaparte had caused ideas to turn back again but so soon as the obstacles that had been opposed to them were destroyed they flowed into the bed which they were at the same time to follow and to dig matters were taken up at the point at which they had been stopped all that had passed was as though it had not happened the human race thrust back to the commencement of the revolution had only lost forty years of its life well what is forty years in the general life of society that gap disappears when the cut fragments of time have been joined together the treaty of paris between the allies and france was concluded on the thirtieth of may eighteen fourteen it was agreed that within two months all the powers engaged on either side in the present war should send plenipotentiaries to vienna 
to settle the final arrangements in a general congress. On the 4th of June, Louis the Eighteenth appeared in royal session in a collective assembly of the legislative body and a fraction of the Senate. He delivered a noble speech, old, bygone, worn out. These wearisome details now serve only as an historic thread. To the greater part of the nation, the charter possessed the drawback of being granted. This most useless word stirred up the burning question of royal or popular sovereignty. Louis the Eighteenth also dated his boon from the nineteenth year of his reign, considering that of Bonaparte as null and void, in the same way as Charles the Second had taken a clean leap over Cromwell's head. It was a kind of insult to the sovereigns, who had all recognised Napoleon, and who were at that very moment in Paris. That obsolete language and those pretensions of the ancient monarchies added nothing to the lawfulness of the right, and were mere puerile anachronisms. That apart, the charter, replacing despotism, bringing us legal liberty, was calculated to satisfy conscientious men. Nevertheless, the royalists, who had gained so many advantages by it, who, issuing from their village or their paltry fireside, or the obscure posts on which they had lived under the empire, were called to a lofty and public existence received the boon only in a grudging spirit. The liberals, who had accommodated themselves wholeheartedly to the tyranny of Bonaparte, thought the charter a regular slave code. We have returned to the time of Babel, but we no longer work at a common monument of confusion. Each builds his tower to his own height, according to his strength and stature. For the rest, if the charter appeared defective, it was because the revolution had not run its course. The principles of equality and democracy lay at the bottom of men's minds, and worked in a contrary direction to the monarchical order. The allied princes lost no time in leaving Paris. Alexander, when going away, had a religious sacrifice celebrated on the Place de la Concorde. An altar was erected where the scaffold of Louis XVI had stood. Seven Muscovite priests performed the service, and the foreign troops defiled before the altar. The Te Deum was sung to one of the beautiful airs of the old Greek music. The soldiers and the sovereigns bent their knee to the ground to receive the benediction. The thoughts of the French were carried back to 1793 and 1794, when the oxen refused to go over pavements which the smell of blood made hateful to them. What hand had led to the expiatory festival, those men of all countries, those sons of the ancient barbarian invasions, those Tartars, some of whom dwelt in sheepskin tents beneath the great wall of China? Those are spectacles which the feeble generations that will follow my century shall no longer see. In the first year of the Restoration, I assisted at the third transformation of society. I had seen the old monarchy turn into the constitutional monarchy, and the latter into the Republic. I had seen the Republic change into military despotism. I had seen military despotism turn back into a free monarchy. The new ideas and the new generations return to the old principles and the old men. The marshals of the empire become marshals of France, with the uniforms of Napoleon's guard, were mingled the uniforms of the bodyguards and the Maison Rouge, cut precisely after the old patterns. The old Duke d'Avre, with his powdered wig and his black cane, ambled along with shaking head as captain of the bodyguards, near Marshal Victor, limping in the Bonaparte style. The Duc de Mouchy, who had never seen a shot fired, went into mass near Marshal Oudineau, riddled with wounds. The palace of the Tuileries, so proper and soldierly under Napoleon, became filled, instead of the smell of powder, with the odours of the breakfasts, which ascended on every side. Under Monsieur the lords of the bedchamber, with Monsieur the officers of the mouth and the wardrobe, everything resumed an air of domesticity. In the streets one saw decrepit emigrants, wearing the airs and clothes of former days, most respectable men, no doubt, but appearing as outlandish among the modern crowd, as did the republican captains among the soldiers of Napoleon. The ladies of the imperial court introduced the dowagers of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, and taught them their way about the palace. There arrived deputations from Bordeaux, adorned with armlets, parish captains from the Vendée, wearing La Roche Jacqueline hats. These different persons retained the expression of the feelings, thoughts, habits, manners familiar to them. Liberty, which lay at the root of that period, made things exist together which at first sight appeared as though they ought not to exist but one had difficulty in recognising that liberty, because it wore the colours of the ancient monarchy and of the imperial despotism. Every one, too, was badly acquainted with the language of the Constitution. The royalists made glaring errors when talking charter. The imperialists were still less well informed. 
the conventionals who had become in turn counts barons senators of napoleon and peers of louis the eighteenth lapsed at one time into the republican dialect which they had almost forgotten at another into the absolutist idiom which they had learned thoroughly lieutenant-generals had been promoted to gamekeepers aides de camp of the last military tyrant were heard to prate of the inviolable liberty of the peoples and regicides to sustain the sacred dogma of the legitimacy these metamorphoses would be hateful if they did not in part belong to the flexibility of the french genius the people of athens governed itself orators appealed to its passions in the public places the sovereign crowd was composed of sculptors painters artisans who are wont to be spectators of speeches and hearers of deeds as thucydides says but when good or bad the decree had been delivered who issued to execute it from amid that incoherent and inexpert mass socrates phocion pericles alcibiades is it the royalists who are to blame for the restoration as is urged to-day not in the least it was as though one should say that thirty millions of men had stood aghast while a handful of legitimists accomplished a detested restoration against the wish of all by waving a few handkerchiefs and putting a ribbon of their wives in their hats the vast majority of frenchmen was it is true full of joy but that majority was not a legitimist one in the limited sense of the word applicable only to the rigid partisans of the old monarchy the majority was a mass composed of every shade of opinion happy at being delivered and violently incensed against the man whom it accused of all its misfortunes hence the success of my pamphlet how many avowed aristocrats were numbered among those who proclaimed the king's name messieurs mathieu and adrien de montmorency the messieurs de polignac escaped from their jail monsieur alexis de noailles monsieur sosten de la rochefoucauld did those seven or eight men whom the people neither recognized nor followed lay down the law to a whole nation madame de montcalm had sent me a bag containing twelve hundred francs to distribute among the pure legitimist race i sent it back to her not having succeeded in placing a crown piece an ignominious cord was fastened round the neck of the statue which surmounted the column in the place vendome there were so few royalists to raise a hubbub around glory and to pull at the rope that the authorities themselves bonapartists all had to lower their master's image with the aid of a scaffold the colossus was forced to bow his head he fell at the feet of the sovereigns of europe who had so often lain prostrate before him it was the men of the republic and of the empire who enthusiastically greeted the restoration the conduct and ingratitude of the persons raised by the revolution were abominable towards him whom they affect to-day to regret and admire imperialists and liberals it is you into whose hands the power fell you who knelt down before the sons of henry the fourth it was quite natural that the royalists should be happy to recover their princes and to see the end of the reign of him whom they regarded as an usurper but you the creatures of that usurper surpassed the feelings of the royalists in exaggeration the ministers the high dignitaries vied with each other in taking the oath to the legitimacy all the civil and judicial authorities crowded on each other's heels to swear hatred against the proscribed new dynasty and love to the ancient race whom they had a hundred and a hundred times condemned who drew up those proclamations those adulatory addresses so insulting to napoleon with which france was flooded the royalists no the ministers the generals the authorities chosen and maintained in office by bonaparte where was the jobbing of the restoration done at the royalists no at m de talleyrand's with whom with m de pratt almoner to the god mars and mitred mountebank where and with whom did the lieutenant-general of the kingdom dine on his arrival at the royalists and with royalists nope at the bishop of autun's with m de colancourt where were entertainers given to the infamous foreign princes at the country houses of the royalists no at ma maison at the empress josephine's to whom did napoleon's dearest friends berthier for instance carry their ardent devotion to the legitimacy who spent their existences with the emperor alexander with that brutal tartar the classes of the institute the scholars the men of letters the philosophers philanthropists theophilanthropists and others they returned enchanted laden with praises and snuff-boxes as for us poor devils of legitimists we were admitted nowhere we went for nothing sometimes we were told in the streets to go home to bed sometimes we were recommended not to shout god save the king too loud others having undertaken that responsibility 
so far from compelling any one to be a legitimist those in power declared that nobody would be obliged to change his conduct or his language that the bishop of otam would be no more compelled to say mass under the royalty than he had been compelled to attend it under the empire i saw no lady of the castle keep no joan of arc proclaim the rightful sovereign with falcon on wrist or lance in hand but madame de talleyrand whom bonaparte had fastened to her husband like a signboard drove through the streets in a calash singing hymns on the pious family of the bourbons a few sheets fluttering from the windows of the familiars of the imperial court made the good cossacks believe that there were as many lilies in the hearts of the converted bonapartists as white rags at their casements it is wonderful how far contagion will go in france and a man would cry off with my head if he heard his neighbour cry the same the imperialists went so far as to enter our houses and make us bourbonists put out by way of spotless flags such white remnants as our presses contain this happened at my house but madame de chateaubriand would have none of it and valiantly defended her muslins the legislative body transformed into a chamber of deputies and the house of peers composed of a hundred and fifty-four members appointed for life and including over sixty senators formed the two first legislative chambers m de talleyrand installed at the ministry for foreign affairs left for the congress of vienna the opening of which was fixed for the third of november in execution of clause thirty two of the treaty of the thirtieth of may m de jaucourt held the portfolio during an interim which lasted until the battle of waterloo the abbe de montesquieu became minister of the interior having m guizot as his secretary-general m maluet entered the admiralty he died and was succeeded by m Bernier. general dupont obtained the war office he was replaced by marshal so who distinguished himself through the erection of the funeral monument at quiberon the duc de blacas was minister of the royal household m anglais prefect of police councillor d'ombray minister of justice the abbe louis minister of finance on the twenty first of october the abbe de montesquieu introduced the first law on the subject of the press it submitted every writing of less than twenty pages of print to the censorship m guizot worked out this first law of liberty carnot addressed a letter to the king he admitted that the bourbons had been joyfully received but taking no account of the shortness of the time nor of all that the charter granted he gave haughty lessons together with risky advice all this is worth nothing when one has to accept the rank of minister and the title of count of the empire it is not becoming to show one's self proud towards a weak and liberal prince when one has been submissive towards a violent and despotic prince when a worn-out machine of the terror one has found oneself unequal to the calculation of the proportions of napoleonic warfare i send to the press in reply my reflexion politique they contain the substance of the monarchie selon la charte m lenay the president of the chamber of deputies spoke of this work to the king with praise the king always seemed charmed with the services which i had the happiness to render him heaven seemed to have thrown over my shoulders the mantle of herald of the legitimacy but the greater the success of the work the less did its author please his majesty the reflexion politique divulged my constitutional doctrines the court received an impression from them which my fidelity to the bourbons has been unable to wipe out louis the eighteenth used to say to his intimates beware of ever admitting a poet into your affairs he will ruin all those people are good for nothing a powerful and lively friendship at that time filled my heart the duchesse de durat had imaginative powers and even some of the facial expression of madame de steel she has given a proof of her talent as an author in urica on her return from the emigration she led a secluded life for many years in her chateau d'usset on the banks of the loire and i first heard speak of her in the beautiful gardens at merville after having passed near her in london without meeting her she came to paris for the education of her charming daughters felicie and clara relations of family province literary and political opinion opened the door of her company to me her warmth of soul her nobility of character her loftiness of mind her generosity of sentiment made her a superior woman at the commencement of the restoration she took me under her protection for in spite of all that i had done for the legitimate monarchy and the services which louis the eighteenth confessed that he had received from me i had been placed so far on one side that i was thinking of retiring to switzerland perhaps i should have done well in those solitudes which napoleon had intended for me as his ambassador to the mountains might i not have been happier than in the palace of the tuileries when i entered those halls on the return of the legitimacy 
they made upon me an impression almost as painful as on the day when i saw bonaparte there prepared to kill the duc d'enguerre madame de duras spoke of me to m de blacas he replied that i was quite free to go where i would madame de duras was so tempestuous so courageous on behalf of her friends that a vacant embassy was dug up the embassy to sweden louis the eighteenth already wearied of my noise was happy to make a present of me to his good brother king bernadotte did the latter imagine that i was being sent to stockholm to dethrone him by the lord ye princes of the earth i dethrone nobody keep your crowns if you can and above all do not give them to me for i will none of them madame de duras an excellent woman who allowed me to call her my sister and whom i had the happiness of seeing in paris during many years went to nice to die one more wound reopened the duchesse de duras saw much of madame de steel i cannot conceive how i did not come across madame recamier who had returned from italy to france i should have greeted the succour which came in aid of my life already i no longer belong to those mornings which console themselves i was on the verge of those evening hours which stand in need of consolation on the thirtieth of december of the year eighteen fourteen the legislative chambers were prorogued to the first of may eighteen fifteen as though they had been convoked for the assembly of bonaparte's chambre de may on the eighteenth of january the remains were exhumed of marie antoinette and louis says i was present at this exhumation in the cemetery in which fontaine and percier have since at the pious call of madame la dauphine and in imitation of a sepulchral church at rimini raised what is perhaps the most remarkable monument in paris this cloister formed of a concatenation of tombs strikes the imagination and fills it with sadness i have spoken in book four of these memoirs of the exhumations of eighteen fifteen in the midst of the bones i recognized the queen's head by the smile which that head had given me at versailles on the twenty first of january was laid the first stone of the groundwork of the statue which was to be erected on the place louis quinze and which was never erected i wrote the funeral splendour of the twenty first of january i said the monks who came with the oriflamme to meet the shrine of st louis will not receive the descendant of the sainted king in the subterraneous abodes where dwelt those annihilated kings and princes louis says will lie alone how is it that so many dead have risen why is saint denis deserted let us rather ask why its roof has been restored why its altar is left standing what hand has reconstructed the vault of those caverns and prepared those empty tombs the hand of that same man who was seated on the throne of the bourbons o oh, providence he thought that he was preparing sepulchres for his race and he was but building the tomb of louis says i long wished that the image of louis says might be set up on the spot where the martyr shed his blood i should no longer be of that opinion the bourbons must be praised for thinking of louis says at the first moment of their return they were bound to touch their foreheads with his ashes before placing his crown on their heads now i think that they ought not to have gone further it was not in paris as in london a committee which tried the monarch it was the whole convention thence the annual reproach which a repeated funeral ceremony seemed to make to the nation apparently represented by a complete assembly every people has fixed anniversaries for the celebration of its triumphs its disorders or its misfortunes for all have in an equal measure desired to keep up the memory of one and the other we have had solemnities for the barricades songs for st bartholomew's night feasts for the death of capet but is it not remarkable that the law is powerless to create days of remembrance whereas religion has made the obscure saint live on from age to age if the fasts and prayers instituted for the sacrifice of charles i still survive it is because in england the state unites religious to political supremacy and because by virtue of that supremacy the thirtieth of january sixteen forty nine has become a ferrier in france things go differently rome alone has the right to command in religion thenceforth of what value is an order published by a prince a decree promulgated by a political assembly if another prince another assembly have the right to expunge them i therefore think to-day that the symbol of a feast which may be abolished or the evidence of a tragic catastrophe not consecrated by religion is not fitly placed on the road of the crowd carelessly and heedlessly pursuing its pleasures at the time in which we live it is to be feared lest a monument raised with the object of impressing horror of popular excesses might prompt the longing to imitate them evil tempts more than good when wishing to perpetuate the sorrow one often perpetuates only the example 
The centuries do not adopt the bequests of mourning. They have present cause enough for weeping, without undertaking to shed hereditary tears as well. On beholding the catafalque leaving the cemetière de Descloiseaux, laden with the remains of the queen and king, I felt a strong emotion. I followed it with my eyes with a fatal presentiment. At last Louis XVI resumed his couch at Saint-Denis. Louis XVIII, on his side, slept at the Louvre. The two brothers were together commencing a new era of legitimate kings and sceptres, vain restoration of the throne and the tomb, of which time has already swept away the dual dust. Since I have spoken of those funeral ceremonies which were so often repeated, I will tell you of the incubus with which I used to be oppressed when, after the ceremony, I walked in the evening in the half-undraped basilica, that I dreamt of the vanity of human greatness among those devastated tombs follows as the vulgar moral issuing from the spectacle itself. But the workings of my mind did not stop at that. I penetrated into the very nature of man. Is all emptiness and absence in the region of the sepulchres? Is there nothing in that nothingness? Are there no existences of nihility, no thoughts of dust? Have those bones no modes of life with which we are unacquainted? Who knows of the passions, the pleasures, the embraces of those dead? Are the things which they have dreamt, thought, expected, like themselves, idealities, engulf pell-mell with themselves? Dreams, futures, joys, sorrows, liberties and slaveries, powers and weaknesses, crimes and virtues, honours and infamies, riches and miseries, talents, geniuses, intelligences, glories, illusions, loves. Are you but perceptions of a moment, perceptions that pass with the destruction of the skulls in which they take birth, with the extinction of the bosom in which once beat a heart? In your eternal silence, O tombs, if tombs you be, is not heard but a mocking and eternal laughter? Is that laughter the God, the sole derisive reality? which will survive the imposture of this universe. Let us close our eyes. Let us fill up life's despairing abyss with those great and mysterious words of the martyr. I am a Christian. End of Book 3, Part 2。Book 4, Part 1 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 3 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 3, by François René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book 4, Part 1. Bonaparte had refused to embark in a French ship, setting value at that time only on the English navy, because it was victorious. He had forgotten his hatred, the calumnies, the outrages with which he had overwhelmed perfidious Albion. He saw none now worthy of his admiration, save the triumphant party, and it was the undaunted that conveyed him to the harbour of his first exile. He was not without anxiety as to the manner in which he would be received. Would the French garrison hand over to him the territory which it was guarding? Of the Italian islanders, some wished to call in the English, others to remain free of all masters the tricolor and the white flag waved on near headlands all was arranged nevertheless when it became known that bonaparte was bringing millions with him opinions generously decided to receive the august victim the civil and religious authorities were brought round to the same conviction joseph philip arigi the vicar-general issued a charge divine providence said the pious injunction has decreed that in future we shall be the subjects of napoleon the great the island of Elba, raised to so sublime an honour, receives the Lord's anointed in its bosom. We order that a solemn Te Deum be sung by way of thanksgiving, etc. The Emperor had written to General Dalem, commanding the French garrison, that he must make known to the people of Elba that he had selected their island for his residence, in consideration of the gentleness of their manners and of their climate. He set foot on land at Porto Ferrajo, amid the dual salute of the english frigate which had brought him and the batteries on shore thence he was taken under the parish canopy to the church where the te deum was sung the beadle the master of ceremonies was a short fat man who was unable to join his hands across his person napoleon was next conducted to the mayor's where his lodging was prepared they unfurled the new imperial standard a white ground intersected by a red stripe strewn with three gold bees 
Three violins and two basses followed him with scrapings of delight. The throne, hastily erected in the public ballroom, was decorated with gilt paper and pieces of scarlet cloth. The actor's side of the prisoner's nature accommodated itself to these displays. Napoleon made a serious business of trifles, even as he used to amuse his court with little old-time games inside his palace at the Tuileries, going out afterwards to kill men by way of pastime. He formed his household, it consisted of four chamberlains, three orderly officers, and two harbingers of the palace. He stated that he would receive the ladies twice a week, at eight o'clock in the evening. He gave a ball. He took possession, for his own residence, of the pavilion intended for the engineers. Bonaparte was constantly meeting in his life the two sources from which it had issued, democracy and the royal power. His strength was derived from the citizen masses, his rank from his genius and therefore you see him pass without effort, from the market square to the throne, from the kings and queens who crowded round him at Erfurt, to the bakers and oilmen who danced in his barn at Porto Ferrajo. He had something of the people among princes, and of the prince among the people. At five o'clock in the morning, in silk stockings and buckled shoes, he presided over his masons in the island of Elba. Established in his empire, inexhaustible in iron since the days of Virgil, Insula in exhaustis calibum generosa metallis. Bonaparte had not forgotten the outrages to which he had lately been subjected. He had not renounced his intention of tearing off his winding-sheet, but it suited him to seem buried only to make some appearance of a phantom around his monument. That is why he was eager, as though thinking of nothing else, to go down into his quarries of specular iron and adamant. One would have taken him for the ex-inspector of mines of his former states, he repented of having once appropriated the revenue of the forges of Ilba to the Legion of Honour. Five hundred thousand francs now seemed to him worth more than a blood-bathed cross on the breast of his grenadiers. What was I thinking of, he said? But I have issued many stupid decrees of that nature. He made a commercial treaty with Leghorn, and proposed to make another with Genoa. At all hazards he began to make five or six furlongs of high road, and designed the sites of four large towns just as Dido laid out the boundaries of Carthage. A philosopher, who had seen too much of human greatness, he declared that he intended thenceforth to live like a justice of the peace in an English county, and notwithstanding, on climbing a height which overlooks Porto Ferrajo, these words escaped him, at the sight of the sea which flowed up on every side at the foot of the cliffs. The devil! It must be owned that my island is very small. He had visited his domain within a few hours. He wished to join to it a rock called Pianosa. Europe will accuse me, he said, laughing, of already having made a conquest. The Allied powers made merry over the fact that they had in derision left him four hundred soldiers. He needed no more to bring them all back to the flag. Napoleon's presence on the coast of Italy, which had witnessed the commencement of his glory, and which retains his memory, agitated everybody. Murat was his neighbour. His friends, strangers secretly or publicly landed at his retreat. His mother and his sister, the Princess Pauline, visited him. They expected soon to see Mary Louise and her son arriving. A woman did in fact appear with a child. She was received with great mystery, and went to live in a secluded villa in the most remote corner of the island. On the shores of Ogyja, Calypso spoke of her love to Ulysses, who, instead of listening to her, thought of how to defend himself against the suitors. After a two days' repose, the swan of the north put out to sea again, to land among the myrtles of Baja, carrying away her little one in her white yawl. If we had been less trustful, it would have been easy for us to perceive an approaching catastrophe. Bonaparte was too near his cradle and his conquests. His funeral island should have been more distant and surrounded by more waves. It is inexplicable how the Allies had come to think of banishing Napoleon to the rocks where he was to serve his apprenticeship in exile. Was it possible to believe that at the sight of the Apennines, that when smelling the powder of the fields of Montenotte, Ariola, and Marengo, or that on discovering Venice, Rome, and Naples, his three fair slaves, his heart would not be seized with irresistible temptations. Had they forgotten that he had stirred up the earth, and that he had admirers and debtors everywhere, all of whom were his accomplices? His ambition was deceived, not extinguished. Misfortune and revenge rekindled its flames. When the Prince of Darkness from the verge of the created universe looked upon man and the world, he resolved to destroy them. Before bursting forth, the terrible captive restrained himself for some weeks, in the huge public bank at Faro, which he was holding, his genius negotiated a fortune or a kingdom. The Fouché, the Guzmans d'Alfarache, swarmed. The great actor had long made his police the home of melodrama, and had reserved the upper stage for himself. He amused himself, 
with the vulgar victims who disappeared through the trap-doors of his theatre. Bonapartism, in the first year of the Restoration, passed on from simple desire to action, in the measure as its hopes increased, and as it became better acquainted with the weak character of the Bourbons. When the intrigue had been hatched without, it was hatched within, and the conspiracy became flagrant. Under the able administration of M. Ferrand, M. de la Vallette undertook the correspondence. The males of the monarchy carried the dispatches of the empire. Concealment was abandoned. The caricatures foretold a desired return. One saw eagles entering by the windows of the palace of the Tuileries, through the doors of which issued a flock of turkeys. The nain jaune of Vert spoke of plume de canne. Warnings came from every side, and were disbelieved. The Swiss government had gone out of its way to no purpose, to inform His Majesty's government of the intrigues of Joseph Bonaparte, who had retreated to the Pays de Vaux. A woman arriving from Elba gave the most circumstantial details of what was happening at Porto Ferrajo, and the police sent her to prison. People held for certain that Napoleon would not venture any attempt before the dissolution of the Congress, and that, in any case, his views would turn upon Italy. Others, still better advised, prayed that the little corporal, the ogre, the prisoner, might land on the French coast. That would be too great a stroke of luck. They would settle him at one blow. M. Pozzo di Bergo declared at Vienna that the delinquent would be strung up to the nearest tree. Were it possible to have certain papers, one would there find the proof that, as early as 1814, a military conspiracy was contrived, and went side by side with the political conspiracy which the Prince de Talleyrand was conducting at Vienna, at Fouché's instigation. Napoleon's friends wrote to him that, if he did not hasten his return, he would find his place taken at the Tuileries by the Duc d'Orléans. They imagined that this revelation served to hurry the Emperor's return. I am convinced of the existence of these plottings, but I also believe that the determinative cause which decided Bonaparte was simply the nature of his genius. The conspiracy of Drouet d'Erlon and Le Feb de Noet had broken out. A few days before those generals rose in arms, I was dining with Monsieur le Maréchal Sceaux, who had been appointed Minister of War on the 3rd of December 1814. A simpleton was describing Louis XVIII's time of exile at Hartwell. The marshal listened to each detail. He answered with the words, That's historical. They used to bring His Majesty's slippers. That's historical. On days of abstinence, the king used to take three new laid eggs before commencing his dinner. That's historical. This reply struck me. When a government is not solidly established, every man whose conscience goes for nothing becomes, according to the greater or lesser amount of energy in his character, a quarter or a half or three quarters of a conspirator. He awaits the decision of fortune. More traitors are made by events than by opinions. Suddenly the telegraph announced to Napoleon's braves, and to the doubters, that the man had landed. Monsieur hurried to Lyon with the Duc d'Orléans and Marshal Macdonald, and returned forthwith. Marshal So, denounced in the Chamber of Deputies, gave up his office on the 11th of March to the Duc de Felt. Bonaparte found facing him, as Minister of War of Louis the Eighteenth in 1815, the general who had been his last Minister of War in 1814. The boldness of the enterprise was unprecedented. From the political point of view, this enterprise might be regarded as the irremissible crime and capital fault of Napoleon. He knew that the princes still assembled at the Congress, that Europe still under arms would not suffer him to be reinstated. His judgment must have warned him that a success, if he obtained one, would be only for a day. He was offering up to his passion for reappearing on the scene, the repose of a people which had lavished its blood and its treasures upon him. He was laying open to dismemberment the country from which he derived all that he had been in the past, and all that he will be in the future. In this fantastic conception lay a ferocious egoism, and a terrible absence of gratitude and generosity towards France. All this is true according to practical reason, for a man with a heart rather than brains. But, for beings of Napoleon's nature, there exists a reason of another sort. Those creatures of lofty renown have ways of their own. Comets describe curves which evade calculation. They belong to nothing. They seem good for nothing. If a globe finds itself on their passage, they shatter it and return into the abysses of the sky. Their laws are known to God alone. Extraordinary individuals are monuments of human intelligence. They are not its rule. Bonaparte, therefore, was persuaded to his enterprise less by the false reports of his friends than by the needs of his genius. He took up the cross by virtue of the faith that was in him. To a great man, to be born is not everything, he must die. 
Was Elba an end for Napoleon? Could he accept the sovereignty of a vegetable patch, like Diocletian at Salona? If he had waited till later, would he have had more chances of success, at a time when his memory would have aroused less emotion, when his old soldiers would have left the army, when new social positions would have been adopted? Well, then, he committed a foolhardy act against the world. At the commencement he must have believed that he had not deceived himself as to the spell of his power. One night, that of the 25th of February, at the end of a ball of which the Princess Borghese was doing the honours, he made his escape with victory, along his comrade and accomplice. He crossed a sea covered with our fleets, met two frigates, a ship of seventy-four guns, and the man-of-war brig Zephyr, which spoke and questioned him. He himself replied to the captain's questions. The sea and the wave saluted him, and he pursued his course. The deck of the inconstant, his little ship, served him as a room for exercise and as a writing-closet. He dictated amid the winds, and had copies made on that shifting table, of three proclamations to the army and to France. Some feluccas, carrying his companions in adventure, flew the white flag strewn with stars around his admiral bark. On the first of March, at three o'clock in the morning, he struck the coast of France between Cannes and Antibes, in the Gulf Juan. He landed, strolled along the Riviera, gathered violets and bivouacked in a plantation of olive trees. The dumbfounded population retired. He avoided Antibes and threw himself into the mountains of grass, passing through Senon, Baem, Guine, and Gap. At Cisteron, twenty men could have stopped him, and he found nobody. He went on, meeting no obstacle among those inhabitants who, a few months earlier, had wished to cut his throat. Whenever a few soldiers entered the void which formed around his gigantic shadow, they were invincibly drawn on by the attraction of his eagles. His fascinated enemies sought him and did not see him. He hid himself in his glory, as the lion of the Sahara hides himself in the rays of the sun to avoid the sight of the dazzled hunters. Enveloped in a fiery cyclone, the bloody phantoms of Areola, Marengo, Austerlitz, Jena, Friedland, Eilau, the Moskova, Lutzen, Bautzen, formed his retinue with a million of dead. From the midst of this column of fire and smoke there issued, at the entrance to the towns, a few trumpet blasts, mingled with the signals of the tricoloured labarum, and the gates of the town fell. When Napoleon crossed the Neman, at the head of four hundred thousand foot and a hundred thousand horse, to blow up the palace of the Tsars in Moscow, he was less astonished than when, breaking his ban and flinging his irons in the faces of the kings, he came alone from Cannes to Paris, to sleep peacefully at the Tuileries. Beside the prodigy of the invasion of one man must be placed another, which was the consequence of the first. The legitimacy was seized with a fainting fit, the failure of the heart of the state attacked the members and rendered France motionless. For twenty days Bonaparte marched on by stages. His eagles flew from steeple to steeple, and, along a road of two hundred leagues, the government, masters of everything, disposing of money and men, found neither the time nor the means to cut a bridge, to throw down a tree so as to delay at least by an hour, the progress of a man to whom the populations offered no opposition, but whom also they did not follow. This torpor on the part of the government seemed the more deplorable inasmuch as public opinion in Paris was greatly excited. It would have countenanced anything, despite the defection of Marshal Ney. Benjamin Constant wrote in the newspapers. After visiting our country with every plague, he left the soil of France. Who would not have thought that he was leaving it forever? Suddenly he appears, and again promises Frenchmen liberty, victory, and peace. The author of the most tyrannical constitution that ever ruled France, he speaks to-day of liberty. But it was he who, during fourteen years, undermined and destroyed liberty. He had not the excuse of memory, the habit of power. He was not born in the purple. It was his fellow-citizens whom he enslaved, his equals whom he loaded with chains. He had not inherited power. He desired and meditated tyranny. What liberty is he able to promise? Are we not a thousand times more free than under his empire? He promises victory, and three times he forsook his troops, in Egypt, in Spain, and in Russia, abandoning his companions in arms to the triple agony of cold, destitution, and despair. He brought upon France the humiliation of invasion. He lost the conquest which we had made before him. He promises peace, and his name alone is a signal for war. The nation unhappy enough to serve him would again become the object of European hatred, his triumph would be the commencement of a combat to the death against the civilized world. He has therefore nothing to claim, nor to offer. Whom could he convince, or whom seduce? War at home, war abroad. Those are the gifts which he brings us. Marshal Sow's Order of the Day, dated 8 March, 1815, repeats very nearly the ideas of Benjamin Constant, with an effusion of loyalty. Soldiers. 
the man who lately before the eyes of europe abdicated the power which he had usurped and which he had so fatally abused has landed on french soil which he was never to see again what does he want civil war what does he seek traitors where will he find them shall it be among those soldiers whom he has so often deceived and sacrificed by misleading their valour shall it be in the heart of those families which the mere sound of his name still fills with terror bonaparte despises us enough to believe us capable of abandoning a lawful and dearly beloved sovereign to share the fate of a man who is no longer more than an adventurer he believes this the madman and his last act of insanity reveals him to us as he is soldiers the french army is the bravest army in europe it will also be the most faithful let us rally round the banner of the lilies at the voice of the father of the people the worthy heir of the virtues of henry the great he himself has traced for you the duties which you have to fulfil he places at your head that prince the model of french knighthood who by his happy return to our country has already once driven out the usurper and who to-day by his presence among us will destroy his soul and last hope louis the eighteenth appeared on the sixteenth of march in the chamber of deputies the destinies of france and of the world were at stake when his majesty entered the deputies and the strangers in the galleries uncovered and rose cheers shook the walls of the house louis eighteen slowly mounted the steps of his throne the princes the marshals and the captains of the guards ranged themselves on either side of the king the cheers ceased none spoke in that interval of silence one seemed to hear the distant footsteps of napoleon his majesty seated cast his eyes over the assembly and in a firm voice delivered this speech gentlemen at this critical moment when the public enemy has penetrated into a part of my kingdom and threatens the liberty of all the remainder i come into your midst to knit yet more closely the ties which uniting you to myself constitute the strength of the state i come by addressing you to make manifest my feelings and my wishes to the whole of france i have seen my country again i have reconciled it with foreign powers who will you may be sure be faithful to the treaties which have restored peace to us i have laboured for the good of my people i have received i continue daily to receive the most touching marks of its love could i at sixty years of age better end my career than by dying in its defence i fear nothing therefore for myself but i fear for france he who comes to kindle among us the tortures of civil war brings with him also the scourge of foreign war he comes to put back our country under his iron yoke he comes lastly to destroy the constitutional charter which i have given you that charter which will be my proudest title in the eyes of posterity that charter which all frenchmen cherish and which i here swear to maintain let us then rally round it the king was still speaking when a fog spread darkness through the house eyes were turned towards the ceiling to ascertain the cause of that sudden gloom when the king lawgiver ceased to speak the cries of long live the king were renewed amid tears the assembly the monitor truly says electrified by the king's sublime words stood up its hands stretched towards the throne one heard only the words long live the king we will die for the king the king in life and death repeated with an enthusiasm which will be shared by every french heart it was in fact a pathetic sight an old infirm king who in reward for the murder of his family and twenty-three years of exile had brought france peace liberty forgiveness of all outrages and all misfortunes this patriarch of sovereigns coming to declare to the deputies of the nation that at his age after seeing his country again he could not better end his career than by dying in defence of his people the princes swore fidelity to the charter those tardy oaths were closed with that of the prince de conde and with the adhesion of the father of the duc d'enghien this heroic race on the verge of extinction this race of the patrician sword seeking behind liberty a shield against a younger longer and more cruel plebeian sword offered by reason of a multitude of memories a spectacle that was extremely sad when louis the eighteenth speech became known outside it aroused unspeakable enthusiasm paris was wholly royalist and remained so during the hundred days the women in particular were bourbonists the youth of to-day worships the memory of bonaparte because it is humiliated by the part which the present government makes france play in europe the youth of eighteen fourteen hail the restoration because the latter had thrown down despotism and set up liberty in the ranks of the royal volunteers were included m odilon barreau a large number of pupils of the school of medicine and the whole of the school of law 
The last, on the 13th of March, addressed this petition to the Chamber of Deputies. Gentlemen, we offer our services to our King and country. The whole school of law asked to go to the front. We will abandon neither our King nor our Constitution. Faithful to French honour, we ask you for arms. The feeling of love which we bear to Louis XVIII is answerable to you for the constancy of our devotion. We want no more irons, we want liberty. We have it, and they come to snatch it from us. We will defend it to the death. Long live the King. Long live the Constitution. In this energetic, natural, and sincere language, one feels the generosity of youth and the love of liberty. They who come to tell us to-day that the restoration was received by France with dislike and sorrow are ambitious men who are playing a game, or newcomers who have never known Bonaparte's oppression, or old imperialized revolutionary liars who, after applauding the return of the Bourbons with the rest, now, according to their habit, insult the fallen, and return to their instincts of murder, police, and servitude. The King's speech had filled me with hope. Conferences were held at the house of the President of the Chamber of Deputies, M. Lenné. I there met M. de Lafayette. I had never seen him, except at a distance, at another period, under the Constituent Assembly. The proposals were various, and for the most part weak, as happens in peril. Some wished the King to leave Paris and fall back upon the Havre. Others spoke of moving him to the Vendée. One stammered out unfinished sentences. Another said that we must wait and see what was coming. What was coming was very visible for all that. I expressed a very different opinion. Oddly enough, M. de Lafayette supported it, and warmly. M. Lenné and Marshal Marmont were also of my opinion. I said, let the king keep his word. Let him stay in his capital. The National Guard is on our side. Let us make sure of Vincennes. We have the arms and the money. With the money we shall overcome weakness and cupidity. If the king leaves Paris, Paris will admit Bonaparte. Bonaparte, master of Paris, is master of France. The army has not gone over to the enemy as a whole. Several regiments, many generals and officers, have not yet betrayed their oaths. If we hold firm, they will remain faithful. Let us disperse the royal family. Let us keep only the king. Let monsieur go to the Havre, the Duc de Berry to Lille, the Duc de Bourbon to the Vendée, the Duc d'Orléans to Metz. Madame la Duchesse and monsieur le Duc d'Angoulême are already in the south. Our different points of resistance will prevent Bonaparte from concentrating his forces. Let us barricade ourselves in Paris. Already the National Guards of the neighbouring departments are coming to our aid. Amid this movement, our old monarch, protected by the will of Louis XVI, will remain peacefully seated on his throne at the Tuileries, with the charter in his hand. The diplomatic body will range itself round him. The two chambers will meet in the two wings of the palace. The king's household will encamp in the carousel and in the Tuileries gardens. We shall line the quays and the water terrace with guns. Let Bonaparte attack us in this position. Let him carry our barricades one by one. Let him bombard Paris, if he please, and if he have mortars. Let him make himself odious to the whole population, and we shall see the result of his enterprise. Let us resist for but three days, and victory is ours. The king, defending himself in his palace, will arouse universal enthusiasm. Lastly, if he must die, let him die worthy of his rank. Let Napoleon's last exploit be to cut an old man's throat. Louis the Eighteenth, in sacrificing his life, will win the only battle he will have fought. He will win it for the benefit of the freedom of the human race. Thus I spoke. One is never entitled to say that all is lost, so long as one has attempted nothing. What could have been finer than an old son of St. Louis overthrowing with Frenchmen in a few moments a man whom all the confederate kings of Europe had taken so many years to lay low? This resolution, desperate in appearance, was very reasonable at bottom, and offered not the smallest danger. I shall always remain convinced that had Bonaparte found Paris hostile and the king present, he would not have tried to force them. Without artillery, provisions, or money, he had with him only troops collected at random, still wavering, astonished at their sudden change of cockade, at their oaths taken headlong on the roads. They would promptly have become divided. A few hours' delay, and Napoleon was lost. It but needed a little heart. Already, even, we could rely on a portion of the army. The two Swiss regiments were keeping their faith. Did not Marshal Gouvion Saint-Cyr make the Orléans garrison resume the white cockade, two days after Bonaparte's entry into Paris? From Marseille to Bordeaux, all recognised the king's authority during the whole month of March. At Bordeaux, the troops were hesitating. They would have remained with Madame la Duchesse d'Angoulême if the news had come that the king was at the Tuileries and that Paris was being defended. 
the provincial towns would have imitated paris the tenth regiment of the line fought very well under the duc d'angoulême massena was proving himself crafty and uncertain at lille the garrison responded to marshal mortier's stirring proclamation if all those proofs of a possible fidelity took place in spite of a flight what would they not have been in the case of a resistance had my plan been adopted the foreigners would not have ravaged france afresh our princes would not have returned with the hostile armies the legitimacy would have been saved through itself one thing alone would have to be feared after success the too great confidence of the royalty in its strength and consequently attempts upon the rights of the nation why did i arrive at a period in which i was so ill-placed why have i been a royalist against my instinct at a time when a miserable race of courtiers was unable either to hear or to understand me why was i flung into that troop of mediocrities who took me for a raver when i spoke of courage for a revolutionary when i spoke of liberty a fine question of defence indeed the king had no fear and my plan rather pleased him through a certain louis quatorzian grandeur but other faces had lengthened they packed up the crown diamonds formerly purchased out of the privy purse of the sovereigns leaving thirty-three million crowns in the treasury and forty-two millions in securities those sixty-five millions were the produce of taxation why was it not returned to the people rather than left to tyranny a dual procession passed up and down the staircases of the pavillon de flore people were asking what they were to do no answer they applied to the captain of the guards they questioned the chaplains the precentors the almoners nothing vain talk vain retailing of news i saw young men weep with rage when uselessly asking for orders and arms i saw women faint with anger and contempt access to the king was impossible etiquette closed the door the great measure decreed against bonaparte was an order to hunt him down louis the eighteenth with no legs hunting down the conqueror who bestrode the earth this form of the ancient laws renewed for the occasion is enough to show the compass of mind of the statesmen of that period to hunt down in eighteen fifteen hunt down and hunt whom hunt a wolf hunt a brigand chieftain hunt a felon lord no hunt napoleon who had hunted down kings who had seized and branded them for all time on the shoulder with his indelible n from this order when considered more closely sprang a political truth which no one saw the legitimate house estranged from the nation for three-and-twenty years had remained at the day and place at which the revolution had caught it whereas the nation had progressed in point of time and space hence the impossibility of understanding and meeting one another religion ideas interests language earth and heaven all were different for the people and for the king because they were separated by a quarter of a century equivalent to centuries but if the order to hunt down appears strange owing to the preservation of the old idiom of the law had bonaparte originally the intention of acting better although employing a newer language papers of m d'autrive catalogued by m Artaud, prove that it caused great difficulty to prevent napoleon from having the duc d'angoulême shot in spite of the official document in the moniteur a show document which remains to us he thought it wrong of the prince to have defended himself and yet the fugitive from elba when leaving fontainebleau had recommended the soldiers to be faithful to the monarch whom france had chosen bonaparte's family had been respected queen hortense had accepted from louis the eighteenth the title of duchesse de saint lier murat who still reigned in naples saw his kingdom sold by m de talleyrand only during the congress of vienna this period in which all are lacking in frankness oppresses the heart every one threw out a profession of faith as it were a footbridge to cross the difficulty of the day free to change his direction the difficulty once passed youth alone was sincere because it was near its cradle bonaparte solemnly declared that he renounced the crown he departed and returned after nine months benjamin constant printed his vehement protests against the tyrant and he changed in twenty-four hours it will be seen later in another book of these memoirs who inspired him with the noble impulse to which the fickleness of his nature did not permit him to remain faithful marshal so excited the troops against their old leader a few days later he was roaring with laughter at his own proclamation in napoleon's closet at the tuileries and became major-general of the army at waterloo marshal ney kissed the king's hands swore to bring him bonaparte locked up in an iron cage and handed over to the latter all the corps under his command and the king of france alas he declared that at the age of sixty years he could not better end his career than by dying in defence of his people and fled to ghent at sight of this incapacity for truth in men's feelings at the want of harmony between their words and their deeds one feels seized with disgust for the human kind louis the eighteenth on the sixteenth of march was declaring his intention of dying in the midst of france 
Had he kept his word, the legitimacy might have lasted another century. Nature herself seemed to have taken from the old king the power of retreating, by chaining him about with wholesome infirmities. But the future destinies of the human race would have been trammelled by the accomplishment of the resolution of the author of the charter. Bonaparte hastened to the assistance of the future. That Christ of the power for evil took the new man sick of the palsy by the hand and said to him, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. End of Book 4, Part 1Book four, part two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Book four, part two. It was evident that a scamper was being contemplated. For fear of being detained, they did not even warn those who, like myself, would have been shot within an hour after napoleon's entry into paris i met the duc de richelieu and the champs elysees they are deceiving us he said i am keeping watch here for i do not propose to await the emperor at the tuileries all by myself on the evening of the nineteenth madame de chateaubriand had sent a servant to the carousel with instructions not to return until he had the certainty of the flight of the king at midnight as the man had not come in i went to my room i had just gone to bed when monsieur clausel de cousergue entered he told us that his majesty had left and had gone in the direction of lille he brought me this news on the part of the chancellor who knowing me to be in danger was violating secrecy on my behalf and sent me twelve thousand francs recoverable on my salary as minister to sweden i was obstinately bent on remaining not wishing to leave paris until i should be physically certain of the royal removal the servant who had been sent to reconnoitre returned he had seen the court carriages go by madame de chateaubriand pushed me into her carriage at four o'clock in the morning on the twentieth of march i was in such a fit of fury that i knew neither where i was going nor what i was doing we passed out through the barriere saint martin at dawn i saw crows coming down peacefully from the elms on the high road where they had spent the night to take their first meal in the fields without troubling their heads about louis the eighteenth and napoleon they were not obliged to leave their country and thanks to their wings they were able to laugh at the bad road along which i was being jolted old friends of combourg we were more alike in the old days when at break of day we used to breakfast on mulberries from the brambles in the thickets of brittany the roadway was broken up the weather rainy madame de chateaubriand poorly she looked every moment through the little window at the back of the carriage to see if we were not being pursued we slept at amiens where ducange was born next at arras the birthplace of robespierre there i was recognised when we sent for horses on the morning of the twenty second the postmaster said that they had been engaged for a general who was taking to lille the news of the triumphal entry of the emperor king into paris madame de chateaubriand was dying of fright not for herself but for me i ran to the post office and removed the difficulty with money on arriving under the ramparts of lille at two in the morning of the twenty third we found the gates closed the orders were not to open them to any one whomsoever they could not or would not tell us if the king had entered the town i induced the postilion for a few louis to make for the other side of the place outside the glacis and to drive us to tournay in seventeen ninety two i had covered the same road on foot during the night with my brother on arriving at tournay i learnt that louis the eighteenth had certainly entered lille with marshal mortier and that he meant to defend himself there i dispatched a courier to m de blacas asking him to send me a permit to be received into the place my courier returned with a permit from the commandant but not a word from m de blacas leaving madame de chateaubriand at tournay i was getting into the carriage again to go to lille when the prince de conde arrived we learnt through him that the king had gone and that marshal mortier had had him accompanied to the frontier from these explanations it became clear that louis the eighteenth was no longer at lille when my letter arrived there the duc d'orleans followed close after the prince de conde under an apparent dissatisfaction he was glad at bottom to find himself out of the hurly-burly the ambiguousness of his declaration and of his behaviour bore the stamp of his character as to the old prince de conde the emigration was his household god he had no fear of monsieur de bonaparte not he he fought if they liked or went away if they liked things were a little muddled in his brain he was none too clear as to whether he should stop at Ocroix to give battle there or go to dine at the white hart 
he struck his tents a few hours before us telling me to recommend the coffee at the inn to the members of his household whom he had left behind he did not know that i had sent in my resignation on the death of his grandson he was not very sure that he had had a grandson he only felt a certain increase of glory in his name which might come from some conde whom he had forgotten do you remember my first passing through tournay with my brother at the time of my first emigration do you remember in that connection the man transformed into a donkey the girl from whose ears grew corn-spikes the rain of ravens that set everything on fire in eighteen fifteen indeed we ourselves were a rain of ravens but we set nothing on fire alas i was no longer with my unfortunate brother between seventeen ninety two and eighteen fifteen the republic and the empire had passed what revolutions had also been accomplished in my life time had ravaged me like the rest and you the young generations of the moment let twenty-three years come and then tell me in my tomb what has become of your loves and your illusions of to-day the two brothers bertin had arrived at tournay m bertin de vaux returned from there to paris the other bertin bertin the elder was my friend you know through these memoirs what it was that attached me to him from tournay we went to brussels there i found no baron de Bouteuil, nor rivarol nor all those young aides de camp who had become dead or old which is the same thing no news of the barber who had given me shelter i did not take up the musket but the pen from a soldier i had become a paper stainer i was looking for louis the eighteenth he was at ghent where he had been taken by messieurs de blacas and de durat their first intention had been to ship the king to england if the king had consented to this plan he would never have reascended the throne having gone into a lodging-house to look at an apartment i perceived the duc de richelieu smoking half outstretched on a sofa at the back of a dark room he spoke to me of the princess in the most brutal manner declaring that he was going to russia and that he would not hear another word about those people madame la duchesse de duras on arriving in brussels had the sorrow to lose her niece there i loathe the brabant capital it has never served me except as a passage to my exiles it has always brought sorrow upon myself or my friends an order of the king summoned me to ghent the royal volunteers and the duc de berry's little army had been disbanded at bethune in the middle of the mud and of the accidents of a military breaking up touching farewells had been exchanged two hundred men of the king's household remained and were quartered at alost my two nephews louis and christian de chateaubriand formed part of that corps i had been given a billet of which i did not avail myself a baroness whose name i have forgotten came to see madame de chateaubriand at the inn and offered us an apartment in her house she implored us with so good a grace you must pay no attention she said to anything my husband says his head is a little you understand my daughter also is a trifle eccentric she has terrible moments poor child but the rest of the time she is as gentle as a lamb alas it is not she who causes me the greatest trouble but my son louis the youngest of my children without god's help he will be worse than his father madame de chateaubriand politely refused to go and live with such rational people the king well lodged having his service and his guards formed his council the empire of that great monarch consisted of a house in the kingdom of the netherlands which house was situated in a town which although the birthplace of charles v had been the chief town of a prefecture of bonaparte's those names comprised between them a goodly number of centuries and events the abbe de montesquieu being in london louis the eighteenth appointed me minister of the interior ad interim my correspondence with the departments did not give me much to do i easily kept up my correspondence with the prefects sub-prefects mayors and deputy mayors of our good towns on the inner side of our frontiers i did not repair the roads much and i let the steeples tumble down my budget hardly enriched me i had no secret funds only by a crying abuse i was a pluralist i was still his majesty's minister plenipotentiary to the king of sweden who like his fellow-townsman henry the fourth reigned by right of conquest if not by right of birth we discoursed round a table covered with a green cloth in the king's closet m de lally tollendal who was i think minister of public instruction delivered speeches even more voluminous and more inflated than his cheeks he quoted his illustrious ancestors the kings of ireland and muddled up his father's trial with those of charles i and louis xvi he refreshed himself in the evening after the tears the sweat and the words which he had shed at the council with the lady who had come all the way from paris out of enthusiasm for his genius he virtuously strove to cure her but his eloquence betrayed his virtue 
and drove the dart more deeply madame la duchesse de durat had come to join monsieur le duc de durat among the exiles i will speak no more ill of misfortune because i have spent three months with that admirable woman talking of all that upright minds and hearts can find in a conformity of tastes ideas principles and feelings madame de durat was ambitious for me she alone saw at once what i might be worth in political life she always deplored the envy and short-sightedness which kept me removed from the king's counsels but she even much more deplored the obstacles which my character placed in the way of my fortune she scolded me she wanted to correct me of my indifference my candour my ingenuousness and to make me adopt habits of courtierism which she herself could not endure nothing perhaps leads to greater attachment and gratitude than to feel oneself under the patronage of a superior friendship which by virtue of its ascendancy over society passes off your defects as good qualities your imperfections as an attraction a man protects you through his worth a woman through your worth that is why of those two empires one is so hateful the other so sweet since i have lost that great-hearted person gifted with a soul so noble with an intelligence which combines something of the strength of the thought of madame de steel with the grace of the talent of madame de lafayette i have never ceased while mourning her to reproach myself with any unevenness of temper with which i may sometimes have wounded hearts that were devoted to me let us keep a close watch upon our character let us remember that with a profound attachment we can nevertheless poison days which we would buy back again at the price of all our blood when our friends have sunk into the grave what means have we to repair our trespasses our useless regrets our vain repentings are those a remedy for the pain that we have given them they would have preferred one smile from us during their life than all our tears after their death the charming clara was at ghent with her mother we two made up bad couplets to the air of the tyrolienne i have held many pretty little girls on my knees who are young grandmothers to-day when you have left a woman married in your presence at sixteen years of age if you return sixteen years later you find her of the same age still ah madame you have not put on a day no doubt but it is the daughter to whom you are saying so the daughter whom you will also lead up to the altar but you a sad witness to both hymens you treasure up the sixteen years which you received at each union a wedding present which will hasten your own marriage with a white-haired lady rather thin marshal victor had come to join us at ghent with an admirable simplicity he asked for nothing never teased the king with his assiduity one scarcely saw him i do not know whether he ever had the honour and the favour of being invited on a single occasion to his majesty's dinner-party i have met marshal victor since i have been his colleague in office and i have always perceived the same excellent nature in paris in eighteen twenty three monsieur le dauphin was very harsh to that honest soldier it was very good of this duc de belune to repay such easy ingratitude with such modest devotion candour carries me away and touches me even when on certain occasions it attains the final expression of its ingenuousness for instance the marshal told me of his wife's death in the language of a soldier and he made me weep he pronounced coarse words so quickly and changed them so chastely that one might even have written them m de vaublanc and m capel joined us the former used to say that he had some of everything in his portfolio do you want some montesquieu here you are some bossuet here it is in proportion as the game seemed about to take a different turn more travellers arrived the abbe louis and m le comte Beugnot alighted at the inn where i was lodging madame de chateaubriand was suffering from terrible fits of choking and i was sitting up with her the two newcomers installed themselves in a room separated from my wife's only by a thin partition it was impossible not to hear unless by stopping one's ears between eleven and twelve at night the new arrivals raised their voices the abbe louis who spoke like a wolf and in jerks was saying to m Beugnot, you a minister you'll never be one again you have committed one stupidity after the other i could not clearly hear m le comte Beugnot's answer but he spoke of thirty-three millions left behind in the royal treasury the abbe apparently in anger pushed a chair which fell down through the uproar i caught these words the duc d'angouleme he'll have to buy his national property at the gates of paris i shall sell what remains of the state forests i shall cut down everything the elms on the high roads the bois de boulogne the champs elysees what's the use of all that eh brutality formed m louis's principal merit 
his talent lay in a stupid love of material interests if the minister of finance drew the forests after him he had doubtless a different secret from that of orpheus who made the woods go after him with his fail fiddling in the slang of the time m louis was known as a special man his speciality of finance had led him to accumulate the taxpayers money in the treasury in order to let it be taken by bonaparte napoleon had had no use for this special man who was in no sense an unique man and who was at the most good enough for the directory the abbe louis had gone to ghent to claim his office he was in very good favour with m de talleyrand with whom he had solemnly officiated at the first federation in the champ de mars the bishop was the celebrant the abbe louis the deacon and the abbe de renaud the subdeacon m de talleyrand recollecting this admirable profanation used to say to the baron louis abbe you were very fine as the deacon in the champ de mars we endured this shame under the great tyranny of bonaparte ought we to have endured it later the most christian king had screened himself from any reproach of bigotry he owned in his council a married bishop m de talleyrand a priest living in concubinage m louis a non-practising abbe m de montesquieu the last named a man as feverish as a consumptive gifted with a certain glibness of speech had a narrow and disparaging mind a malignant heart a sour character one day when i had made a speech at the luxembourg on behalf of the liberty of the press the descendant of clovis passing in front of me who went by only to the breton montmorin caught me a great blow with his knee in my thigh which was not in good taste i gave him one back which was not polite we played at the duc de la rochefoucauld and the coadjutor the abbe de montesquieu humorously called m de lally tolondal an english beast in the rivers at ghent they catch a very dainty white fish we use tutti quanti to go to eat this good fish in a suburban roadside inn while waiting for the battles and the end of empires m laborie never failed us at our meetings i had first met him at savigny when fleeing from bonaparte he came in at madame de beaumont's by one window and made his way out by another indefatigable at work renewing his errands as often as his bills as fond of doing services as others are of receiving them he has been calumniated calumny is not the impeachment of the calumniated but the excuse of the calumniator i have seen men grow tired of the promises in which m laborie was so rich but why illusions are like torture they always help to pass an hour or two i have often led by the head with a golden bridle old hacks of memory unable to stand on their legs which i took for young and frisky hopes i also met m Munier at the white fish dinners a sensible and upright man m guizot deigned to honour us with his presence a monitor had been started at ghent my report to the king of the twelfth of may inserted in that journal proves that my feelings on the liberty of the press and on foreign domination have at all times been the same i can quote the following passages to-day you were preparing to crown the institutions of which you had laid the foundation stone you had fixed a period for the commencement of the hereditary peerage the ministry would have gained greater unity the ministers would have become members of the two chambers according to the true spirit of the charter a law would have been brought in to allow the election of a member of the chamber of deputies before the age of forty so that citizens might have had a real political career it was proposed to discuss a penal code for press offences after the adoption of which law the press would have been entirely free for that freedom is inseparable from all representative government sire and this is the occasion solemnly to protest it all your ministers all the members of your council are inviolably attached to the principles of a wise liberty they derive from you that love of laws of order and of justice without which there can be no happiness for a people sire let us be permitted to say that we are ready to shed the last drop of our blood for you to follow you to the ends of the earth to share with you the tribulations which it will please the almighty to send you because we believe before god that you will maintain the constitution which you have given to your people and that the sincerest wish of your royal heart is the liberty of frenchmen had it been otherwise sire we would all have died at your feet in defence of your sacred person but we would have been only your soldiers we would have ceased to be your counsellors and your ministers sire at this moment we share your royal sadness there is not one of your counsellors and ministers who would not give up his life to prevent the invasion of france you sire are a frenchman we are frenchmen alive to the honour of our country proud of the glory of our arms admirers of the courage of our soldiers we would be willing in the midst of your battalions to shed the last drop of our blood to bring them back to their duty or to share lawful triumphs with them we can only look with the deepest sorrow 
upon the ills that are ready to break over our country. Thus at Ghent did I propose to add to the charter that which it still lacked, while displaying my sorrow at the new invasion which was threatening France. Nevertheless, I was only an exile whose wishes were in contradiction with the facts which could again open the gates of my country to me. Those pages were written in the states of the allied sovereigns, among kings and emigrants, who detested the liberty of the press, in the midst of armies, marching to conquest of whom we were, so to speak, the prisoners. These circumstances perhaps add some strength to the feelings which I venture to express. My report on reaching Paris made a great noise. It was reprinted by Monsieur Le Normand, the younger, who risked his life upon this occasion, and for whom I had all the difficulty in the world to obtain a barren warrant of printer to the king. Bonaparte acted, or allowed others to act, in a manner unworthy of him. On the occasion of my report, they did what the directory had done, on the appearance of Clery's memoirs. They falsified fragments of it. I was made to propose to Louis the Eighteenth stupid ideas for the revival of feudal rights, for the tithes of the clergy for the recovery of the national property, as though the printing of the original piece in the Monitor de Gaulle, at a fixed and known date, did not confound the imposture. The pseudonymous writer, entrusted with the production of an insincere pamphlet, was a soldier fairly high up in rank. He was dismissed after the hundred days. His dismissal was ascribed to his conduct towards me. He sent his friends to me. They begged me to intervene, lest a man of merit should lose his sole means of existence. I wrote to the Minister of War, and obtained a retiring pension for this officer. He is dead. His wife has remained attached to Madame de Chateaubriand, by a feeling of gratitude to which I was far from having any claim. Certain proceedings are too highly prized. The most ordinary persons are susceptible to such feelings of generosity. A name for virtue is cheaply acquired. The superior mind is not that which pardons, but that which has no need of pardon. I do not know where Bonaparte, at St. Helena, discovered that I had rendered essential services at Ghent. If he judged the part I played too favourably, at least there lay behind his opinion an appreciation of my political value. I avoided at Ghent, as far as I could, intrigues, which were opposed to my character, and contemptible in my eyes, for at bottom I perceived in our paltry catastrophe the catastrophe of society. My refuge against the idlers and rogues was the oncle du Beguinage, I used to walk round that little world of veiled or tuckered women, consecrated to different Christian works, a calm region, placed like the African quicksands, on the edge of the tempests. There no incongruity shocked my ideas, for the sentiment of religion is so lofty that it is never irrelevant to the gravest revolutions. The solitaries of the Thebaid and the barbarians, destroyers of the Roman world, are in no way discordant facts or mutually exclusive existences. I was graciously received in the close as the author of the Genie du Christianisme. Wherever I go among Christians, the curates flock round me. Next come the mothers bringing me their children. The latter recite to me my chapter on the First Communion. Then appear unhappy persons who tell me of the good I have had the happiness to do them. My passage through a Catholic town is announced like that of a missionary or a physician. I am touched by this dual reputation. It is the only agreeable memory of myself that I retain. I dislike myself in all the rest of my personality and my reputation. I was pretty often invited to festive dinners in the family of Monsieur and Madame Dop, a venerable father and mother, surrounded by some thirty children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. At Monsieur Coppens, a banquet which I was obliged to accept was prolonged from one in the afternoon to eight in the evening. I counted nine courses. They began with the preserves and finished with the cutlets. The French alone know how to dine methodically just as they alone know how to compose a book. My ministry kept me at Ghent. Madame de Chateaubriand, less busy, went to see Ostend, where I had embarked for Jersey in 1792. I had travelled, a dying exile, down the same canals along whose banks I now walked, still in exile, but in perfect health. There has always been something fabulous in my career. The miseries and joys of my first emigration revived in my thoughts. I saw England again, my companions in misfortune, and Charlotte, whom I was to meet once more. There is no one like myself to create a real society by calling up shadows. It goes so far that the life of my memories absorbs the feeling of my real life. Even persons with whom I have never occupied myself, if they come to die, invade my memory. One would say that none can become my companion if he has not passed through the tomb, which leads me to think that I am a dead man. Where others find an eternal separation, I find an eternal union. When one of my friends departs this earth, it is as though he had come to make my home his own. 
he never leaves me again according as the present world retires the past world returns to me if the actual generations scorn the generations that have grown old they waste their disdain where i am concerned i am not even aware of their existence my golden fleece had not yet reached bruges madame de chateaubriand did not bring it to me at bruges in fourteen twenty six there was a man whose name was john who invented or perfected the art of painting in oils let us be grateful to john of bruges but for the propagation of his method raphael's masterpieces would be obliterated to-day where did the flemish painters steal the light with which they illumined their pictures what ray from greece strayed to batavia's shore after her journey to ostend madame de chateaubriand took a trip to antwerp there she saw in a cemetery plaster souls in purgatory smeared all over with fire and black at louvain she recruited a stammerer a learned professor who came expressly to ghent to gaze upon a man so out of the ordinary as my wife's husband he said to me illust his speech fell short of his admiration and i asked him to dinner when the hellenists had drunk some curaçao his tongue became loosened we got upon the merits of thucydides whom the wine made us find clear as water by dint of keeping up with my guest i ended i believe by talking dutch at least i no longer understood what i was saying madame de chateaubriand spent a bad night at the inn at antwerp a young englishwoman recently confined lay dying during two hours she made her groans heard then her voice weakened and her last moan which the stranger's ear could scarcely catch was lost in an eternal silence the cries of this traveller solitary and forsaken might be taken as a prelude to the thousand voices of death about to rise at waterloo the customary solitude of ghent was rendered more striking by the foreign crowd which was then enlivening it and which was soon to disperse belgian and english recruits were learning their drill on the squares and under the trees of the public walks gunners contractors dragoons were landing trains of artillery herds of oxen horses which struggled in the air while they were being let down in straps canteen women came on shore carrying the sacks the children the muskets of their husbands all these were going without knowing why and without having the smallest interest in it to the great rendezvous of destruction which bonaparte had given them one saw politicians gesticulating along a canal near a motionless angler emigrants trotting from the kings to messieurs from messieurs to the kings the chancellor of france monsieur d'ombray in a green coat and a round hat with an old novel under his arm walked to the council to amend the charter the duc de levy went to pay his court in a pair of old loose shoes which dropped from his feet because brave man and new achilles that he was he had been wounded in the heel he was very witty as can be judged by the selection from his reflections the duke of wellington used to come occasionally to hold a review louis the eighteenth went out every afternoon in a coach and six with his first lord of the bedchamber and his guards to drive round ghent just as though he had been in paris if he met the duke of wellington on his road he would give him a little patronizing nod in passing louis eighteen never lost sight of the preeminence of his cradle he was a king everywhere as god is god everywhere in a manger or in a temple on an altar of gold or of clay never did his misfortune wring the smallest concession from him his loftiness increased in the ratio of his depression his diadem was his name he seemed to say kill me you will not kill the centuries inscribed upon my brow if they had scraped his arms off the louvre it signified little to him were they not engraved on the globe had commissioners been sent to scratch them off in every corner of the universe had they been erased in india at pondicherry in america at lima and mexico in the east at antioch jerusalem acre cairo constantinople rhodes in the morea in the west on the walls of rome on the ceilings of caserta and the escorial on the arches of the halls of ratisbon and westminster in the escutcheon of all the kings had they been torn from the needle of the compass where they seemed to proclaim the reign of the lilies to the several regions of the earth the fixed idea of the grandeur the antiquity the dignity the majesty of his house gave louis the eighteenth a real empire one felt its dominion even bonaparte's generals confessed it they stood more intimidated before that impotent old man than before the terrible master who had commanded them in a hundred battles in paris when louis eighteen accorded to the triumphing monarchs the honour of dining at his table he passed without ceremony before those princes whose soldiers were camping in the courtyard of the louvre he treated them like vassals who had only done their duty in bringing men-at-arms to their liege lord in europe there is but one monarchy that of france 
The destiny of the other monarchies is bound up in the fate of that one. All the royal houses are of yesterday, beside the house of Hugh Capet, and almost all are its daughters. Our old royal power was the old royalty of the world. From the banishment of the Capets will date the era of the expulsion of the kings. The more impolitic that haughtiness on the part of the descendant of St. Louis, it became fatal to his heirs. The more pleasing was it to the national pride. The French rejoiced at seeing sovereigns who, when conquered, had borne the chains of a man, bear, as conquerors, the yoke of a dynasty. The unshaken faith of Louis XVIII in his blood is the real might that restored his sceptre. It was that faith which twice let fall upon his head a crown for which Europe certainly did not believe, did not pretend that she was exhausting her populations and her treasures. The soldierless exile was to be found at the issue of all the battles which he had not delivered. Louis XVIII was the legitimacy incarnate. It ceased to be visible when he disappeared. At Ghent I took walks by myself, as I do wherever I go. The barges gliding along narrow canals, obliged to cross ten or twelve leagues of pastureland to reach the sea, appeared to be sailing over the grass. They reminded me of the canoes of the savages in the wild oat marshes of Missouri. Standing at the edge of the water while they were dipping lengths of brown Holland, I let my eyes wander over the steeples of the town. Its history appeared to me on the clouds in the sky the citizens of Ghent revolting against Henri de Chatillon, the French governor, the wife of Edward III, bringing forth John of Gaunt, the stock of the house of Lancaster, the popular reign of Van Artevelde. Good people, who moved you? Why are you so incensed against me? In what can I have angered you? You must die, cried the people. It is what time cries to all of us. Later I saw the dukes of Burgundy, the Spaniards came, then the pacification, the sieges, and the captures of Ghent. When I had done musing among the sentries, the sound of a little bugle or a Scotch bagpipe would rouse me. I saw living soldiers hastening to join the buried battalions of Batavia, ever destructions, powers overthrown, and at last a few faded shadows and some names that had passed. Seaboard Flanders was one of the first cantonments of the companions of Clodion and Clovis. Ghent, Bruges, and the surrounding country furnished nearly a tenth of the grenadiers of the old guard. That terrible army was in part drawn from the cradle of our fathers, and came in its turn to be exterminated beside that cradle. Did the leek give its flower to the arms of our kings? Spanish manners leave the impress of their character. The buildings of Ghent retrace for me those of Granada, less the sky of the Vega. A large town almost bereft of inhabitants, deserted streets, canals as deserted as the streets. Twenty-six islands formed by those canals which were not the canals of Venice a huge piece of ordnance of the Middle Ages. That is what replaced at Ghent the city of the Zegris, the Duero, and the Zenil, the Henoalife, and the Alhambra. Old dreams of mine! Shall I ever see you more? Madame la Duchesse d'Angoulême, who had taken ship on the Gironde, came to us by way of England with General Donadier and Monsieur de Cez, of whom the latter had crossed the ocean wearing his blue ribbon across his waistcoat. The Duke and Duchesse de Lévis followed in the Princess suite. They had flung themselves into the diligence and escaped from Paris by the Bordeaux road. Their fellow travellers talked politics. That scoundrel of a Chateaubriand, said one of them, is no such fool. He had his carriage waiting, packed in his courtyard for three days. The bird has flown. They would have made short work of him if Napoleon had caught him. Madame la Duchesse de Lévis was a very handsome, very kind woman, and as calm as Madame la Duchesse de Duras was restless. She never left Madame de Chateaubriand's side, she was our assiduous companion at Ghent. No one has diffused more quietude in my life, a thing of which I have great need. The least troubled moments of my existence are those which I spent at Noisiel, in the house of that woman whose words and sentiments entered into your soul only to restore its serenity. I recall with regret those moments passed under the great chestnut trees of Noisiel. With a soothed spirit, a convalescent heart, I used to look upon the ruins of Shell Abbey and the little lights of the boats loitering among the willows on the Marne. The remembrance of Madame de Levy is for me that of a silent autumn evening. She passed away in a few hours. She mingled with death, as with the source of all rest. I saw her sink noiselessly into her grave in the cemetery of Père Lachaise. She is laid above Monsieur de Fontaine, and the latter sleeps beside his son, Saint Marcelin, killed in a duel. Thus, bowing before the monument of Madame de Levy, have I come into contact with two other sepulchres. Man cannot awaken one sorrow without reawakening another. During the night, the different flowers, which open only in the shade, expand. To Madame de Lévis' affectionate kindness for me was added the friendship of Monsieur le Duc de Lévis, 
the father i may now reckon only by generations m de levy wrote well he had a versatile and fertile imagination which betrayed his noble race as it had already displayed itself in his blood shed on the beach at quiberon nor was that to be the end of all it was the impulse of a friendship which passed on to the second generation m le duc de levy the son attached at present to m le comte de chambord has drawn near to me my hereditary affection will fail him no more than will my fidelity to his august master the new and charming duchesse de levy his wife joins to the great name of d'aubusson the brightest qualities of heart and mind life is worth something when the graces borrow unwearied wings from history the pavillon massin existed at ghent as in paris every day brought monsieur news from france which was the offspring of self-interest or imagination m gaillard an ex-oratorian a counsel in the royal courts an intimate friend of fouche's alighted in our midst he made himself known and was brought into touch with m capel when i waited upon monsieur which was rarely those around him used to talk to me in covert words and with many sighs of a man who it must be admitted was behaving admirably he was impeding all the emperor's operations he was defending the faubourg saint germain etc etc the faithful marshal so was also the object of monsieur's predilection and after fouche the most loyal man in france one day a carriage stopped at the door of my inn and i saw madame la baronne de vitrolles step out of it she had arrived bearing powers from the duc d'autrant she took away with her a note written in monsieur's hand in which the prince declared that he would retain an eternal gratitude to him who saved monsieur de vitrolles fouche wanted no more armed with this note he was sure of his future in case of a restoration thenceforward there was no question again save of the immense obligations due to the excellent monsieur fouche de nantes save of the impossibility of returning to france otherwise than by that just man's good pleasure the difficulty was how to make the king relish this new redeemer of the monarchy after the hundred days madame de Custine compelled me to meet fouche at dinner at her house i had seen him once five years before in connection with the condemnation of my poor cousin armand the ex-minister knew that i had opposed his nomination at roi at gonesse at arnouville and as he suspected me of being powerful he wished to make his peace with me the death of louis Seize was the best thing about him regicide was his innocence a praetor like all the revolutionaries beating the air with empty phrases he retailed a heap of commonplaces stuffed with destiny with necessity with the right of things mingling with this philosophic nonsense further nonsense on the march and progress of society and shameless maxims in favour of the strong as against the weak and he was free in his use of impudent avowals on the justice of success the little worth of a head which falls the equity of that which prospers the iniquity of that which suffers affecting to speak of the most horrid disasters with airy indifference as though he were a genius above all such fooleries not a choice idea escaped him not a remarkable thought on any subject whatsoever i went away shrugging my shoulders at crime m fouche never forgave me my dryness and the small effect he produced on me he had thought he would fascinate me by causing the blade of the fatal instrument to rise and fall before my eyes like a glory of mount sinai he had imagined that i would look up as to a colossus to the ranter who speaking of the soil of lyon has said that soil shall be overturned on the ruins of that proud and rebellious city shall rise scattered cottages which the friends of liberty will hasten to come and inhabit we shall have the energetic courage to walk through the vast tombs of the conspirators their blood-stained corpses hurled into the rhone give on both banks and at its mouth the impression of terror and the image of the omnipotence of the people we shall celebrate the victory of toulon we shall this evening send two hundred and fifty rebels under the lead of the thunder those horrible trimmings did not impose upon me because m de nantes had diluted republican crimes with imperial mire because a sans culotte transformed into a duke had wrapped the cord of the lantern in the ribbon of the legion of honour he appeared neither the abler nor the greater for it in my eyes the jacobins detest men who make no account of their atrocities and who despise their murders their pride is provoked like that of authors whose talent one disputes at the same time that fouche was sending m gaillard to ghent to negotiate with the brother of louis xvi his agents at bar were parleying with those of prince metternich on the subject of napoleon the second and m de saint leon dispatched by this same fouche was arriving in vienna to treat of the crown as a possibility for m le duc d'orleans the friends of the duc d'autrant could rely upon him no more than his enemies on the return of the legitimate princes he maintained his old colleague m thibaudeau on the list of exiles while m de talleyrand struck this or that outlaw off the list or added that other to the catalogue according to his whim 
had not the Faubourg Saint-Germain reason indeed to believe in M. Fouché. M. de Saint-Léon carried three notes to Vienna, of which one was addressed to M. de Talleyrand. The Duc d'Otrant proposed that the ambassador of Louis the Eighteenth should push the son of Egalité on to the throne if he saw his way. What probity in those negotiations! How fortunate they were to have to do with such honest persons! Yet we have admired, sensed, blessed those highway robbers. We have paid court to them. We have called them Monseigneur. That explains the world as it stands. M. de Montrand came, in addition, after M. de Saint-Léon. M. le Duc d'Orléans did not conspire, in fact but by consent. He let the revolutionary finish his intrigue. A sweet society! In this dark lane, the plenipotentiary of the King of France lent an ear to Fouché's overtures. Speaking of M. de Talleyrand's detention at the Barrière d'Enfer, I said what had, till then, been M. de Talleyrand's fixed idea as to the regency of Marie-Louise. He was obliged by the emergency to embrace the eventuality of the Bourbons, but he was always ill at ease. It seemed to him that, under the years of St. Louis, a married bishop would never be sure of his place. The idea of substituting the younger branch for the elder branch pleased him, therefore, so much so the more in that he had had former relations with the Palais Royal. Taking that side, without however exposing himself entirely, he hazarded a few words of Fouché's project to Alexander. The Tsar had ceased to interest himself in Louis the Eighteenth. The latter had hurt him in Paris by his affectation of superiority of race, he had hurt him again by refusing to consent to the marriage of the Duc de Berry with the sister of the Emperor. The princess was rejected for three reasons. She was a schismatic, she was not of an old enough stock, she came of a family of madmen. These reasons were not put forward upright, but a slant, and when seen through gave Alexander treble offence. As the last subject of complaint against the old sovereign of exile, the Tsar brought up the projected alliance between England, France, and Austria. For the rest it seemed as though the succession were open, all the world claimed to succeed to the estate of the sons of Louis XIV. Benjamin Constant, in the name of Madame Murat, was pleading the rights which Napoleon's sister believed herself to possess over the kingdom of Naples. Bernadotte was casting a distant glance upon Versailles, apparently because the king of Sweden came from Pau. La Benardière, head of a department at the Foreign Office, went over it to Monsieur de Colincourt. He drew up a hurried report on the complaints and rejoinders of France to the legitimacy. After this kick had been let fly, M. de Talleyrand found means of communicating the report to Alexander. Discontented and fickle, the autocrat was struck with La Bernardière's pamphlet. Suddenly, in the middle of the Congress, the Tsar asked to the general stupefaction if it would not be a matter for deliberation to examine in how far M. le Duc d'Orléans might suit France and Europe as king. This is perhaps one of the most surprising things in those extraordinary times, and perhaps it is still more extraordinary that it has been so little discussed. Lord Clancarty made the Russian proposal fall through. His lordship declared that he had no powers to treat so grave a question. As for myself, he said, giving my opinion as a private individual, I think that to put Monsieur le Duc d'Orléans on the throne of France would be to replace a military usurpation by a family usurpation, which is more dangerous to the sovereigns than any other usurpation. The members of the Congress went to dinner using the sceptre of St. Louis as a rush with which to mark the folio at which they had left off in their proceeds. Upon the obstacles encountered by the Tsar, M. de Talleyrand faced about. Foreseeing that the stroke would resound, he sent a report to Louis the Eighteenth in a dispatch which I have seen, and which was numbered twenty-five or twenty-seven, of this strange session of the Congress. He thought himself obliged to inform His Majesty of so exorbitant a proceeding, because a new city would not long delay in reaching the King's ears, a singular ingenuousness for M. le Prince de Talleyrand. There had been a question of a declaration on the part of the Alliance, in order to make it quite clear to the world that there was no quarrel except with napoleon but there was no pretension to impose upon france either an obligatory form of government or a sovereign who should not be of her own choice this latter part of the declaration was suppressed but it was positively announced to the official journal of frankfurt england in her negotiations with the cabinets always employed that liberal language which is only a precaution against a parliamentary tribune we see that the Allies were troubling themselves no more about the re-establishment of the legitimacy at the second than at the first restoration. The event alone did all. What mattered it to such short-sighted sovereigns whether the mother of European monarchies had her throat cut? Would that prevent them from giving entertainments and keeping guards? The monarchs are so solidly seated to-day, the globe in one hand, the sword in the other. M. de Talleyrand, whose interests were at that time in Vienna, feared lest the English, whose opinion was no longer so favourable to him, should begin the military game before all the armies were drawn up in line. 
and lest the cabinet of St. James should thus acquire the predominance. That is why he wished to induce the king to re-enter by the southeastern provinces, in order that he might find himself under the protection of the Austrian empire and cabinet. The Duke of Wellington had given a precise order not to commence hostilities. It was Napoleon who wanted the Battle of Waterloo. The destinies of such a nature are not to be arrested. Those historic facts, the most curious in the world, have remained generally unknown. In the same way, also, a confused opinion has been formed of the treaties of Vienna relating to France. They have been thought the iniquitous work of a troop of victorious sovereigns, implacably bent upon our ruin. Unfortunately, if they are harsh, they have been envenomed by a French hand. When M. de Talleyrand is not conspiring, he is trafficking. Prussia desired to have Saxony, which will sooner or later be her prey. France ought to have countenanced this wish, for, Saxony obtaining an indemnification within the sphere of the Rhine, Landau would have remained to us with our surrounding territories. Koblenz and other fortresses would have passed to a small, friendly state, which, placed between ourselves and Prussia, prevented any point of contact. The keys of France would not have been handed over to the shade of Frederick. For three millions, which Saxony paid him, M. de Talleyrand opposed the combinations of the cabinet of Berlin, but in order to obtain the assent of alexander to the existence of old saxony our ambassador was obliged to abandon poland to the czar notwithstanding that the other powers desired that a poland of some kind should restrict the freedom of the muscovites movements in the north the bourbons of naples redeemed themselves like the sovereign of dresden with money m de talleyrand claimed that he was entitled to a subvention in exchange for his duchy of benevento he was selling his livery on leaving his master when France was losing so much, could not Monsieur de Talleyrand also have lost something? Benevento, moreover, did not belong to the High Chamberlain. By virtue of the revival of the ancient treaties, that principality was a dependency of the states of the Church. As such were the diplomatic transactions which were being completed in Vienna while we were stopping at Ghent. In this latter residence I received the following letter from Monsieur de Talleyrand. Vienna, 4th April. I learnt Monsieur with much pleasure that you were at Ghent for circumstances require that the king should be surrounded with strong and independent men. You will certainly have thought that it was useful to refute, by means of strenuously reasoned publications, the whole of the new doctrine which they are trying to establish in the official documents now appearing in France. It would be useful if something could appear of which the object would be to establish that the declaration of the 31st of March made in Paris by the Allies, that the act of deposition, that the act of abdication, that the treaty of the 11th of April which resulted from them are so many preliminary, indispensable and absolute conditions of the treaty of the 30th of May. That is to say that, without those previous conditions, the treaty would not have been made. This admitted, the man who violates the said conditions or seconds their violation breaks the peace which that treaty established. It is therefore he and his accomplices who are declaring war against Europe. An argument taken in this sense would do good abroad as well as at home only it must be well done so make it your business except monsieur the homage of my sincere attachment and of my high regard talleyrand i hope to have the honour of seeing you at the end of the month our minister in vienna was faithful to his hatred of the great chimera escaped from the shades he dreaded a blow from its wing this letter shows for the rest all that monsieur de talleyrand was capable of doing when he wrote alone he had the kindness to teach me the movement leaving the graces to me it was a question indeed of a few diplomatic phrases on the deposition on the abdication on the treaty of the eleventh of april and of the thirtieth of may to stop napoleon i was very grateful for the instructions given me by virtue of my patent as a strong man but i did not follow them an ambassador in petto i was not at that moment meddling with foreign affairs i busied myself only with my ministry of the interior ad interim but what was taking place in paris End of Book 4, Part 2。Book 5, Part 1 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 3, by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Texera de Matos, Book 5, Part 1. I show you the wrong side of events which history does not display. History exhibits only the right side. 
Memoirs have the advantage of presenting both surfaces of the texture. In this respect, they depict the whole complexion of humanity better, by exposing, as in the tragedies of Shakespeare, low and exalted scenes. There is everywhere a cottage beside a palace, a man who weeps beside a man who laughs, a ragman carrying his basket beside a king losing his throne. What was the fall of Darius? To the slave present at the Battle of Arbela. Ghent, then, was only a tiring room behind the slips of the spectacle opened in Paris. Some famous personages still remained in Europe. I had, in 1800, commenced my career with Alexander and Napoleon, why had I not followed those leading actors, my contemporaries, on the great stage? Why only at Ghent? Because heaven casts you where it wills. From the little hundred days at Ghent, let us pass to the great hundred days in Paris. I have told you the reasons which ought to have stopped Bonaparte in Elba, and the urgent reasons, or rather the necessity drawn from his nature, which compelled him to issue from exile. But the march from Cannes to Paris exhausted all that remained of the old man, in Paris, the talisman was shattered. The few moments for which the reign of lawfulness had reappeared had sufficed to render impossible the re-establishment of arbitrariness. Despotism muzzles the masses and enfranchises individuals within a certain limit. Anarchy lets loose the masses and enslaves individual independence. Hence, despotism resembles liberty when it follows after anarchy. It remains what it really is when it replaces liberty. Bonaparte, a liberator after the constitution of the directory, was an oppressor after the charter. He felt this so well that he thought himself obliged to go further than Louis the Eighteenth, and to return to the sources of national sovereignty. He, who had trodden the people underfoot as its master, was reduced to create himself anew a tribune of the people, to court the favour of the suburbs, to parody the revolutionary infancy, to lisp an old language of liberty which forced his lips into a grimace, while each syllable angered his sword. His destiny as a power was, in fact, so well accomplished, that the genius of Napoleon was no longer recognised during the hundred days. That genius was the genius of success and order, not that of defeat and liberty. Now he could do nothing through victory which had betrayed him, nothing for order, since it existed without him. In his astonishment he said, to what a condition have the Bourbons reduced France for me, in a few months? It will take me years to restore her. It was not the work of the legitimacy which the conqueror saw, but the work of the charter. He had left France dumb and prostrate. He found her erect and speaking. In the ingenuousness of his absolute mind, he took liberty for disorder. And yet Bonaparte was obliged to capitulate with the ideas which he was unable to conquer at first sight. In the absence of any real popularity, workmen hired at forty sous a head came, at the end of their day's work, to howl, Long live the emperor! In the carousel, that was called going to the crying. Proclamations at first announced marvels of forgetting and forgiving. Individuals were declared free, the nation free, the press free. Nothing was wanted but the peace, independence and happiness of the people. The whole imperial system was changed. The golden age was about to return in order to conform practice with theory. France was divided into seven great police sections. The seven lieutenants were invested with the same powers which were enjoyed under the consulate and the empire by the directors-general. It is well known what those protectors of individual liberty were at Lyon, Bordeaux, Milan, Florence, Lisbon, Hamburg, Amsterdam. Over these lieutenants, in a hierarchy more and more favourable to liberty, Bonaparte placed commissaries extraordinary, after the fashion of the representatives of the people under the convention. The police, directed by Fouché, informed the world, by means of solemn proclamations, that it would thenceforward serve only to spread philosophy, that it would act only in accordance with virtuous principles. Bonaparte re-established by decree the National Guard of the Kingdom, the mere name of which used formerly to make his head swim. He found himself compelled to annul the divorce pronounced under the Empire, between despotism and demagogy, and to favour their renewed alliance. From this hymen was to spring, on the Champ de May, a liberty wearing the red cap and the turban on its head, the Mameluke sabre in its belt, and the revolutionary axe in its hand, a liberty surrounded by the shades of those thousands of victims, 
sacrificed on the scaffolds, or in the burning campaigns of Spain and the icy deserts of Russia. Before success, the Mamelukes were Jacobins. After success, the Jacobins were to become Mamelukes. Sparta was for the moment of danger, Constantinople for that of triumph. Bonaparte would indeed have liked to recover possession for himself alone, but that was impossible for him. He found men prepared to dispute it with him. First, the earnest republicans, delivered from the chains of despotism and the laws of the monarchy, desired to retain an independence which is perhaps but a noble error. Next, the madmen of the old faction of the mountain, these latter, humiliated at having been nothing more under the empire than the police spies of a despot, seem resolved to resume on their own account that liberty of doing everything of which, during fifteen years, they had yielded the privilege to a master. But not the republicans, nor the revolutionaries, nor the satellites of Bonaparte, were strong enough to establish their separate power, or mutually to subjugate each other, threatened from without by an invasion, pursued from within by public opinion. They understood that, if they became divided, they were lost. In order to escape the danger, they adjourned their quarrel. Some brought their systems and illusions to the common defence, others their terror and perversity. None was in earnest in this compact. Each, once the crisis passed, resolved to turn it to his profit. All sought beforehand to make sure of the results of victory. In that awful trente et un, three enormous gamblers kept the bank by turns, liberty, anarchy and despotism, all three cheating and striving to win a game which was lost for all. Full of that thought, they did not proceed rigorously against a forlorn hope, which was urging on revolutionary measures. Federates had been formed in the faubourgs, and federations were being organised under stern oaths, in Brittany, Anjou, Lyonnais, and Burgundy. The Marseillaise and the Camagnol were heard sung. A club established in Paris corresponded with other clubs in the provinces. The resurrection of the Journal des Patriotes was announced. But on that side, what confidence were the resuscitated of 1793 able to inspire? Was it not known how they explained liberty, equality, the rights of man? Were they more moral, more wise, more sincere, after their enormities than before? Was it because they had tainted themselves with all the vices, that they had become capable of all the virtues? One cannot abdicate crime as easily as a crown. The brow once girt with a hideous circlet, retains ineffaceable marks from its contact. The idea of reducing an ambitious man of genius from the rank of emperor to that of generalissimo, or president of the republic, was a chimera. The red cap which they had fixed on the head of his busts, during the hundred days, would only have foreboded to Bonaparte the resumption of the diadem, were it given to the athletes who raced through the world to run the same course twice. Still, some liberals of the better sort promised themselves the victory, mistaken men like Benjamin Constant, dolts like Monsieur Simon Sismondi, spoke of placing the Prince of Canino at the Ministry of the Interior, Lieutenant General Comte Carnot at the War Office, the Comte Merlin at the Ministry of Justice. In appearance despondent, Bonaparte made no opposition to democratic movements which, in the last result, supplied his army with conscripts. He allowed himself to be attacked in pamphlets, Caricatures repeated Elba to him as parrots cried Peron to Louis Ons. They preached liberty and equality to the man escaped from prison, addressing him in the second person singular. He listened to these remonstrances with an air of compunction. Suddenly, bursting the shackles in which they had pretended to bind him, he proclaimed, by his own authority, not a plebeian constitution, but an aristocratic constitution an additional act to the constitutions of the empire. The contemplated republic was changed by this adroit piece of juggling into the old imperial government rejuvenated with feudality. The additional act lost Bonaparte the Republican Party and made malcontents in almost all the other parties. License reigned in Paris, anarchy in the provinces. The civil and military authorities contended with each other. Here men threatened to burn the manors and murder the priests, there they hoisted the white flag and shouted, Long live the king! Finding himself attacked, Bonaparte retreated. He withdrew the nomination of the mayors of communes from his commissaries extraordinary and restored that nomination to the people. Alarmed at the multiplicity of negative votes against the additional act, he abandoned his de facto dictatorship 
and convene the chamber of representatives by virtue of that act which was not yet accepted blundering from rock to rock he was scarcely delivered from one danger before stumbling against another the sovereign of a day how was he to establish an hereditary peerage which the spirit of equality repelled how to govern the two chambers would they yield a passive obedience what would be the relations of the chambers with the proposed assembly of the champ de May, which had no real object since the additional act was brought into operation before the suffrages had been counted would that assembly consisting of thirty thousand electors not believe itself to be the representatives of the nation this champ de May, so pompously announced and celebrated on the first of june resolved itself into a simple march past of troops and a distribution of colours before a despised altar napoleon surrounded by his brothers the state dignitaries the marshals the civil and judicial bodies proclaimed the sovereignty of the people in which he did not believe the citizens had imagined that they themselves would frame a constitution on that solemn day the peaceful middle class expected that then would be declared napoleon's abdication in favour of his son an abdication concocted at Baal between the agents of fouché and of prince metternich and there was nothing but a ridiculous political trap the additional act for the rest stood forth as an act of homage to the legitimacy save for a few differences and in particular excluding the abolition of confiscation it was the charter those sudden changes that confounding of all things announced the last struggles of despotism nevertheless the emperor could not receive the death-stroke from within for the power which was combating him was as debilitated as himself the revolutionary titan whom napoleon had floored of old had not recovered his native energy the two giants were now aiming useless blows at one another it was nothing more than the contest of two shadows to these general impossibilities were added for bonaparte domestic tribulations and palace cares he announced to france the return of the empress and the king of rome and neither one nor the other came back speaking of the queen of holland who thanks to louis the eighteenth had become duchesse de saint leu he said when one has accepted the prosperity of a family one must embrace its adversity joseph who had hastened from switzerland only asked him for money lucien alarmed him through his liberal connections murat after first conspiring against his brother-in-law had been in too great a hurry on returning to him to attack the austrians stripped of the kingdom of naples a runaway of ill omen he was awaiting under arrest near marseilles the catastrophe which i will describe to you later and then was the emperor able to trust his former partisans and his self-styled friends had they not infamously abandoned him at the moment of his fall that senate which formerly crawled at his feet now ensconced in the peerage had it not decreed its benefactor's deposition could he believe those men when they came and said to him the interests of france are inseparable from your own if fortune betrays your efforts reverses sire would not impair our perseverance and would redouble our attachment to your person your perseverance your attachment redoubled by misfortune you said this on the eleventh of june eighteen fifteen what had you said on the second of april eighteen fourteen what will you say a few weeks later on the nineteenth of july eighteen fifteen the ministry of the imperial police was in correspondence as you have seen with ghent vienna and Baal the marshals to whom bonaparte was compelled to give the command of his soldiers had but now taken the oath to louis the eighteenth they had issued the most violent proclamation against him bonaparte since that time it is true they had re-espoused their sultan but if he had been arrested at grenoble what would they have done with him is it enough to break an oath to restore its whole strength to another violated oath are two perjuries equivalent to one fidelity a few days more and those swearers of the champ de may will carry back their devotion to louis eighteen in the halls of the tuileries they will approach the sacred table of the god of peace in order to have themselves appointed ministers at the banquets of war heralds at arms and brandishers of the royal insignia at the coronation of bonaparte they will fulfil the same functions at the coronation of charles x then as the commissaries of another power they will lead that king a prisoner to cherbourg scarce finding a little corner free in their consciences to hang up in it the badge of their new oath it is hard to be born in times of improbity in those days when two men talking together study how to keep back words from their tongue for fear of offending each other and of mutually making one another blush those who had not been able to tie themselves to napoleon by his glory 
who had not been able to adhere from gratitude to the benefactor from whom they had received their riches their honours and their very names were they likely to sacrifice themselves now to his needy hopes would they link themselves to a precarious and reincipient fortune the ingrates whom a fortune consolidated by unexampled successes and by a possession of sixteen years of victories had failed to fix so many chrysalids who between two springtimes had put off and put on shed and resumed the skin of the legitimist and the revolutionary of the napoleonist and the bourbonist so many words given and broken so many crosses moved from the knight's breast to the horse's tail and from the horse's tail to the knight's breast so many doughty warriors changing their banners and strewing the lists with their pledges of perjured faith so many noble dames the attendants by turns of marie louise and marie caroline were calculated to leave in the depths of napoleon's heart naught but distrust horror and contempt that great man grown old stood alone among all those traitors men and fortune on a tottering earth under a hostile sky in front of his accomplished destiny and the judgment of god napoleon had found no faithful friends but the phantoms of his past glory these escorted him as i have told you from the spot at which he landed to the capital of france but the eagles which had flown from steeple to steeple from cannes to paris alighted wearily upon the chimneys of the tuileries able to go no further napoleon did not hurl himself at the head of the roused populace upon belgium before an anglo-prussian army had assembled there he stopped he tried to negotiate with europe and humbly to maintain the treaties of the legitimacy the congress of vienna urged against monsieur le duc de vicence the abdication of the eleventh of april eighteen fourteen by that abdication bonaparte recognised that he was the sole obstacle to the restoration of peace in europe and consequently renounced for himself and his heirs the thrones of france and italy now since he had come to restore his power he was manifestly violating the treaty of paris and placing himself again in the political situation anterior to the thirty first of march eighteen fourteen therefore it was he bonaparte who was declaring war against europe and not europe against bonaparte these logical quibbles of diplomatic attorneys as i remarked in connection with m de talleyrand's letter were worth what they might be before the battle the news of bonaparte's landing at cannes had reached vienna on the sixth of march in the middle of an entertainment at which was represented the assembly of the divinities of olympus and parnassus alexander had just received the proposal for an alliance between france austria and england he hesitated a moment between the two pieces of intelligence and then said the question is not of myself but of the safety of the world and an estafette carried orders to st petersburg to dispatch the guards the withdrawing armies stopped short their long line faced about and eight hundred thousand enemies turned their eyes towards france bonaparte prepared for war he was expected in new catalonian fields god had summoned him to the battle which was to put an end to the reign of battles the heat of the wings of the renown of marengo and austerlitz had sufficed to hatch armies in that france which is one great nest of soldiers bonaparte had restored to his legions their epithets of invincible terrible and incomparable seven armies resumed the titles of armies of the pyrenees of the alps of the jura the moselle the rhine great memories which served as a frame for supposed troops for expected triumphs a real army was mustered in paris and at laon one hundred and fifty mounted batteries ten thousand picked soldiers entered into the guards eighteen thousand sailors distinguished at lutzen and bautzen thirty thousand veterans officers and non-commissioned officers in garrison in the fortified towns seven departments in the north and east ready to rise in a body one hundred and eighty thousand men of the national guard mobilized volunteer corps in lorraine alsace and franche comte federates offering their pikes and their strength paris turning out three thousand muskets a day those were the emperor's resources perhaps he might yet once more have overturned the world had he been able to resolve while liberating the country to summon the foreign nations to independence the moment was propitious the kings after promising their subjects constitutional government had shamefully gone from their word but liberty was distasteful to napoleon since he had drunk of the cup of power he preferred to be vanquished with soldiers rather than to vanquish with peoples and the army corps which he successively sent towards the netherlands amounted to seventy thousand men we emigrants in the city of charles v were like the women of that city seated behind their windows they watched the soldiers in a little slanting mirror passing down the street louis the thirteenth was there in a corner completely forgotten 
Scarcely did he from time to time receive a note from the Prince de Talleyrand returning from Vienna, a few lines from the members of the diplomatic body resident about the Duke of Wellington as commissaries, Messieurs Pozzo di Borgo, De Vincent, etc., etc. They had plenty to do besides thinking of us. A man unacquainted with politics would never have believed that an impotent hidden on the banks of the Lee would be flung back upon the throne by the collision of thousands of soldiers ready to cut each other's throats soldiers of whom he was neither the king nor the general, who were not thinking of him, who knew of neither his name nor his existence. Of two such close spots as Ghent and Waterloo, never did one appear so dim, the other so dazzling. The legitimacy lay in the storehouse, like an old broken wagon. We knew that Bonaparte's troops were approaching. To cover us we had only two little companies under the orders of the Duc de Berry, a prince whose blood could not avail us, for it was already demanded elsewhere. One thousand horse, detached from the French army, would have carried us off in a few hours. The fortifications of Ghent were demolished. The enceinte which remained would have been the more easily carried, in that the Belgian population was not in our favour. The scene which I had witnessed at the Tuileries was repeated. His Majesty's carriages were secretly got ready. The horses were ordered. We faithful ministers would have splashed after by God's grace. Monsieur left for Brussels, charged to watch the movements from near at hand. M. de Blaca had become anxious and melancholy. I, poor man, consoled him. People in Vienna were not favourably disposed to him. M. de Talleyrand laughed at him. The royalists accused him of being the cause of Napoleon's return. Thus, whatever happened, no further honoured exile for him in England, no further possibility of first places in France. I was his only support. I used to meet him pretty often in the horse-market, where he trotted about alone. Harnessing myself to his side, I fell in with his sad thought. This man, whom I have defended at Ghent and in England, whom I defended in France after the Hundred Days, and even in the preface to the Monarchie selon la Charte, has always been adverse to me. That would be nothing, if he had not been an evil for the monarchy. I do not repent my past simplicity, but I am bound in these memoirs to rectify the surprises sprung upon my judgment and my good heart. On the 18th of June, 1815, I left Ghent at noon by the Brussels Gate. I was going to finish my walk alone on the high road. I had taken Caesar's commentaries with me, and I strolled slowly along, immersed in my reading. I was more than a league from the town, when I thought I heard a dull rumbling. I stopped, looked up at the sky, which was fairly laden with clouds, taking counsel with myself whether I should continue to walk on, or go back towards Ghent for fear of a storm. I listened. I heard nothing more save the cry of a moorhen in the rushes, and the sound of a village clock. I pursued my way. I had not taken thirty steps before the rumbling began again, now short, now long, and at irregular intervals. Sometimes it was perceptible only through a trembling of the air, which communicated itself to the ground over those immense plains, so distant was it. Those detonations, less extensive, less undulating, less connected than those of thunder, gave rise in my mind to the idea of a battle. I found myself in front of a poplar planted at the corner of a hop-field. I crossed the road and leant erect against the trunk of the tree. My face turned in the direction of Brussels. A southerly wind springing up carried to me more distinctly the sound of artillery. That great battle, nameless as yet, of which I listened to the echoes at the foot of a poplar, and of which a village clock had just rung out the unknown funerals, was the Battle of Waterloo. A silent and solitary hearer of the formidable judgment of the destinies, I should have been less moved if I had found myself in the fray, the peril, the fire, the press of death, would have left me no time for meditation. But, alone under a tree in the fields of Ghent, like the shepherd of the flocks which passed around me, I was overwhelmed by the weight of my reflections. What was that battle? Was it decisive? Was Napoleon there in person? Were lots being cast upon the world as upon Christ's vesture? In the event of success or reverse for one side or the other, what would be the consequence for the nations? liberty or slavery but what blood was flowing was not each sound that reached my ear the last sigh of a frenchman was it a new crecy a new poitiers a new agincourt in which france's most implacable enemies were about to revel if they triumphed was not our glory lost if napoleon won the day what became of our liberty although a success on napoleon's side opened up to me an eternal exile the motherland at that moment gained the mastery in my heart my prayers before the oppressor of france if while saving our honour he was to snatch us from foreign domination was wellington triumphing 
then the legitimacy would re-enter paris behind those red uniforms which had just renewed their dye in the blood of the french then the royalty would have as state carriages at its coronation the ambulance wagons filled with our maimed grenadiers what manner of restoration would it be accomplished under such auspices that is but a very small portion of the ideas that tormented me each gunshot gave me a shock and doubled the beating of my heart at a few leagues from an immense catastrophe i did not see it i could not touch the huge funeral monument growing minute by minute at waterloo even as from the shore of bulac on the bank of the nile i had vainly stretched out my hands towards the pyramids no traveller appeared a few women in the fields peacefully weeding rows of vegetables did not seem to hear the noise to which i was listening but see a courier came riding up i left the foot of my tree and placed myself in the middle of the road i stopped the courier and questioned him he belonged to the duc de berry and came from alost bonaparte entered brussels yesterday seventeenth june after a sanguinary combat the battle was to have recommenced to-day eighteenth june they think the allies have suffered a decisive defeat and the order is given to retreat the courier continued his road i followed him hastening my steps i was passed by the carriage of a merchant who was fleeing post with his family he confirmed the courier's story all was in confusion when i returned to ghent they were closing the gates of the city only the wickets remained half open ill-armed civilians and a few soldiers in depot were keeping sentry i went to the king's monsieur had just arrived by a circuitous route he had left brussels upon the false news that bonaparte was about to enter it and that a first lost battle left no hope of winning a second they were saying that as the prussians had not formed their lines the english had been crushed at these bulletins the stampede became general the possessors of some resources left i who am accustomed never to have anything was always ready and prepared i wanted to let madame de chateaubriand move out before me she was a great bonapartist but did not like cannon shots she refused to leave me in the evening counsel at his majesty's we heard monsieur's reports over again as well as the on dit picked up at the military commandant's or at the baron dextein's the wagon to contain the crown diamonds was put too i had no need of a wagon to remove my treasure i put the black silk handkerchief in which i wrapped my head at night into my flaccid minister of the interior's portfolio and placed myself at the sovereign's disposal with that important document of the affairs of the legitimacy i was richer in my first emigration when my knapsack did duty as my pillow and served as a swaddling band for atala but in eighteen fifteen atala was a big gawky little girl of thirteen or fourteen who was going about alone in the world and who to her father's honour had got herself too much talked about on the nineteenth of june at one o'clock in the morning a letter from m pozzo brought to the king by express re-established the truth of the facts bonaparte had never entered brussels he had decidedly lost the battle of waterloo leaving paris on the twelfth of june he joined his army on the fourteenth on the fifteenth he forced the enemy's lines on the sambre on the sixteenth he beat the prussians in those plains of fleurus where victory seems to be always faithful to the french the villages of ligny and saint amand were carried at quatre bras a further success the duke of brunswick remained among the dead blucher in full retreat fell back upon a reserve of thirty thousand men under the orders of general bulow the duke of wellington with the english and dutch set his back against brussels on the morning of the eighteenth before the first gun had been fired the duke of wellington declared that he would be able to hold out until three o'clock but that at that time if the prussians did not come into sight he would necessarily be destroyed driven back upon planche noire and brussels he was shut out from all retreat he had been surprised by napoleon his strategic position was detestable he had accepted it and had not chosen it the french at first on the left wing of the enemy took the heights commanding the chateau d'hougemont as far as the farms of the haie saint and papelotte on the right wing they attacked the village of mont saint jean the farm of the haie saint was carried in the centre by prince jerome but the prussian reserves appeared in the direction of saint lambert at six o'clock in the evening a new and furious attack was delivered upon the village of the haie saint blucher arrived with fresh troops and cut off the squares of the imperial guard from the rest of our forces around this immortal phalanx the torrent of fugitives carried all with it among waves of dust fiery smoke and grape-shot in darkness ploughed with congreve rockets amid the roar of three hundred pieces of artillery and the headlong gallop of five and twenty thousand horses it was as it were the summary of all the battles of the empire twice the french shouted victory and twice their shouts were stifled under the pressure of the enemy's columns the fire from our lines died out the cartridges were exhausted 
some wounded grenadiers, amid thirty thousand slain and a hundred thousand blood-stained cannonballs, cooled and conglomerated at their feet, remained erect, leaning on their muskets, with broken bayonets and empty barrels. Not far from them the man of battles listened, with a fixed stare, to the last cannon-shot he was to hear in his life. In that field of carnage his brother Jerome was still fighting with his expiring battalions overwhelmed by numbers, but his courage was unable to retrieve the victory. The number of killed on the side of the Allies was estimated at 18,000 men, on the side of the French at 25,000. 1,200 British officers had perished. Almost all the Duke of Wellington's aide-de-camp were killed or wounded. There was not a family in England but went into mourning. The Prince of Orange was hit by a bullet in the shoulder. The Baron de Vincent, the Austrian ambassador, was shot through the hand. The English were beholden for the success to the Irish and to the Highland Brigade, whom our cavalry charges were unable to break. General Grouchy's corps, not having advanced, was not present in the action. The two armies crossed steel and fire with a valour and desperation inspired by a national enmity of ten centuries. Lord Castlereagh, giving an account of the battle in the House of Lords, said, The British and French soldiers, after the action, washed their blood-stained hands in the same stream, and from opposite banks congratulated each other on their courage. Wellington had always been baleful to Bonaparte, or rather the rival genius to France, the English genius, barred the road to victory. Today the Prussians lay claim to the honour of this decisive battle, as against the English, but in war it is not the action accomplished but the name that makes the triumpher. It was not Bonaparte who won the real battle of Jena. The blunders of the French were important. They made mistakes as to friendly or hostile bodies. They occupied the position of Catobra too late. Marshal Grouchy, whose instructions were to hold the Prussians in check with his 36,000 men, allowed them to pass without seeing them. Hence the reproaches which our generals cast at one another. Bonaparte attacked in front, according to his custom, instead of turning the English, and, with a master's presumption, occupied himself in cutting off the retreat of an enemy who was not beaten. Many falsehoods and some rather curious truths have been retailed concerning this catastrophe. The phrase, the guard dies but does not surrender, is an invention which no one dares now to defend. It appears to be certain that, at the commencement of the action, so made some strategic observations to the emperor, and that Napoleon replied dryly, because Wellington defeated you, you persist in thinking him a great general. At the end of the fighting, M. de Turenne urged Bonaparte to retire, to avoid falling into the hands of the enemy. Bonaparte, emerging from his thoughts as from a dream, at first flew into a passion, then suddenly, in the midst of his rage, he flung himself upon his horse and fled. On the 19th of June, a salute of a hundred guns at the Invalide announced the successes of Ligny, Charleroi, and Cartebras. They were celebrating victories that had died the day before at Waterloo. The first messenger to bring to Paris the news of this defeat, one of the greatest in history in its results, was Napoleon himself. He re-entered the barriers on the night of the 21st, as who should say returning from his shades, to inform his friends that he was no more. He stayed at the Elysee Bourbon. When he arrived from Elba, he had stayed at the Tuileries. Those refuges instinctively chosen reveal the change in his destiny. Fallen in a noble fight abroad, Napoleon had in Paris to endure the assaults of the advocates who wished to exploit his misfortunes. He regretted that he had not dissolved the chamber before his departure for the army. He often also repented that he had not had Fouché and Talleyrand shot. But it is certain that Bonaparte, after Waterloo, forbade himself any kind of violence, whether because he obeyed the natural calm of his temperament, or because he was daunted by fate. He no longer said, as before his first abdication, they shall see what the death of a great man is. The time for that spirited language was past. Opposed as he was to liberty, he thought of breaking up the chamber of representatives, presided over by Langevinet, who from a citizen became a senator, from a senator a peer, who since became a citizen again, and who from a citizen was about again to become a peer. General Lafayette, deputy, read from the tribune a motion declaring the chamber in permanent session, any attempt to dissolve it a crime of high treason, whosoever should be guilty of it a traitor to the country, and to be tried as such. 21st June, 1815. The general speech began with these words. Gentlemen, now when for the first time since many years I raise a voice which the old friends of liberty will still recognise, I feel called upon to speak to you of the danger of the country. This is the time to rally round the tricolor flag, the flag of 89, the flag of liberty, equality, and public order. 
The anachronism of this speech caused a momentary illusion. People thought they saw the revolution, personified by Lafayette, rise from the tomb and stand pale and wrinkled in the tribune. But those motions of order, revived after Mirabeau, were now no more than worn-out weapons taken from an old arsenal. If Lafayette nobly united the end and the commencement of his life, it was not in his power to weld together the two ends of the broken chain of time. Benjamin Constant waited on the emperor at the Elysee Bourbon. He found him in his garden. The crowd was filling the Avenue de Marigny and shouting, Long live the emperor! A touching cry coming from the popular heart. It was addressed to the vanquished. Bonaparte said to Benjamin Constant, What duty do these owe me? I found them and left them poor. This is perhaps the only speech that came from his heart, if nevertheless the deputy's emotion did not deceive his hearing. Bonaparte, foreseeing the event, anticipated the summons they were preparing to serve on him. He abdicated so as not to be compelled to abdicate. My political life is ended, he said. I declare my son emperor of the French under the name of Napoleon the Second. A useless disposition, like that of Charles X, in favour of Henry V. One gives crowns only when one possesses them, and men upset the will of adversity. Moreover, the emperor was no more sincere on descending the throne a second time than he had been in his first retirement. When the French commissaries went to inform the Duke of Wellington that Napoleon had abdicated, he replied, I knew that a year ago. The Chamber of Representatives, after some debates in which Manuel addressed the House, accepted its sovereign's new abdication, but vaguely, and without appointing a regency. An executive commission was created, the Duc d'Autrant presided over it. Three ministers, a council of state and a general of the emperors, composed it, and stripped their master once more. These were Fouché, Colincourt, Carnot, Quinet, and Grenier. During these transactions, Bonaparte was turning over his ideas in his head. I have no army left, he said. I have nothing but fugitives. The majority of the Chamber of Deputies are good. I have only Lafayette, Longinet, and a few others against me. If the nation rises, the enemy will be crushed. If, instead of rising, they quarrel, all will be lost. The nation has not sent deputies to overthrow me, but to support me. I am not afraid of them, whatever they may do. I shall always be the idol of the people and the army. If I were to say a word, they would be beaten to death. But if we quarrel, instead of acting in concert, we shall meet with the fate of the low empire. A deputation from the Chamber of Representatives, having come to congratulate him on his new abdication, he replied, I thank you. I wish that my abdication may bring happiness to France, but I am not hopeful. He repented soon after, when he heard that the Chamber of Representatives had appointed a commission of government composed of five members. He said to the ministers, I have not abdicated in favour of a new directory. I have abdicated in favour of my son. If they do not proclaim him, my abdication is null and void. It is not by appearing before the Allies with hang-dog looks and bent knee that the Chambers will force them to recognise the national independence. He complained that Lafayette, Sébastien, Pontécoulant, Benjamin Constant, had conspired against him that, besides, the Chambers had not enough energy. He said that he alone could repair all, but that the leaders would never consent that they would rather be swallowed up in the abyss than unite with him, Napoleon, to close it. On the 27th of June, at the Malmaison, he wrote this sublime letter. In abdicating the power, I did not renounce the citizen's noblest right, the right of defending my country. In these grave circumstances, I offer my services as a general, regarding myself still as the first soldier of the motherland. The Duke de Bassano, having represented to him that the chambers would not be for him, then I see, he said, one must always give in. That infamous Fouché is deceiving you. Only Colincourt and Carnot are worth anything. But what can they do with a traitor Fouché and two simpletons, Quinet and Grenier, and two chambers which do not know what they want? You all believe, like fools, in the fine promises of the foreigners. You believe they will set the pot boiling, and that they will give you a prince of their making, do you not? You are wrong. Plenty potentials were sent to the Allies. On the 29th of June, Napoleon demanded two frigates stationed at Rochefort to take him out of France. Meanwhile, he had retired to the Malmaison. The debates in the House of Peers were lively. Long an enemy of Bonaparte, Carnot, who signed the order for the massacres of Avignon, without having time to read it, had found time during the Hundred Days to immolate his republicanism to the title of Count. On the 22nd of June, he had read in the Luxembourg 
a letter from the minister of war containing an exaggerated report on the military resources of france ney newly arrived was unable to hear this report unangered napoleon in his bulletins had spoken of the marshal with ill-disguised dissatisfaction and gorgo accused ney of being the chief cause of the loss of the battle of waterloo ney rose and said the report is untrue untrue in every respect Grouchy can have only twenty to twenty-five thousand men under his orders, at the most. There is not a single soldier of the guard left to be rallied. I commanded it. I saw it slaughtered bodily before leaving the battlefield. The enemy is at Nivelle with eighty thousand men. He can be in Paris in six days. You have no other means of saving the country than to open negotiations. The aide de camp Flau endeavoured to support the report of the Minister of War. Ney replied with fresh vehemence. I repeat... You have no other way of safety except negotiation. You must recall the Bourbons. As for myself, I shall retire to the United States. At these words, La Vallette and Carnot overwhelmed the marshal with reproaches. Ney replied with disdain. I am not one of those men to whom their own interest is everything. What have I to gain by the return of Louis XVIII, to be shot for the crime of desertion? But I owe the truth to my country." In the sitting of the peers of the 23rd, General Drew, recalling this scene, said, I heard with regret what was said yesterday to disparage the glory of our arms, to exaggerate our disasters and disparage our resources. My astonishment was so much the greater because those speeches were delivered by a distinguished general who, through his great valour and his military attainments, had so often deserved the gratitude of the nation. In the sitting of the 22nd, a second storm had burst out at the heel of the first, the question was Bonaparte's abdication. Lucien was insisting that his nephew should be recognised as emperor. M. de Ponticoulon interrupted the speaker, and asked by what right Lucien, a foreigner and a Roman prince, permitted himself to give a sovereign to France. How, he added, can we recognise a child living in a foreign country? At this question, La Bédoyer, speaking excitedly from his seat, I have heard voices around the throne of the fortunate sovereign. They withdraw from it to-day when he is unfortunate. There are people who do not want to recognise Napoleon II, because they want to receive the law from the foreigner, to whom they give the name of allies. Napoleon's abdication is indivisible. If you refuse to recognise his son, he must remain sword in hand, surrounded by Frenchmen who have shed their blood for him, and who are still all covered with wounds. He will be abandoned by base generals who have already betrayed him. But if you declare that every Frenchman who deserts his flag shall be covered with infamy, his house razed to the ground, his family outlawed, then there will be no more traitors, no more intrigues such as have occasioned the late catastrophes, some of whose authors are perhaps sitting among us. The house rose in an uproar. Order, 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 they bellowed, feeling the thrust. Young man, you forget yourself, cried Massena. Do you think you are still in the guard-room? asked Lameth. All the portents of the second restoration were threatening. Bonaparte had returned at the head of four hundred Frenchmen. Louis the Eighteenth was returning behind four hundred thousand foreigners, he passed near the bloody pool of Waterloo to go to Saint-Denis, as though to his funeral. It was while the legitimacy was thus advancing that the interpolations of the House of Peers resounded. They contained something, I know not what, of those terrible revolutionary scenes of the great days of our troubles, when the dagger was passed round on the bench from hand to hand among the victims. A few soldiers whose baleful fascination had brought about the ruin of France, by producing the second foreign invasion, struggled on the threshold of the palace. Their prophetic despair, their gestures, their words from the tomb, seemed to announce a treble death. Death to themselves, death to the man whom they had blessed, death to the man whom they had proscribed. End of Book 5, Part 1Book Five, Part Two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Three. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Three by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book Five, Part Two. While Bonaparte was retiring to the Malmaison with the finished empire. We were leaving Ghent with the recommencing monarchy. Pozzo, who knew how little question of the legitimacy there was in high places, hastened to write to Louis the Eighteenth to set out and arrive in good time, if he wished to reign before the place was taken, 
It was to that note that Louis XVIII owed his crown in 1815. At Mons, I missed the first occasion of fortune in my political career. I was my own obstacle, and I found myself incessantly in my way. This time my good qualities played me the ill turn which my faults might have done me. M. de Talleyrand, in all the pride of a negotiation which had enriched him, claimed that he had rendered the greater services to the legitimacy, and was returning as the master. Astonished that they had not already followed, for the return to Paris, the road which he had traced out, he was much more dissatisfied to find M. de Blacas still with the king. He looked upon M. de Blacas as the scourge of the monarchy. But this was not the real motive of his aversion. He beheld in M. de Blacas the favourite, and consequently the rival. He also feared Monsieur, and had flown into a passion when, a fortnight earlier, Monsieur had made him an offer of his hotel on the Lee. To ask for Monsieur de Blacas's removal was most natural. To demand it was too reminiscent of Bonaparte. Monsieur de Talleyrand drove into Mons at six o'clock in the evening, accompanied by the Abbe Louis. Monsieur de Rissé, Monsieur de Jocourt, and a few other boon companions flew to him, full of an ill humour such as he had never yet displayed the ill-humour of a king who believes his authority to have been slighted he refused at first to go to louis eighteen replying to those who urged him to do so with his ostentatious phrase i am never in a hurry it will be time enough to-morrow i went to see him he tried upon me all those wheedling tricks with which he used to seduce small ambitious men and important nincompoops he took me by the arm leant upon me while he spoke to me familiarities denoting high favour and calculated to turn my head although with me they were quite lost. I did not even understand. I invited him to come to the king's, where I was going. Louis the Eighteenth was in one of his great sorrows. It was a question of parting with Monsieur de Blacas. The latter could not return to France. Opinion had risen against him. Although I had had reason to complain of the favourite in Paris, I had displayed no resentment towards him at Ghent. The king had been pleased with my conduct. In his emotion he treated me marvellously well. M. de Talleyrand's remarks had already been repeated to him. He boasts, he said to me, of having a second time put back the crown on my head, and he threatens to go back again to Germany. What do you think of that, M. de Chateaubriand? I replied, Your Majesty must have been misinformed. M. de Talleyrand is only tired. If the King consents, I will return to see the minister. The King appeared gratified. What he liked least was worries. He longed for his repose, even at the expense of his affections. M. de Talleyrand, in the midst of his flatterers, was more arrogant than ever. I represented to him that, at so critical a moment, he could not dream of going away. Pozzo preached at him in the same sense. Although he had not the slightest inclination for him, he liked, at that moment, to see him at the head of affairs, as an old acquaintance. Besides, he believed him to be in favour with the Tsar. I made no headway on M. de Talleyrand's mind. The prince's familiars fought against me. Even M. Mounier thought that M. de Talleyrand ought to retire. The Abbe Louis, who snapped at everybody, said to me, shaking his jaw three times, If I were the prince, I should not remain a quarter of an hour at Mons. I answered, Monsieur l'Abbé, you and I can go where we please. No one will notice us. It is different with M. de Talleyrand. I insisted again and said to the prince, Do you know that the king is continuing his journey? M. de Talleyrand appeared surprised and then said to me loftily, as did the Balafre to those who wished to put him on his guard against the designs of Henry the Third, he will not dare. I returned to the king's where I found Monsieur de Blacas. I told his majesty to excuse his minister, that he was ill, but that he would most certainly have the honour of paying his court to the king the next day. As he pleases, replied Louis the Eighteenth. I leave at three o'clock. And then he added these words in an affectionate tone. I am going to part with Monsieur de Blacas. The place will be vacant, Monsieur de Chateaubriand. It was the royal household laid at my feet. A wary politician would have ceased to trouble his head about M. de Talleyrand, and would have had the horses put to his carriage to follow or precede the king. I remained stupidly at my inn. M. de Talleyrand, unable to persuade himself that the king would go, had gone to bed. At three o'clock they woke him to tell him that the king was starting. He could not believe his ears. Tricked! Betrayed! he cried. They got him out of bed, and there he was, for the first time in his life, in the street at three o'clock in the morning, leaning on M. de Risset's arm. He reached the king's house. The two leaders of the team had already half their bodies through the gateway. The people motioned to the postillion to pull up. The king asked what was the matter. They cried, Sire, it is M. de Talleyrand. He's asleep, said Louis the Eighteenth. 
he is here sire come on replied the king the horses moved backward with the carriage the door was opened the king got down and dragged himself back to his apartment followed by the limping minister there m de talleyrand began an angry explanation his majesty listened to him and answered prince de benevol so you are leaving us the waters will do you good you must send us your news the king left the prince open mouthed had himself taken back to his berlin and drove away m de talleyrand was foaming with rage louis the eighteenth's composure had staggered him he m de talleyrand who prided himself so greatly on his composure to be beaten on his own ground given the slip on a square at mons like the most insignificant of men he could not get over it he remained dumb watched the coach moving off and then seizing the duc de levy by a button of his spencer go monsieur le duc go and say how i am treated i have put back the crown on the king's head he was always harking back to that crown and i am going back to germany to begin the new emigration monsieur de levy listening absent-mindedly lifting himself on his toes said prince i am going the king must have at least one great lord with him m de levy flung himself into a hired carriole which was conveying the chancellor of france the two grandees of the capetian monarchy were going side by side to catch it up sharing expenses in a merovingian benna i had asked m de durat to endeavour to effect a reconciliation and to send me the first news of it what said m de durat you are remaining behind after what the king said to you m de blacas when leaving mons in his turn thanked me for the interest i had shown him i went back and found m de talleyrand embarrassed he was now regretting that he had not followed my advice and that like a wrong-headed subaltern he had refused to go to the king in the evening he feared that arrangements would be made without him that he would not be able to participate in the political power and to profit by the financial jobbing which was preparing i told him that although i differed from his opinion i remained none the less attached to him as an ambassador to his minister that besides i had friends with the king and that i hoped soon to hear something good m de talleyrand was all tenderness he leant upon my shoulder certainly at that moment he thought me a very great man it was not long before i received a note from m de durat he wrote to me from cambrai that the affair was arranged and that m de talleyrand would receive orders to start this time the prince did not fail to obey what devil was prompting me i had not followed the king who had so to speak offered or rather given me the ministry of his household and who was offended at my obstinacy in remaining at mons i was breaking my neck on behalf of m de talleyrand whom i hardly knew whom i did not esteem whom i did not admire for m de talleyrand who was about to enter into combinations quite different from mine who lived in an atmosphere of corruption in which i could not breathe it was from mons itself amid all his worries that the prince de benevent sent m de perret to naples to receive the millions of one of his viennese bargains m de blacas was at the same time travelling with the naples embassy in his pocket and some other millions which the generous exile of ghent had given him at mons i had kept on good terms with m de blacas precisely because everybody detested him i had incurred m de talleyrand's friendship for my fidelity to a whim of his mood louis the eighteenth had positively called me about his person and i preferred the baseness of a faithless man to the king's favour it was only too just that i should receive the reward of my stupidity that i should be abandoned by all for having tried to serve all i returned to france without the wherewithal to pay my journey while treasures poured down upon those in disgrace i deserved that correction it is very well to fence one's way as a poor knight when the whole world is cased in gold but still one must not make enormous mistakes had i remained with the king the combination of the talleyrand and fouche ministry would have become almost impossible had the restoration commenced with a moral and honourable mystery all the combinations of the future might have been different my callousness of my own person deceived me as to the importance of facts the majority of men have the fault of reckoning themselves too high i have the fault of not reckoning myself high enough i wrapped myself in my habitual disdain of my fortune i ought to have seen that the fortune of france was at that moment linked with that of my small destinies such entanglements are very common in history leaving mons at last i arrived at cato Combresses. m de talleyrand joined me there we seemed as though we had come to remake the treaty of peace of fifteen fifty nine between henry the second of france and philip the second of spain at Combray it appeared that the marquis de la Suze, a quartermaster of the time of fenelon had disposed of the billets of madame de levy madame de chateaubriand and myself we remained in the street in the midst of the bonfires of the crowd circulating around us and of the inhabitants crying long live the king 
A student, hearing that I was there, took us to his mother's house. The friends of the different monarchies of France were beginning to make their appearance. They were not coming to Cambrai for the league against Venice, but to combine against the new constitutions. They were hastening to lay at the king's feet their successive loyalties and their hatred of the charter, a passport which they considered necessary with Monsieur. I and two or three reasonable Gileses already smelt of Jacobinism. On the 28th of June appeared the Declaration of Cambrai. In it the king said, I wish to remove from my person only those men whose reputation is a subject of grief to France and of dismay to Europe. Now behold, the name of Fouché was pronounced with gratitude by the pavillon Massin. The king laughed at his brother's new passion and said, He has not received it by divine inspiration. I have already told you that when passing through Cambrai after the hundred days, I vainly sought my lodging of the time of the Navarre regiment, and the coffee-house which I frequented with La Martinière. All had vanished with my youth. From Cambrai we went to sleep at Roy. The mistress of the inn took Madame de Chateaubriand for Madame la Dauphine. She was carried in triumph to a large room, in which stood a table laid for thirty persons. The room, lighted by wax candles, tallow candles, and a great fire, was stifling. The hostess did not wish to receive payment, and said, I look askance at myself for not having got myself guillotined for our kings. Last spark of a fire which had animated the French for so many centuries. General Lamotte, brother-in-law to M. Laborie, came, dispatched by the authorities of the capital, to tell us that it would be impossible for us to appear in Paris without the tricolor cockade. M. de Lafayette and other commissaries, very ill-received, for the rest, by allies, went fawning from one staff office to the other, begging from the foreigners for a master of some sort for France. Any king at the Cossack's own option would do excellently, provided that he did not descend from St. Louis and Louis XIV. At Roy we held a council. M. de Talleyrand had a pair of hacks put to his carriage and went to the king's. His equipage took up the width of the square from the minister's inn to the king's door. He stepped out of his car with a memorandum, which he read to us. He considered the course we should have to follow on our arrival. He ventured a few words on the necessity of admitting all, without distinction, to the distribution of places. He hinted that we might extend our generosity as far as the judges of Louis XVI. His Majesty coloured, and striking the two arms of his chair with both hands, cried, Never! A never of twenty-four hours. At Senlis we called at a cannon's, his servant-maid received us like dogs. As to the cannon, who was not St. Regulus, the patron saint of the town, he would not so much as look at us. His maid had orders to show us no other service than to buy us something to eat, for our own money. The genie du Christianism availed me nothing. Yet Senlis ought to have been of good omen to us since it was in that town that Henry the Fourth escaped from the hands of his jailers, in 1576. I have no regret, exclaimed the king, who was Montaigne's fellow countryman, as he made his escape, save for two things which I have left in Paris, the mass and my wife. From Senlis we went to the birthplace of Philip Augustus, otherwise Gonis. On approaching the village we saw two persons coming towards us. It was Marshal Macdonald and my faithful friend, Hyde de Neuville. They stopped our carriage and asked us where Monsieur de Talleyrand was. They made no difficulties about telling me that they were looking for him, in order to inform the king that his majesty must not think of passing the gates before he had taken Fouché as his minister. Anxiety came over me, for in spite of the manner in which Louis the Eighteenth had pronounced himself at war, I did not feel greatly reassured. I questioned the marshal. What, Monsieur le Maréchal, I asked, is it certain that we cannot return except on such harsh conditions? Faith, Monsieur le Vicomte, replied the marshal, I am not quite convinced of it. The king stopped two hours at Gonesse. I left Madame de Chateaubriand in her carriage in the middle of the high road, and went to the council at the mayor's offices. There a measure was brought under deliberation, upon which depended the future fate of the monarchy. The discussion began, I alone with Monsieur Bonnier, maintained that in no case ought Louis the Eighteenth to admit M. Fouché to his counsels. The king listened. I saw that he would have liked to keep his word given at Roy, but he was absorbed by Monsieur and driven by the Duke of Wellington. In a chapter of the Monarchie selon la Charte, I have recapitulated the reasons upon which I laid stress at Gonesse. I was excited. The spoken word has a strength which becomes weaker in the written word. Wherever an open tribune exists, I said, in this chapter, no one liable to be exposed to reproaches of a certain kind can be placed at the head of the government. There are certain speeches, certain phrases, 
which would oblige such a minister to resign on leaving the chamber. This impossibility resulting from the free principle of representative government was not felt at a time when all illusions united to place a famous man in office, notwithstanding the too well-founded repugnance of the crown. The rise of that man was bound to produce one of these two things, either the abolition of the charter or the fall of the ministry at the opening of the session. Can one picture the minister to whom I refer, listening in the chamber of deputies to the discussion concerning the 21st of January, liable every moment to be apostrophized by some deputy from Lyon, and always threatened with the terrible tu es il est vieux. Men of that kind cannot be employed ostensibly, except with the mutes of the seraglio of Bajazet, or the mutes of the legislative body of Bonaparte. What will become of the minister of a deputy, ascending the tribune with a monitor in his hand, reads the report of the convention of the ninth of August, 1795, if he demands the expulsion of Fouché, as unworthy by virtue of that report which ejected him, Fouché, I am quoting literally, as a thief and a terrorist, whose atrocious and criminal conduct conferred dishonour and opprobrium upon any assembly whatever of which he became a member. Those are the things which have been forgotten. After all, supposing they had had the misfortune to think that a man of that kind could ever be useful, they ought to have kept him behind the scenes, consulted his deplorable experience, but to do violence to the crown and to public opinion, in a barefaced manner to summon such a minister as that to affairs, a man whom Bonaparte at that very moment treated as infamous, was that not to declare that they disclaim liberty and virtue? Is a crown worth so great a sacrifice? It left them powerless to remove anybody. Whom could they exclude after accepting Fouché? Parties acted without thinking of the form of government which they had adopted. Every one spoke of the constitution, of liberty, of equality, of the right of peoples, and no one wanted them. Fashionable verbiage, one asked without thinking, for news of the charter, hoping all the time that it would soon die the death. Liberals and royalists lent towards absolute government, modified by our habits. Such is the temper and trend of France. Material interests prevailed. They did not want, they said, to disown what had been done during the revolution. Each was burdened with his own life and claimed the right to load his neighbour with it. Evil, they asserted, had become an element in public life, which must thenceforth combine with the governments and enter as a vital principle into society. My crotchet relative to a charter set in motion by religious and moral action was the cause of the ill-will which certain parties have borne me. For the royalists I was too much attached to liberty. For the revolutionaries I had too great a scorn for crimes. Had I not been there, to my great detriment, to make myself the schoolmaster of constitutionalism. The ultras and the Jacobins would from the earliest days have put the charter into the pocket of their fleury dress-coats, or their carmagnols a la Cassius. M. de Talleyrand had no liking for M. Fouché. M. Fouché detested, and strangest of all, despised M. de Talleyrand. It was difficult to achieve that success. M. de Talleyrand, who at first would have been pleased not to be coupled to M. Fouché, feeling that the latter was inevitable, consented to the proposal. He did not perceive that, with the charter, especially when he was united with the man of the Lyon grape-shot, he was hardly more possible than Fouché. Promptly what I declared was verified. They obtained no profit from the admission of the Duc d'Autrante. They obtained nothing but opprobrium. The approaching shadow of the chambers was enough to cause the disappearance of ministers too much exposed to the plain speaking of the tribune. My opposition was of no avail. According to the custom of weak characters, the king closed the sitting without deciding anything. The order in council was to be settled at the Chateau d'Anouville. No council, strictly speaking, was held at this last residence. Only the intimates and those associated with the secret were assembled. M. de Talleyrand, having distanced us, entered into intelligence with his friends. The Duke of Wellington arrived. I saw him drive past in a calash. The plumes of his hat waved in the air. He had come to confer with M. Fouché and M. de Talleyrand upon France, as a twofold present which the Battle of Waterloo was making to our country. When it was represented to him that the regicide of M. le Duc d'Autrante was perhaps a drawback, he replied, That's a trifle. An Irish Protestant, an English general unacquainted with our manners and our history, a mind seeing in the French year 1793 only the English president of the year 1649, was charged to shape our destinies. Bonaparte's ambition had reduced us to this state of wretchedness. I rambled by myself in the gardens which the controller-general Machaut left at the age of ninety-three years to go and die at the Madelonnette 
for death in his great review passed none over then. I was no longer sent for. The familiarities of a common misfortune had ceased between the sovereign and the subject. The king was getting ready to return to his palace, I to my retreat. The vacuum forms anew round monarchs so soon as they recover their power. I have rarely passed, without making serious reflections, through the silent and uninhabited rooms of the Tuileries, which led me to the king's closet. For me, deserts of another kind, infinite solitudes in which the very worlds vanish before God, the only real being. Bread was scarce at Arnouville, but for an officer named Dubourg, who was hurrying away from Ghent like ourselves, we should have fasted. M. Dubourg went marauding. He brought us back half a sheep to the house of the mayor, who had run away. If the servant of the mayor, a heroine of Beauvais left alone, had had any arms, she would have received us like Jeanne Hachette. We proceeded to Saint-Denis. Along both sides of the roadway stretched the bivouacs of the Prussians and English. In the distance the eye met the spires of the abbey. Into its foundations Dagobert threw his jewels. In its vaults the successive dynasties buried their kings and their great men. Four months since we had laid the bones of Louis XVI, there to replace the other dust. When I returned from my first exile in 1800, I had crossed this same plain of Saint-Denis. Then only Napoleon's soldiers were encamped there. Frenchmen still took the place of the old bands of the Constable de Montmorency. A baker harboured us. In the evening, at nine o'clock, I went to pay my court to the king. His majesty was lodged in the abbey buildings. They had all the difficulty in the world to prevent the little girls of the Legion of Honour from crying, Long live Napoleon! I first entered the church. A piece of wall adjoining the cloister had fallen. The old abbey church was lit only by a lamp. I said my prayer at the entrance to the vault where I had seen Louis XVI lowered, full of dread as to the future. I do not know that I ever felt my heart drowned in a more profound and more religious melancholy. Next I went to his majesty's. Shown into one of the rooms which preceded the king's, I found no one there. I sat down in a corner and waited. Suddenly a door opened, silently vice-entered, leaning on the arm of crime, M. de Talleyrand walking supported by M. Fouché. The infernal vision passed slowly before me, penetrated into the king's closet, and vanished. Fouché was coming to swear fealty and homage to his lord. The trusty regicide on his knees laid the hands which caused the head to fall of Louis XVI, between the hands of the brother of the royal martyr. The upper state bishop was surety for the oath. On the next day the Faubourg Saint-Germain arrived. Everything concerned itself with the nomination, already obtained, of Fouché. Religion as well as impiety, virtue as well as vice, the royalist as well as the revolutionary, the foreigner as well as the Frenchman. On every hand the cry was heard. No safety for the king without Fouché. No salvation for France without Fouché. He alone has saved the country. He alone can complete his work. The old Duchesse de Duras was one of the noble dames who joined most eagerly in the pian. The Bailly de Cousseau, the, a survivor of Malta, chimed in. He declared that, if his head was still on his shoulders, it was because M. Fouché had permitted it. The timorous ones had stood in such terror of Bonaparte that they had taken the butcher of Lyon for a Titus. During more than three months the drawing-rooms of the Faubourg Saint-Germain looked upon me as a miscreant, because I disapproved of the nomination of their ministers. Poor people, they had prostrated themselves at the feet of the upstarts. They none the less made a great noise about their nobility, their hatred of the revolutionaries, their unshaken fidelity, the inflexibility of their principles. And they adored Fouché. Fouché had seen the incompatibility of his ministerial existence with the game of the representative monarchy. As he could not amalgamate with the elements of a legal government, he endeavoured to make the political elements homogeneous to his own nature. He had created a factitious terror, Inventing imaginary dangers, he made pretensions to oblige the crown to recognise Bonaparte's two chambers, and to receive the declaration of rights which had been hurriedly completed. A few words even were murmured as to the necessity of exiling Monsieur and his sons. To isolate the king would have been the masterpiece. People continued to be gulled. In vain the National Guard climbed over the walls of Paris and came to protest its devotion. It was asserted that this guard was ill-disposed. The faction had had the gates closed in order to prevent the population, which had remained royalist during the hundred days, from hurrying up, and it was said that this population was threatening to butcher Louis the Eighteenth on his way. The blindness was marvellous, for the French army was falling back upon the Loire, 
one hundred and fifty thousand allies occupied the outposts of the capital and they continued to pretend that the king was not strong enough to penetrate into a city where not a soldier remained where none was left but civilians quite capable of restraining a handful of federates if these had taken it into their heads to stir unfortunately the king through a series of fatal coincidences seemed to be the leader of the english impressions he thought himself surrounded with liberators and he was accompanied by enemies he appeared environed by an escort of honour and this escort was in reality only the gendarmes taking him out of his kingdom he was merely crossing paris in the company of the foreigners whose memory would one day serve as a pretext for the banishment of his house the provisional government formed after the abdication of bonaparte was dissolved by means of a kind of indictment of the crown a stepping-stone upon which it was hoped one day to build a new revolution at the first restoration i was of opinion that the tricolor cockade should be kept it was resplendent in all its glory the white cockade was forgotten by retaining colours warranted by so many triumphs men were not preparing a rallying token for a coming revolution not to adopt the white cockade would have been wise to abandon it after it had been worn by bonaparte's and grenadiers was an act of cowardice one cannot pass with impunity under the codine forks that which dishonours is fatal a slap in the face does you no harm physically and yet it kills you before leaving st denis i was received by the king and had the following conversation with him well said louis eighteen opening the dialogue with this exclamation well sire you are taking the duc d'autrante i needs had to from my brother down to the bay de Cousson, and the latter is not suspect every one said that we could not do otherwise what do you think sire the thing is done i beg your majesty's permission to say nothing no no speak you know how i resisted since ghent sire i only obey your orders pardon my loyalty i think the monarchy is finished the king kept silence i was beginning to tremble at my boldness when his majesty resumed well monsieur de chateaubriand i am of your opinion this conversation concludes my story of the hundred days End of Book 5, Part 2book six part one of the memoirs of chateaubriand volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee the memoirs of chateaubriand volume three by francois rene de chateaubriand translated by alexander texera de matos book six part one book six if a man were unexpectedly transported from life's most clamorous scenes to the silent shores of the arctic ocean he would feel what i feel beside the tomb of napoleon for we find ourselves suddenly standing by the edge of that tomb leaving paris on the twenty fifth of june napoleon awaited at the Malmaison the moment of his departure from france i returned to him coming back to past days anticipating future times i shall not leave him again until after his death the Malmaison, where the emperor rested, was empty. Josephine was dead. Bonaparte found himself alone in that retreat. There he had commenced his fortune. There he had been happy. There he had become intoxicated with the incense of the world. There, from the heart of his tomb, issued orders that shook the world. In those gardens where formerly the feet of the crowd raked up the sanded walks, the grass and brambles grew green. I had ascertained this when walking there. Already, for want of tending, the exotic trees were pining away. On the canals, the black Australian swans no longer floated. The cage no longer held the tropical birds prisoners. They had flown away to await their host in their own country. Bonaparte might, however, have found a subject of consolation by turning his eyes upon his early days. Fallen kings are afflicted above all because, looking upwards from their fall, they see only a splendid inheritance and the pomps of their cradle. But what did Napoleon discern prior to his prosperity? The manger of his birth in a Corsican village? Higher-minded, when flinging off the purple mantle, he would have proudly resumed the goat-herd scion. But men do not place themselves back at their origin when it was humble. It seems that an unjust heaven deprives them of their patrimony when, in fate's lottery, they do naught but lose what they have won. 
and nevertheless napoleon's greatness arises from the fact that he had started from himself none of his blood had gone before him and prepared his power at the sight of those abandoned gardens of those untenanted apartments of those galleries faded by the routs of those rooms in which song and music had ceased napoleon was able to go over his career he was able to ask himself whether with a little more moderation he might not have preserved his delights foreigners enemies were not banishing him now he was not departing as a quasi victor leaving the nations in admiration of his passage after the prodigious campaign of eighteen fourteen he was retiring beaten frenchmen friends were demanding his immediate abdication urging his departure refusing even to have him as a general sending him messenger after messenger to oblige him to quit the soil over which he had shed as much glory as scourges added to this harsh lesson came other warnings the prussians were prowling around the neighbourhood of the Marmaison. blucher full of wine staggering ordered them to seize to hang the conqueror who had put his foot on the neck of kings the rapidity of the fortunes the vulgarity of the manners the promptness of the elevation and degradation of the personages of to-day will i fear take away a part of the nobility of history rome and greece did not speak of hanging alexander and caesar the scenes which had taken place in eighteen fourteen were renewed in eighteen fifteen but with something more offensive because the ingrates were stimulated by fear it was necessary to get rid of napoleon quickly the allies were arriving alexander was not there at first to temper the triumph and curb the insolence of fortune paris was no more adorned with its lustral inviolability a first invasion had profaned the sanctuary it was no longer god's anger that fell upon us it was the contempt of heaven the human thunderbolt was spent all the cowardly characters had acquired a new degree of malignity through the hundred days affecting to raise themselves through love of the country above personal attachments they exclaimed that it was really too criminal of bonaparte to have violated the treaties of eighteen fourteen but were not the true culprits those who had countenanced his designs suppose that in eighteen fifteen instead of getting new armies for him after forsaking him once only to forsake him again they had said to him when he came to sleep at the tuileries you have been deceived by your genius opinion is no longer with you take pity on france retire after this last visit to the country go and live in the land of washington who knows that the bourbons will not make mistakes who knows that one day france will not turn her eyes towards you when in the school of liberty you shall have learnt to respect the laws you will then return not as a ravisher swooping on his prey but as a great citizen the pacificator of his country they did not hold that language to them they humoured the passions of their returned leader they contributed to blinding him sure as they were of benefiting by either his victory or his defeat the soldier alone died for napoleon with admirable sincerity the rest was but a grazing herd growing fat to right and left if at least the viziers of the despoiled caliph had been satisfied to turn their backs on him but no they reaped profit from his last moments they overwhelmed him with their sordid demands all wanted to make money out of his poverty never was a more complete abandonment bonaparte had given cause for it he was insensible to the troubles of others the world paid him with indifference for indifference like most despots he was on good terms with his domestics at bottom he cared for nobody a solitary man he sufficed unto himself misfortune did nothing except to restore him to the desert which was his life when i gather up my memories when i recollect having seen washington in his little house at philadelphia and bonaparte in his palaces it seems to me that washington retiring to his field in virginia cannot have experienced the searchings of conscience of bonaparte awaiting exile in his gardens at the Marmaison. nothing was altered in the life of the first he relapsed into his modest habits he had not raised himself above the happiness of the husbandman whom he had freed all was subverted in the life of the second napoleon left the Marmaison accompanied by generals bertrand rovigo and becker the latter in the quality of inspector or commissary on the way he was seized with a wish to stop at rambouillet he left it to take ship at rochefort as did charles x to take ship at cherbourg rambouillet the inglorious retreat where all that was greatest in men or dynasties was eclipsed the fatal spot where francis i died where henry the third escaping from the barricade slept booted and spurred in passing where louis says left his shadow how happy would louis napoleon and charles have been 
had they been only the humble keepers of the herds of Rambouillet. On arriving at Rochefort, Napoleon hesitated. The executive commission was sending imperative orders. The garrisons of Rochefort and the Rochelle, said the dispatches, must use main force to make Napoleon take ship. Employ force, make him go. His services cannot be accepted. Napoleon's services could not be accepted. And had you not accepted his bounties and his chains? Napoleon did not go away. He was driven out. And by whom? Bonaparte had believed only in fortune. He banned misfortune ab igne et aqua. He had acquitted the ungrateful in advance. A just retaliation made him appear before his own system. When success, ceasing to animate his person, became incarnate in another individual, the disciples abandoned the master for the school. I, who believe in the legitimacy of benefits and the sovereignty of misfortune, had I served Bonaparte, I would not have left him. I would have proved to him, by my fidelity, the falseness of his political principles. Sharing his disgrace, I would have remained by his side as a living contradiction of his barren doctrines and of the worthlessness of the right of prosperity. Frigates had been waiting for him in the Rochefort roadstead since the 1st of July. Hopes which never die, memories inseparable from a last farewell, kept him back. How he must have regretted the days of his childhood, when his clear eyes had not yet known the first raindrops. He left time for the English fleet to approach. He was still able to embark on two luggers which were to join a Danish ship at sea. This was the course which his brother Joseph took. But decision failed him when he looked at the coast of France. He felt an aversion for a republic. The liberty and equality of the United States were repugnant to him. He inclined towards asking shelter of the English. What disadvantage do you see in that course, he asked, of those whom he consulted? The disadvantage of dishonouring yourself, answered a naval officer. You must not fall, even dead, into the hands of the English. They will have you stuffed and show you at a shilling a head. Notwithstanding these observations, the emperor resolved to give himself up to his conquerors. On the 13th of July, when Louis the Eighteenth had already been five days in Paris, Napoleon sent the captain of the English ship Bellerophon the following letter for the Prince Regent. Royal Highness, a victim to the factions which distract my country and to the enmity of the greatest powers in Europe, I have terminated my political career and I come, like the Mistocles, to throw myself upon the hospitality of the British people. I put myself under the protection of their laws, which I claim from Your Royal Highness as the most powerful, the most constant, and the most generous of my enemies. Rochefort, 13th July, 1815. If Bonaparte had not, during twenty years, overwhelmed with outrages the British people, its government, its king, and the heir of that king, one might find a certain propriety of tone in this letter. But how had this Royal Highness, so long despised, so long insulted by Napoleon, suddenly become the most powerful, the most constant, and the most generous of enemies, by the mere fact that he was victorious? Napoleon could not be persuaded of what he was saying, and that which is not true is not eloquent. The phrase setting forth the fact of a fallen greatness addressing itself to an enemy is fine. The well-worn instance of Themistocles is superfluous. The step taken by Napoleon shows something worse than a lack of sincerity. It shows neglect of France. The emperor busied himself only with his individual catastrophe. When the fall came, we no longer counted for anything in his eyes. Without reflecting that, by giving the preference to England over America, his choice became an outrage to the mourning of the country. He begged a shelter of the government which for twenty years had kept Europe in its pay against ourselves, of the government whose commissary with the Russian army, General Wilson, urged Kutuzov in the retreat from Moscow to exterminate us completely. The English, successful in the final battle, were encamped in the Bois de Boulogne. Go then, O Themistocles, to seat yourself quietly by the British hearth, while the soil has not yet finished drinking in the French blood shed for you at Waterloo. What part with the fugitive feasted maybe have played on the banks of the thames in the face of france invaded of wellington become dictator at the louvre napoleon's high fortune served him better the english allowing themselves to be carried towards a narrow and spiteful policy missed their final triumph instead of undoing their supplicant by admitting him to their fortresses or their banquets they rendered more brilliant for posterity the crown which they believed they had snatched from him he grew greater in his captivity through the enormous affright of the powers the ocean enchained him in vain. Europe in arms camped on the shore, her eyes fixed upon the sea. On the 15th of July, the Epervier conveyed Bonaparte to the Bellerophon. The French craft was so small that, from the deck of the English ship, 
they did not see the giant on the waves. The emperor, accosting Captain Maitland, said to him, I come to place myself under the protection of the laws of England. Once, at least, the contemner of the laws confessed their authority. The fleet set sail for Torbay. A multitude of shipping cruised around the Bellerophon. The same eagerness was shown at Plymouth. On the 30th of July, Lord Keith handed the applicant the act confining him at St. Helena. It is worse than Tamerlane's cage, said Napoleon. This violation of the law of nations and of the respect due to hospitality was revolting. If you see the light on board of any ship, provided it be under sail, you are English-born. By virtue of the old London customs, the waves are considered soil of Albion. And an English ship was not an inviolable altar for a supplicant. It did not place the great man who embraced the poop of the Bellerophon under the protection of the British trident. Bonaparte protested. He argued about laws, talked of treachery and perfidy, appealed to the future. Did that become him? Had he not laughed at justice? Had he not, in his might, trampled underfoot the sacred things whose guarantee he now invoked? Had he not carried off to Saint Louverture and the King of Spain? Had he not had English travellers arrested who happened to be in France at the time of the rupture of the Peace of Amiens, and kept them prisoners for years? Allowable, therefore, to mercantile England, to imitate what he had done himself, and to use ignoble reprisals. But they might have acted differently." With Napoleon, the size of the heart did not correspond with the width of the head. His quarrels with the English are deplorable. They revolt Lord Byron. How could he condescend to honour his jailers with a word? One suffers at seeing him stoop to wordy conflicts with Lord Keith at Torbay, with Sir Hudson Lowe at St. Helena. Publish statements because they break faith with him, cavil about a title, about a little more or a little less, gold or honours. Bonaparte reduced to himself was reduced to his glory, and that ought to suffice him. He had nothing to ask of men. He did not treat adversity despotically enough. One would have pardoned him for making of misfortune his last slave. I find nothing remarkable in his protest against the violation of hospitality, save the date and signature of that protest. On board the Bellerophon at sea, Napoleon. There are harmonies of immensity. From the Bellerophon, Bonaparte crossed on to the Northumberland, Two frigates laden with the future garrison of St. Helena escorted him. Some of the officers of that garrison had fought at Waterloo. They permitted that explorer of the globe to keep with him Monsieur and Madame Bertrand, Messieurs de Montolon, Gogo, and de las Cases, voluntary and generous passengers on the submerged plank. By one clause in the captain's instructions, Bonaparte must be disarmed. Napoleon alone, a prisoner on board ship in the midst of the ocean, disarmed. What a magnificent terror of his power! But what a lesson from heaven to men who abuse the sword! The stupid admiralty treated the great convict of the human race as a botany bay felon. Did the black prince disarm King John? The squadron weighed anchor. Since the bark which carried Caesar, no ship had been laden with so great a destiny. Bonaparte was approaching that sea of miracles upon which the Arab of Mount Sinai had seen him pass. The last French land that Napoleon discerned was Cap La Hogue another trophy of the English. The emperor had been mistaken in the interest of his memory when he wished to remain in Europe. He would soon have been only a vulgar or faded prisoner. His old role was ended. But beyond that role, a new position revivified him with a new renown. No man of universal fame has had an end similar to Napoleon's. He was not, as after his first fall, proclaimed autocrat of a few quarries of iron and marble, the first to furnish him with a sword, the second with a statue, an eagle, he was given a rock on the point of which he remained in the sunlight till his death, in full view of the whole world. At the moment when Bonaparte is quitting Europe, in which he is giving up his life to go in search of the destinies of his death, it is well to examine this man of two existences, to depict the false and the true Napoleon. They blend and form a whole from the mixture of their reality and their falsehood. From the conjunction of these remarks it results that Bonaparte was a poet in action, an immense genius in war, an indefatigable, able and intelligent spirit in administration, a laborious and rational legislator. That is why he has so great a hold on the imagination of peoples, and so much authority over the judgment of practical men. But as a politician he will always appear deficient in the eyes of statesmen. This observation, which has escaped the majority of his panegyrists, will, I am convinced, become the definite opinion that will survive concerning him. It will explain the contrast between his prodigious actions and their pitiful results, 
at st helena he himself severely condemned his political conduct on two points the spanish war and the russian war he might have extended his confession to other delinquencies his enthusiasts will perhaps not maintain that when blaming himself he was mistaken in himself let us recapitulate bonaparte acted contrary to all prudence not to speak again of the hatefulness of the action in killing the duc d'enghien he attached a weight to his life notwithstanding the puerile apologists this death as we have seen was a secret leaven of the discords that subsequently burst out between alexander and napoleon as also between prussia and france the attempt upon spain was completely improper the peninsula was the emperor's he could turn it to the most advantageous account instead of that he turned it into a school for the english soldiers and into the cause of his own destruction through the rising of a people the detention of the pope and the annexation of the states of the church to france were but the caprice of tyranny through which he lost the advantage of passing for the restorer of religion bonaparte did not stop as he should have done when he had married the daughter of the caesars russia and england were crying mercy to him he did not revive poland when the safety of europe depended on the restoration of that kingdom madness having once set in he went on from smolensk everything told him that he must not go further at his first step that his first northern campaign was finished and that the second as he himself felt would make him master of the empire of the czars he was able neither to compute the days nor to foresee the effect of the climactic changes which every one at moscow computed and foresaw see above what i have said of the continental blockade and the confederation of the rhine the first a gigantic conception but a questionable act the second an important work but spoilt in the execution by the camp instinct and the fiscal spirit napoleon inherited the old french monarchy as the centuries and an uninterrupted succession of great men had made it as the majesty of louis XIV and the alliances of louis XV had left it as the republic had enlarged it he seated himself on that magnificent pedestal stretched out his arms laid hold of the peoples and gathered them around him but he lost europe with as much suddenness as he had taken it he twice brought the allies to paris notwithstanding the marvels of his military intelligence he had the world under his feet and all he got from it was a prison for himself exile for his family the loss of all his conquests and of a portion of the old french soil here is history proved by facts and deniable by none whence arose the faults which i have just pointed out followed by so quick and so fatal a catastrophe they arose from bonaparte's imperfectness as a politician in his alliances he enchained the governments only with concessions of territory of which he soon altered the boundaries constantly displaying the reservation to take back what he had given ever making the oppressor felt in his invasions he reorganized nothing italy excepted instead of stopping at every step to raise up again under another shape what he had overthrown he did not discontinue his movement of progression among ruins he went so fast that he scarce had the time to breathe where he passed through if by a sort of treaty of westphalia he had settled and assured the existence of the states in germany in prussia in poland at his first retrograde march he would have leant his back against contented populations and have found shelters but his poetic edifice of victories lacking a base and suspended in mid-air only by his genius fell when his genius came to retire the macedonian founded empires in his course bonaparte in his course knew only how to destroy them his sole aim was to be in his own person the master of the globe without troubling his head about the means of preserving it men have tried to make a bonaparte a perfect being a type of sentiment of delicacy of morality and of justice a writer like caesar and thucydides an orator and an historian like demosthenes and tacitus napoleon's public speeches his phrases in the tent or the council chamber are so much the less inspired with the breath of prophecy in that what they foretell by way of catastrophes has not been accomplished while the isaiah of the sword has himself disappeared writings on the wall which pursue states without catching and destroying them remain puerile instead of being sublime bonaparte was truly destiny during sixteen years destiny is mute and bonaparte ought to have been so bonaparte was not caesar his education was neither learned nor select half a foreigner he was ignorant of the first words of our language what mattered after all that his speech was faulty he gave the password to the universe his bulletins have the eloquence of victory sometimes in the intoxication of success they made a show of drafting them on a drumhead 
From amid the most mournful accents arose fatal bursts of laughter. I have read with attention all that Bonaparte has written, the early manuscripts of his childhood, his novels, next his letters to Boutafuoco, the Soupe de Beaucaire, his private letters to Josephine, the five volumes of his speeches, his orders and his bulletins, his dispatches left unpublished and spoilt by the editing in M. de Talleyrand's offices. I know something of these matters. I have found scarcely any thoughts resembling the great islander's nature, except in a scrap of autograph left behind at Elba. My heart denies itself to common joys as to ordinary pain. Not having given myself life, I shall not rob myself of it, so long as it will have me. My evil genius appeared to me and foretold my end, which I found at Leipzig. I have laid the terrible spirit of innovation which was overrunning the world. That, most certainly, is genuine Bonaparte. If the bulletins, the dispatches, the allocutions, the proclamations of Bonaparte are distinguished for energy, this energy did not belong to him in his own right. It was of his time. It came from the revolutionary inspiration, which grew weaker in Bonaparte, because he marched counter to that inspiration. Danton said, The metal is boiling over. If you do not watch the furnace, you will all be scalded. Saint-Just said, Dare. That word contains the whole policy of our revolution. They who make revolutions by halves only dig a grave. Do Bonaparte's bulletins rise above that pride of speech? As for the numerous volumes published, under the title of Memoir de Saint-Hélène, Napoleon, Don L'Exil, etc., those documents, gathered from Bonaparte's mouth or dictated by him to different persons, contain a few fine passages on actions of war, a few remarkable appreciations of certain men. But in the upshot, Napoleon is occupied only in making his apology, in justifying his past, in basing on commonplace ideas, accomplished events and things of which he had never dreamt during the course of those events. In this compilation, in which pros and cons succeed one another, in which every opinion finds a favourable authority and a peremptory refutation, it is difficult to separate that which belongs to Napoleon from that which belongs to his secretaries. It is probable that he had a different version for each of them, in order that readers might choose according to their taste, and, in the future, create for themselves Napoleons to their liking. He dictated his history as he wished to leave it. He was an author writing articles on his own work. Nothing, therefore, could be more absurd than to go into ecstasies over chronicles by different hands, which are not, like Caesar's commentaries, a short work, springing from a great head, written by a superior writer. And yet those brief commentaries, as in his polio thought, were neither faithful nor exact. The memorial de Saint-Hélène is good, allowing liberally for the candour and simplicity of the admiration. One of the things that contributed most to render Napoleon hateful during his life was his inclination for debasing everything. In a fired city he would couple decrees on the re-establishing of a few comedians with fiats which suppress monarchs, a parody of the omnipotence of God, who rules the lot of the world, and of an ant. With the fall of empires he mingled insults to women. He delighted in the humiliation of what he had overthrown. He calumniated and wounded particularly all that had dared to resist him. His arrogance was equal to his luck. The more he lowered others, the greater he believed himself to appear. Jealous of his generals, he accused them of his own mistakes, for, as for himself, he was infallible. Despising all merits, he reproached them harshly with their errors. He would never have said, after the disaster of Ramilly, as Louis XIV said to the Maréchal de Villeroy, Monsieur le Maréchal, at our age, one is not lucky. A touching magnanimity of which Napoleon knew nothing. The century of Louis XIV was made by Louis the Great. Bonaparte made his century. The history of the empire, changed by false traditions, will be yet further falsified by the state of society during the imperial epoch. Any revolution written in the presence of the liberty of the press can allow the eye to probe to the bottom of facts, because each one reports them as he has seen them. The reign of Cromwell is known because it was customary to say to the protector what one thought of his acts and his person. In France, even under the revolution, despite the inexorable censorship of the executioner, the truth came out. The triumphing faction was not always the same. It soon succumbed, and the faction which succeeded it taught you what its predecessor had hidden from you. There was liberty from one scaffold to the other, between the cutting off of two heads. But when Bonaparte seized upon the power, when thought was gagged, when one heard nothing but the voice of a despotism which spoke only to praise itself, and allowed only itself to be spoken of, truth disappeared. 
The would-be authentic documents of that time are tainted. Nothing was published, books or newspapers, save by the master's order. Bonaparte saw to the articles in the Moniteur. His prefects sent back from the various departments, the recitals, the congratulations, the felicitations, in the form in which the Paris authorities had dictated and forwarded them, in which form they expressed a conventional public opinion, quite different from the real opinion. Write history from such documents as those. In proof of your impartial studies, quote the authentic sources to which you have gone. You will only be quoting a lie in support of a lie. If it were possible to call this universal imposture into question, if men who have not seen the days of the empire were to insist upon regarding as sincere all that they come upon in printed documents, or even all that they might dig up in certain boxes at the public offices, it would be enough to appeal to an unexceptionable witness, to the Conservative Senate. There, in the decree which I have quoted above, you have seen its own words, taking into consideration that the liberty of the press has been constantly submitted to the arbitrary censorship of his police, and that at the same time he has always made use of the press to fill France and Europe with fabricated facts and false maxims, that acts and reports passed by the Senate have undergone alterations were made public, etc. Is there any reply possible to this declaration? The life of Bonaparte was an incontestable truth, which imposture had taken upon itself to write. A monstrous pride and an incessant affectation spoil Napoleon's character. At the time of his dominion, what need had he to exaggerate his stature when the god of armies had furnished him with the war chariot whose wheels are living? He took after the Italian blood. His nature was complex. Great men, a very small family upon earth, unhappily find only themselves to imitate them. At once a model and a copy, a real personage and an actor representing that personage. Napoleon was his own mind. He would not have believed himself a hero if he had not dressed himself up in a hero's costume. This curious weakness gives something false and equivocal to his astonishing realities. One is afraid of taking the King of Kings for Roscius, or Roscius for the King of Kings. Napoleon's qualities are so much adulterated in the gazettes, the pamphlets, the poems, and even in the songs overrun with imperialism, that those qualities are completely unrecognisable. All the touching things ascribed to Bonaparte in the Anna, about the prisoners, the dead, the soldiers, are idle trash to which the actions of his life give the lie. The Guamère of my illustrious friend Béranger is only an admirable ballad. Bonaparte had nothing of the good fellow about him, dominion personified. He was hard. That coldness formed the antidote to his fiery imagination. He found in himself no word, he found only a deed and a deed ready to chafe at the smallest independence. A gnat that flew without his orders was a rebellious insect in his eyes. It was not enough to lie to the ears, it was necessary to lie to the eyes. Here, in an engraving, we see Bonaparte taking off his hat to the Austrian wounded. There we have a little Toulourou, who prevents the emperor from passing. Further on, Napoleon touches the plague-stricken of Jaffa, and he never touched them. He crosses Mount St. Bernard on a spirited horse, amid a whirl of snowflakes, and it was the finest weather in the world. Are they not now trying to transform the emperor into Roman of the early days of the Aventine, into a missionary of liberty, into a citizen who instituted slavery only for love of the opposite virtue? Draw your conclusions from two features of the great founder of equality. He ordered his brother Jerome's marriage with Miss Patterson to be annulled, because the brother of Napoleon could ally himself only with the blood of princes. Later, after returning from the Isle of Elba, he invested the new democratic constitution with a peerage and crowned it with the additional act. That Bonaparte, following up the successes of the revolution, everywhere disseminated principles of independence, that his victories helped to relax the bonds between the peoples and the kings, and snatch those peoples from the power of the old customs in the ancient ideas, that in this sense he contributed to the social enfranchisement these are facts which I do not pretend to contest, but that, of his own will, he laboured scientifically for the political and civil deliverance of the nations, that he established the narrowest despotism with the idea of giving to Europe and to France, in particular, the widest constitution, that he was only a tribune disguised as a tyrant. All this is a supposition which I cannot possibly adopt. Bonaparte, like the race of princes, desired nothing and sought nothing save power, attaining it, however, through liberty, because he made his first appearance on the world stage in 1793. The revolution, which was Napoleon's wet nurse, 
did not long delay in appearing to him as an enemy. He never ceased beating her. The emperor, for the rest, knew evil very well, when the evil did not come directly from the emperor, for he was not destitute of moral sense. The sophism put forward concerning Bonaparte's love for liberty proves only one thing. The abuse which can be made of reason, nowadays it lends itself to everything. Is it not established that the terror was a time of humanity? In fact, were they not demanding the abolition of the death penalty while they were killing everybody? Have not great civilizers, as they are called, always immolated men? And is it not therefore, as far as has been proved, that Robespierre was the continuer of Jesus Christ? The emperor meddled with everything. His intelligence never rested. He had a sort of perpetual agitation of ideas. In the impetuousness of his nature, instead of a free and continuous train, he advanced by leaps and bounds. He flung himself upon the universe and shook it. He would have none of it of that universe, if he was obliged to wait for it, an incomprehensible being who found the secret of debasing his most towering actions by despising them, and who raised his least elevated actions to his own level, impatient of will, patient of character, incomplete and as though unfinished. Napoleon had gaps in his genius. His understanding resembled the sky of that other hemisphere under which he was to go to die, the sky whose stars are separated by empty spaces. One asks oneself by what spell Bonaparte, so aristocratic, so hostile to the people, came to achieve the popularity which he enjoyed. For that forger of yokes has most certainly remained popular with a nation whose pretension was to raise altars to independence and equality. Here is the solution of the enigma. Daily experience makes us recognise that the French are instinctively drawn towards power. They do not love liberty. Equality alone is their idol. Now, equality and despotism have secret connections. In those two respects, Napoleon had his found in the hearts of the French, militarily inclined towards dominion, democratically enamoured of the level. Once on the throne, he made the people sit down beside him. A proletarian king, he humbled the kings and nobles in his antechambers. He levelled the ranks, not by lowering, but by raising them. The descending level would have charmed the plebeian envy more. The ascending level was more flattering to its pride. French vanity was puffed up also by the superiority which Bonaparte gave us over the rest of Europe. Another cause of Napoleon's popularity has to do with the affliction of his last days. After his death, as men became better acquainted with what he had suffered at St. Helena, they began to be moved. They forgot his tyranny to remember that, after conquering our enemies, after subsequently drawing them into France, he had defended us against them. We imagine that he might save us today from the disgrace into which we have sunk. His fame was recalled to us by his misfortune. His glory profited by his adversity. Lastly, the marvels of his arms have bewitched the young, while teaching us to worship brute force. His unexampled fortune has left to the overweening conceit of every ambition the hope of arriving at the point which he attained. And yet this man, so popular through the roller which he had passed over France, was the mortal enemy of equality and the greatest organiser of aristocracy within democracy. I cannot acquiesce in the false praises with which men have insulted Bonaparte, while trying to justify everything in his conduct. I cannot surrender my reason, nor go into ecstasies before that which arouses my horror or my pity. If I have succeeded in conveying what I have felt, there will remain of my portrait one of the leading figures in history. But I have adopted no part of the fantastic creature composed of lies, Lies which I saw born, lies which, taken at first for what they were, passed in time to the state of truth through the infatuation and the imbecile credulity of mankind. I refuse to be a gull, and to fall into a fit with admiration. I strive to paint persons conscientiously, without taking from them what they have, without giving them what they have not. If success were esteemed as innocence, if debauching even posterity, it loaded it with its chains. If a future slave, begotten by a slavish past, that suborn posterity became the accomplice of whosoever should have triumphed, where would be the right? Where would be the reward of sacrifice? Good and evil becoming only relative qualities, all morality would be blotted out from human actions. That is a difficulty which is caused to the impartial writer by a brilliant renown. He keeps it on one side as much as he can in order to lay bare the truth. But the glory returns like a golden haze and instantly covers the picture. In order not to admit the diminution of territory and power which we owe to Bonaparte, the present generation consoles itself by imagining that he has given back to us, in illustriousness, 
what he has taken from us in strength. Are we not, from this time forward, it asks, famed in the four quarters of the earth? Is not a Frenchman feared, remarked, sought out, known on every shore? But were we placed between those two conditions, either immortality without power, or power without immortality? Alexander made the Greek name known to the universe. Nonetheless, he left them four empires in Asia. The language and civilization of the Hellenes extended from the Nile to Babylon and from Babylon to the Indus. At his death, his ancestral kingdom of Macedon, far from being diminished, had increased a hundredfold in force. Bonaparte made us known on every shore. Commanded by him, the French threw Europe so low at their feet that France still prevails by her name, and that the Art de l'Etoile can rise up without appearing a puerile trophy. But before our reverses, that monument would have stood as a witness, instead of being only a record. And yet, had not Dumouriez, with raw recruits, given the foreigner his first lessons, Jordan won the Battle of Fleurus, Pichegru conquered Belgium and Holland, Osh crossed the Rhine, Massena triumphed at Zurich, Moreau at Hohenlinden, Linden, all exploits most difficult to obtain, and preliminary to others. Bonaparte made a corporate whole of these scattered successes. He continued them. He caused those victories to shine forth. But without those first wonders, would he have obtained the last? He was raised above all things only when reason with him was executing the inspirations of the poet. Our sovereign's illustriousness cost us merely two or three hundred thousand men a year. We paid for it with merely three millions of our soldiers. Our fellow citizens bought it merely at the cost of their sufferings and their liberties during fifteen years. Can such trifles count? Are the generations that have come after us not resplendent? So much the worse for those who have disappeared. The calamities under the Republic serve for the safety of all. Our misfortunes under the Empire did much more. They deified Bonaparte. That is enough for us. That is not enough for me. I will not stoop so low as to hide my nation behind Bonaparte. He did not make France. France made him. No talent, no superiority, will ever bring me to consent to the power which can, with one word, deprive me of my independence, my home, my friends. If I do not say of my fortune and my honour, it is because one's fortune does not appear to me to be worth the trouble of defending it. As for honour, it escapes tyranny. It is the soul of the martyrs. Bonds encompass and do not enchain it. It pierces the vault of prisons and carries the whole man away with it. The wrong which true philosophy will never forgive Bonaparte is that he accustomed society to passive obedience, thrust back humanity towards the times of moral degradation, and perhaps corrupted characters in such a way that it would be impossible to say when men's hearts will begin to throb with generous sentiments. The weakness in which we are plunged as regards Europe, our actual abasement, are the result of the Napoleonic slavery. All that remains to us is the faculty to bear the yoke. Bonaparte unsettled even the future. It would not surprise me if, in the discomfort of our impotence, we were seen to grow smaller, to barricade ourselves against Europe instead of going to seek it out, to give up our freedom within, to deliver ourselves from an illusory terror without, to lose ourselves in ignoble provident cares, contrary to our genius and to the fourteen centuries which compose our national manners. The despotism which Bonaparte left in the air will descend upon us in the shape of fortresses. The fashion nowadays is to greet liberty with a sardonic smile, to look upon it as a piece of old lumber, fallen into disuse with honour. I am not in the fashion. I think that there is nothing in the world without liberty. It gives a price to life. Were I to remain the last to defend it, I would never cease to proclaim its rights. To attack Napoleon in the name of things that are past, to assail him with ideas that are dead, is to prepare fresh triumphs for him. He is to be fought only with something greater than himself, liberty. He was guilty towards it, and consequently towards the human race. Vain words. Better than any do I feel their uselessness. Henceforth any observation, however moderate it may be, is reputed profane. It needs courage to dare brave the cries of the vulgar, not to be afraid of being treated as a narrow intelligence, incapable of understanding and feeling the genius of Napoleon, for the sole reason that, in the midst of the lively and real admiration which one professes for him, one is nevertheless not able to worship all his imperfections. The world belongs to Bonaparte. In that of which the ravisher was unable to complete the conquest, his fame usurps. Living, he missed the world. Dead, he possesses it. 
it is vain for you to protest the generations pass by without listening to you antiquity makes the son of priam say to the shade judge not hector from his little tomb the iliad homer the greeks in flight see there my sepulchre i am buried under all those great deeds bonaparte is no longer the real bonaparte but a legendary figure put together from the vagaries of the poet the talk of the soldier and the tales of the people it is the charlemagne and the alexander of the idylls of the middle ages that we behold to-day that fantastic hero will remain the real personage the other portraits will disappear bonaparte is so strongly connected with absolute dominion that after undergoing the despotism of his person we have to undergo the despotism of his memory this latter despotism is more overbearing than the former for though men fought against napoleon when he was on the throne there is an universal agreement to accept the irons which he flings to us now that he is dead he is an obstacle to future events how could a power issuing from the camps establish itself after him has he not killed all military glory by surpassing it how could a free government come into being when he has corrupted the principles of all liberty in men's hearts no legitimate power is now able to drive the usurping spectre from the mind of man the soldier and the citizen the republican and the monarchist the rich and the poor alike place busts and portraits of napoleon in their homes in their palaces or in their cottages the former conquered are in agreement with the former conquerors one cannot take a step in italy without coming across him one cannot enter germany without meeting him for in that country the young generation which rejected him is past generally the centuries sit down before the portrait of a great man they finish it by means of a long and successive work this time the human race has declined to wait perhaps it was in too great a hurry to stump a crayon drawing it is time to place the completed side of the idol in juxtaposition with the defective side bonaparte is not great through his words his speeches his writings through the love of liberty which he never possessed and which he never pretended to establish he is great in that he created a regular and powerful government a code of laws adopted in different countries courts of law schools a strong active intelligent administration which still lasts us he is great in that he revived enlightened and governed italy superlatively well he is great in that in france he restored order from the midst of chaos in that he built up the altars in that he reduced furious demagogues vain glorious scholars anarchical men of letters voltairian atheists open-air orators cut-throats of the prisons and streets starvelings of the tribune the clubs and the scaffolds in that he reduced them to serve under him he is great in that he curbed an anarchical mob he is great in that he put an end to the familiarities of a common fortune in that he forced soldiers his equals and captains his chiefs or his rivals to bend before his will he is great above all in that he was born of himself alone in that he was able with no other authority than that of his genius able he to make himself obeyed by thirty-six million subjects at a time when no illusion surrounds the thrones he is great in that he overthrew all the kings his opponents in that he defeated all the armies whatever the difference in their discipline and valour in that he taught his name to savage as well as to civilised peoples in that he surpassed all the conquerors who preceded him in that he filled ten years with prodigies so great that we have difficulty to-day in understanding them the famous offender in triumphal matter is no more the few men who still understand noble sentiments can do justice to glory without fearing it but without repenting of having proclaimed what that glory had that was baleful without recognizing the destroyer of independences as the father of emancipations napoleon does not need that one should ascribe merits to him he was richly enough endowed at his birth now therefore that severed from his time his history is ended and his idyll commencing let us go to see him die let us leave europe let us follow him beneath the sky of his apotheosis the hissing of the seas where his ships have struck sail will point out to us the spot of his disappearance at the extremity of our hemisphere says tacitus is heard the sound made by the dipping sun sonum in super emergentis audiri end of book six part one
Book six, part two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, volume three, by François René de Chateaubriand. Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book six, part two. Joao de Nova, a Portuguese navigator, had lost his bearings in the waters separating Africa and America. In 1502, on the 18th of August, the Feast of St. Helen, mother of the first Christian emperor, he came upon an island at the 16th degree of latitude and 11th of longitude. He landed and gave it the name of the day upon which it was discovered. After frequenting the island for some years, the Portuguese relinquished it. The Dutch established themselves there and subsequently abandoned it for the Cape of Good Hope. The British East Indian Company seized it, the Dutch retook it in 1672, the British occupied it anew and settled there. When Hardenova landed at St. Helena, the interior of the uninhabited country was mere forest land. Fernando Lopez, a Portuguese renegado, transported to that oasis, stocked it with cows, goats, hens, guinea fowls, and birds from the four corners of the earth. On to the island were taken successively, as on to the deck of the ark, animals of the whole creation. Five hundred whites, fifteen hundred negroes, mingled with mulattoes, javanese and chinese, composed the population of the island. Jamestown is its town and its harbour. Before the English were masters of the Cape of Good Hope, the company's fleets, returning from India, put in at Jamestown. The sailors spread their slop goods at the foot of the cabbage trees. The mute and solitary forest changed once a year into a noisy and populous market. The climate of the island is healthy but rainy that dungeon of neptune which is only seven or eight leagues in circumference attracts the ocean vapours the equatorial sun drives away every breathing thing at noonday forces the very gnats into silence and rest obliges men and beasts to hide themselves the billows are illumined at night by what is called the phosphorescent light a light produced by myriads of insects whose loves electrified by the storms kindle upon the surface of the deep the illuminations of an universal wedding the shadow of the island, dark and motionless, reposes amid a moving plain of diamonds. The spectacle of the heavens is similarly magnificent, according to my learned and famous friend, Monsieur de Humboldt. We feel, he says, an indescribable sensation when, on approaching the equator, and particularly when passing from one hemisphere to the other, we see these stars, which we have contemplated from our infancy, progressively sink and finally disappear. One feels that he is not in Europe, when he sees the immense constellation of the ship or the phosphorescent clouds of magellan arise on the horizon he saw distinctly he continues for the first time the southern cross only on the night of the fourth of july in the sixteenth degree of latitude i recall the sublime passage of dante which the most celebrated commentators have applied to that constellation io mi volsi a man destra etc among the portuguese and spaniards a religious feeling attaches them to a constellation whose form reminds them of that sign of the faith planted by their ancestors in the deserts of the new world the poets of france and of lusitania have placed elegiac scenes on the shores of melinda and the neighbouring isles it is a far cry from those fictitious sorrows to the real torments of napoleon under the stars foretold by the singer of beatrice and in those seas of eleonora and virginia do the great men of rome banished to the isles of greece concern themselves with the charms of those shores and the divinities of crete and naxos that which enraptured vasco da gama and Camoens could not move bonaparte prone on the poof of the vessel he did not perceive that above his head glittered unknown constellations whose rays met his eyes for the first time what cared he for those stars which he had never seen from his bivouacs which had not shone upon his empire and yet no star was wanting to his destiny one half of the firmament lighted up his cradle the other was reserved for the pomp of his tomb the sea which napoleon was crossing was not the friendly sea which carried him from the harbours of corsica from the sands of abukir from the rocks of elba to the shores of provence it was that hostile ocean which after enclosing him in germany france portugal and spain opened out before his course only to close up again behind him probably when he saw the waves urge on his ship the trade winds drive it ever further with a constant blast he did not make the reflections upon his catastrophe with which it inspires me each man feels his life in his own manner 
he who affords a great spectacle to the world is less touched and less instructed than the spectator occupied with the past as though it could be reborn hoping still in his memories bonaparte scarce perceived that he was crossing the line nor asked what hand traced the circles in which the globes are compelled to imprison their eternal progress on the fifteenth of august the wandering colony kept st napoleon's day on board the vessel which was taking napoleon to his last halting-place on the fifteenth of october the northumberland was abreast of st helena the passenger mounted on deck he had a difficulty in discovering an imperceptible black speck in the bluish immensity he took a spy-glass he surveyed that particle of earth as he might formerly have surveyed a fortress in the middle of a lake he saw the market-town of st james enchased in scarped rocks not a wrinkle in that barren face but a gun hung from it they seemed to wish to receive the captive according to his genius on the sixteenth of october eighteen fifteen bonaparte touched the rock his mausoleum even as on the twelfth of october fourteen ninety two christopher columbus touched the new world his monument there says walter scott at the entrance to the indian ocean bonaparte was deprived of the means of making his second avatar or incarnation on earth before being moved to the residence of longwood bonaparte occupied a hut at briars near balcombe's cottage on the ninth of december longwood hurriedly enlarged by the carpenters of the english fleet received its guest the house situated on a mountain upland consisted of a drawing-room a dining-room a library a study and a bedroom it was not much those who inhabited the tower of the temple and the donjon of vincennes were still worse lodged true one paid them the attention of shortening their stay general gorgo monsieur and madame de montalon with their children monsieur de las cases and his son camped out provisionally in tents monsieur and madame bertrand installed themselves at hut's gate a cottage placed on the boundary of the grounds of longwood bonaparte had a stretch of sand twelve miles long as his exercise ground sentries surrounded that space and lookout men were posted on the highest peaks the lion could extend his walks further but in that case he had to consent to allow himself to be watched by an english bestiarius two camps defended the excommunicated enclosure at night the circle of the sentries was drawn in round longwood at nine o'clock napoleon confined could no longer go out the patrols went the round horsemen on vedette foot soldiers placed here and there kept watch in the creeks and in the ravines which ran down to the sea two armed brigs cruised one to leeward the other to windward of the island what precautions to guard one man in the midst of the seas after sunset no boat could put to sea the fishing boats were numbered and at night they remained in harbour under the responsibility of a lieutenant in the navy the sovereign generalissimo who had summoned the world to his stirrup was called upon to appear twice a day before a military collar bonaparte did not submit to that call when by good luck he was able to avoid the sight of the officer on duty that officer would not have dared to say where and how he had seen him of whom it was more difficult to establish the absence than to prove the presence to the universe sir george coven the author of those severe regulations was replaced by sir hudson lowe then began the bickerings about which all the memoirs have told us if one were to believe those memoirs the new governor must have been of the family of the enormous spiders of st helena and the reptile of those woods in which snakes are unknown england was lacking in elevation napoleon in dignity to put an end to his requirements of etiquette bonaparte sometimes seemed determined to conceal himself behind an assumed name like a monarch travelling in a foreign country he had the touching idea of taking the name of one of his aides de camp killed at the battle of Areola. france austria russia appointed commissaries to the residence of st helena the captive was accustomed to receive the ambassadors of the two latter powers the legitimacy which had not recognized napoleon as emperor would have acted more nobly by not recognizing napoleon as a prisoner a large wooden house constructed in london was sent to st helena but napoleon did not feel well enough to inhabit it his life at longwood was regulated in this way he rose at uncertain hours monsieur marchand his valet read to him when he was in bed after rising in the morning he dictated to generals montalon and gorgo and to the son of monsieur de las cases he breakfasted at ten o'clock rode on horseback or drove until about three returned indoors at six and went to bed at eleven he affected to dress as he is painted in his portrait by isabe in the morning he wrapped himself in a caftan and wound a madras handkerchief round his head st helena lies between the two poles the navigators who pass from one spot to the other 
salute this first station where the land refreshes eyes wearied with the spectacle of the ocean and offers fruits and the coolness of sweet water to mouths chafed with salt the presence of bonaparte changed this isle of promise into a plague-stricken rock foreign ships no longer touched there so soon as they were signalled at twenty leagues distance a cruiser went to challenge them and charged them to keep off none were allowed into port except in case of stormy weather but the ships of the british navy alone some of the english travellers who had lately admired or who were on their way to see the marvels of the ganges visited another marvel on their road india accustomed to conquerors had one chained at her gates napoleon allowed these visits with reluctance he consented to receive lord amherst on the latter's return from his chinese embassy admiral sir Pulteney malcolm he liked does your government mean he asked him one day to detain me upon this rock until my death's day the admiral replied that he feared so then the term of my life will soon arrive i hope not monsieur i hope that you will survive to record your great actions they are so numerous that the task will ensure you a term of long life napoleon did not take offence at this simple appellation of monsieur he revealed himself at that moment through his real greatness fortunately for himself he never wrote his life he would have lessened it men of that nature must leave their memoirs to be told by the unknown voice which belongs to nobody and which issues from the nations and the centuries to us everyday people alone is it permitted to talk of ourselves because nobody would talk of us captain basil hall called at longwood bonaparte remembered having seen the captain's father at brienne your father he said was the first englishman that i ever saw and i have recollected him all my life on that account he talked with the captain about the recent discovery of the island of luchu the inhabitants have no arms said the captain no arms exclaimed bonaparte that is to say no guns they have muskets not even muskets well then spears or at least bows and arrows neither one nor other nor daggers no none but without arms how can one fight captain hall illustrated their ignorance with respect to all the world by saying they knew nothing of france and england and never had even heard of his majesty bonaparte smiled in a way which struck the captain the more serious the countenance the more beautiful the smile those different travellers remarked that not the least trace of colour appeared in bonaparte's cheeks his head resembled a marble bust whose whiteness had been slightly yellowed by time not the smallest trace of a wrinkle was discernible on his brow nor an approach to a furrow on any part of his countenance his mind seemed at ease this apparent calm gave rise to the belief that the flame of his genius had taken flight his manner of speaking was slow his expression was benignant and almost kindly sometimes he would dart forth dazzling glances but that state soon passed his eyes became veiled and sad ah other travellers known to napoleon had in former days appeared upon those shores after the explosion of the infernal machine the senatus consultus of the fourth of january eighteen o one decreed without trial by a simple police order the exile beyond seas of one hundred and thirty republicans put on board the frigate chiffon and the corvette flesh they were taken to the seychelles islands and dispersed shortly afterwards in the archipelago of the comores between africa and madagascar they nearly all died there two of the men transported lefranc and saunois having succeeded in escaping on board an american ship touched at st helena in 1803 there twelve years later providence was to imprison their great oppressor the two famous general rossignol their companion in misfortune a quarter of an hour before uttering his last breath exclaimed i die harassed by the most horrible pains but i should die content if i could hear that the tyrant of my country was enduring the same sufferings thus did freedom's imprecations await him who betrayed her even in the other hemisphere italy roused from her long sleep by napoleon turned her eyes towards the illustrious offspring who wished to restore her to her glory and with whom she had refallen beneath the yoke the sons of the muses the noblest and most grateful of men when they are not the vilest and most unthankful looked on st helena the last poet of the land of virgil sang the last warrior of the land of caesar tutto e provo la gloria maggior dopo il perilio la fuga e la vittoria la regia e il triste esilio due volte nella polvere due volte sul altar e si nomo due secoli l'un contro l'altro amato sommessi a lui si volsero come aspettando il fatto e fe silenzio 
et arbitro, sassisse mezzo a lor. He felt all, says Manzoni, the greatest glory after peril, flight and victory, royalty and sad banishment, twice in the dust, twice on the altar. He stated his name. Two sentries, one against the other arm, turned towards him, as though awaiting their fate. He was silent and seated himself as arbiter between them. Bonaparte was approaching his end, devoured by an internal wound and venomed by sorrow. He had borne that wound in the thick of prosperity. It was the only legacy which he had received from his father. The rest came to him from God's munificence. Already he reckoned six years of exile. He had needed less time to conquer Europe. He remained almost always indoors and read Ossian in Cesarotti's Italian translation. Everything saddened him under a sky beneath which life seemed shorter, the sun remaining three days less in that hemisphere than in ours. When Bonaparte went out, he passed along rugged paths lined with aloes and sweet-scented broom. He walked among gum trees with sparse flowers, which the generous winds made lean to the same side, or hid himself in the thick mists, which rolled low. He was seen seated at the feet of Diana's Peak, Flagstaff, or Leader Hill, gazing on the sea, through the gaps in the mountains. Before him the ocean unfolded itself, which on the one side bathed the coasts of Africa, on the other the American shores, and which goes like a marginless stream to lose itself in the southern seas. No civilized land nearer than the Cape of Storms. Who shall tell the thoughts of that Prometheus torn alive by death when, his hand pressed to his smarting breast, he turned his gaze over the billows? Christ was led into a high mountain whence he saw the kingdoms of the world. But for Christ it was written to the tempter of mankind, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Bonaparte, forgetting a thought of his which I have quoted, not having given myself life, I shall not rob myself of it, spoke of killing himself. He also did not remember his order of the day, with regard to the suicide of one of his soldiers. He believed sufficiently in the attachment of his companions in captivity to hope that they would consent to suffocate themselves with him in the smoke from a brazier. The illusion was great. Such are the intoxications of a long domination. But in the case of Napoleon's impatiences, we must consider only the degree of suffering to which he had attained. Monsieur de Las Cases, having written to Lucien on a piece of white silk, in contravention of the regulations, received the order to leave St. Helena. His absence increased the void around the exile. On the 18th of March, 1817, Lord Holland, in the House of Lords, made a motion on the subject of the complaints forwarded to England by General Montolon. It will not be considered by posterity, he said, whether Bonaparte has been justly punished for his crimes, but whether Great Britain has acted in that generous manner which becomes a great country. Lord Bathurst opposed the motion. Cardinal Fesch sent two priests from Italy to his nephew. The Princess Borghese begged the favour of being allowed to join her brother. No, said Napoleon. I would not have her witness the degrading state to which I am reduced, and the insults to which I am subjected. That beloved sister, Germana Jovis, did not cross the seas. She died in the regions where Napoleon had left his reputation. Schemes of abduction were formed. A Colonel La Tapie, at the head of a band of American adventurers, designed a descent on St. Helena. Johnson, a resolute smuggler, meditated an attempt to carry off Bonaparte by means of a submarine vessel. Young lords entered into these plans. People plotted to break the chains of the oppressor. They would have left the liberator of the human race to die in irons without a thought. Bonaparte hoped for his delivery from the political movements of Europe. If he had lived till 1830, perhaps he would have returned to us. But what would he have done among us? He would have seemed infirm and out of date in the midst of the new ideas. Formerly his tyranny appeared liberty to our slavery. Now his greatness would appear despotism to our littleness. At the present period everything is decrepit in a day. Who lives too long, dies alive. As we advance in life, we leave three or four images of ourselves, different one from the other. We see them next in the haze of the past, like portraits of our different ages. Bonaparte, in his feebleness, no longer occupied himself except like a child. He amused himself by digging a little basin in his garden. He put a few fish into it, the mastic employed in cementing the basin contained copperas, and the fish died. Bonaparte said, Everything I love, everything that belongs to me, is immediately smitten. About the end of February 1821, 
Napoleon was obliged to take to his bed and did not rise again. How low am I fallen, he murmured. I stirred the world, and I cannot raise my eyelid. He did not believe in medicine, and objected to a consultation of Antomarchi with the Jamestown doctors. Nevertheless, he admitted Dr. Arnott beside his deathbed. He dictated his will from the 13th to the 27th of April. On the 28th, he ordered his heart to be sent to Marie-Louise. He forbade any English surgeon to lay a hand upon him after his decease. Persuaded that he was succumbing to the malady by which his father had been attacked, he requested that the report of the autopsy should be transmitted to the Duc de Reichstadt. The paternal direction has become useless. Napoleon II has joined Napoleon I. At this last hour, the religious sentiment with which Bonaparte was always imbued awoke. Thibaudot, in his Memoir sur le Consulat, tells us, with reference to the restoration of public worship, that the first consul said to him, On Sunday last, in the midst of the silence of nature, I was walking in these gardens. The sound of the bell of Rule suddenly came and struck my ear, and renewed all the impressions of my youth. I was moved, so powerful is the force of early habit, and said to myself, If it is thus for me, what effect must similar memories not produce on simple and credulous men? Let your philosophers reply to that. And raising his hands to the sky, who is he that made all that? In 1797, by his proclamation of Maserata, Bonaparte authorised the residence of the French refugee priests in the Papal States, forbade them to be molested, ordered the convents to support them, and allotted them a salary in money. His variations in Egypt, his rages against the Church, of which he was the restorer, show that an instinct of spirituality predominated in the very midst of his errors. For his lapses and his irritations are not of a philosophical nature, and bear the impress of the religious character. Bonaparte, when giving Vignal the details of the funeral lights by which he wished his remains to be surrounded, thought he saw signs that his instructions were displeasing to Antomarchi. He entered into an explanation with the doctor, and said to him, You are above those weaknesses, but how can it be helped? I am neither a philosopher nor a doctor. I believe in God. I am of my father's religion. We cannot all be atheists. Are you able not to believe in God? For after all, everything proclaims his existence, and the greatest geniuses have believed it. You are a doctor. Those people only tackle matter. They never believe anything. You strong minds of the day, give up your admiration for Napoleon. You have nothing to do with that poor man. Did he not imagine that a comet had come to fetch him, as it had carried off Caesar of old? Moreover, he believed in God. He was of his father's religion. He was not a philosopher. He was not an atheist. He had not, like you, given battle to the Almighty, although he had defeated a good many kings. He found that everything proclaimed the existence of the Supreme Being. He declared that the greatest geniuses had believed in that existence, and he wished to believe as his fathers did. Lastly, oh, monstrous thing, this foremost man of modern times, this man of all the centuries, was a Christian in the nineteenth century. His will begins with this clause. I die in the apostolic and Roman religion, in the bosom of which I was born more than fifty years ago. In the third paragraph of the will of Louis XVI, we read, I die in the union of our Holy Mother, the Catholic, Apostolic and Roman Church. The revolution has given us many a lesson, but is there any one of them to be compared with this? Napoleon and Louis XVI, making the same profession of faith, would you know the value of the cross? Seek through the whole world for what best suits virtue in misfortune, or the man of genius dying. On the 3rd of May, Napoleon was administered the sacrament of extreme unction, and received the blessed viaticum. The silence of the bedchamber was interrupted only by the death sob, mingled with the regular sound of the pendulum of a clock. The shadow, before stopping on the dial, did a few more rounds. The luminary that outlined it had a difficulty in dying out. On the fourth, the tempest of Cromwell's death pangs arose. Almost all the trees at Longwood were uprooted. At last, on the fifth, at eleven minutes to six in the evening, amid the wind, the rain, and the crash of the waves, Bonaparte gave up to God the mightiest breath of life that ever quickened human clay. 
The last words caught upon the Congress' lips were, Tête armée, or Tête d'armée. His thoughts were still wandering in the midst of combats. When he closed his eyes for ever, his sword, dead with him, was laid by his side. A crucifix rested on his breast. The symbol of peace applied to the heart of Napoleon calmed the throbbing of that heart, even as a ray from heaven makes the wave to fall. Bonaparte first desired to be interred in the cathedral of Ayakio. Then, by a codicil dated 16th April 1821, he bequeathed his bones to France. Heaven had served him better. His real mausoleum is the rock on which he expired. Turn back to my story of the death of the Duc d'Anguien. Napoleon, foreseeing the opposition of the British government to his last wishes, eventually made choice of a burying place in St. Helena. In a narrow valley known as Slanes or Geranium Valley, now Tomb Valley, rises a fountain. Napoleon's Chinese servants, faithful as Camerons Javanese, used to fill their pitchers there. Weeping willows overhang the spring. Green grass, studded with champas, grows all around. The champas, despite its brilliancy and its perfume, is not a flower that one seeks after, because it flourishes on the tombs, say the Sanskrit poems. In the declivities of the bare rocks, bitter lemon trees thrive ill, with coconut trees, larches and cone trees, of which men collect the gum which sticks to the beards of the goats. Napoleon, booted, spurred, dressed in the uniform of a colonel of the guard, decorated with the legion of honour, was laid in state on his little iron bedstead. Upon that visit, which was never astonished, the soul, as it fled, had left a sublime stupor. The planishers and joiners soldered and nailed Bonaparte into a fourfold coffin of mahogany, of lead, of mahogany again, and of tin. They seemed to fear that he would never be imprisoned enough. The cloak which the erstwhile victor had worn at the vast funeral of Marengo served as a pall to the coffin. Napoleon delighted in the willows of the spring. He asked for peace of the slain valley, even as banished Dante asked for peace of the convent of Corvo. In gratitude for the transient repose which he tasted there during the last days of his life, he appointed that valley as the shelter of his eternal rest. Speaking of the source, he said, If God were willing that I should recover, I would raise a monument in the spot where it springs. That monument was his tomb. In Plutarch's time, in a place consecrated to the nymphs on the banks of the Strymon, one still saw a stone bench on which Alexander had sat. The obsequies were held on the 28th of May. The weather was fine. Four horses, led by grooms on foot, drew the hearse. Four and twenty English grenadiers, carrying no arms, surrounded it. Napoleon's horse followed. The garrison of the island lined the precipices of the road. Three squadrons of dragoons went before the procession. The 20th Regiment of Infantry, the Marines, the St. Helena Volunteers, the Royal Artillery, with fifteen pieces of cannon, brought up the rear. Bands of musicians, stationed at distances on the rocks, exchanged mournful tunes. On reaching a pass, the hearse stopped. The twenty-four unarmed grenadiers lifted up the corpse and had the honour of carrying it on their shoulders to the burying place. Three volleys of artillery saluted the remains of Napoleon at the moment when he sank into the earth. All the noise which he had made on that earth did not penetrate six feet beneath it. A stone which was to have been employed in the building of a new house for the exile was lowered upon his coffin, as it were the trap-door of his last cell. They recited the verses from Psalm 87. I am poor and in labours from my youth, and being exalted have been humbled and troubled. Thy wrath hath come upon me. The flagship fired minute-guns. This warlike harmony lost in the immensity of the ocean, made response to the requiescat in pace. The emperor, buried by his victors of Waterloo, had heard the last cannon shot of that battle. He did not hear the last detonation with which England disturbed and honoured his sleep at St. Helena. All withdrew, holding in their hands a branch of willow, as though returning from the Feast of Palms. Lord Byron thought that the dictator of kings had abdicated his renown with his blade, that he was going to die forgotten, the poet ought to have known that Napoleon's destiny was a muse, like all high destinies. That muse was able to change an abortive issue into a catastrophe which revived its hero. The solitude of Napoleon's exile and tomb has spread over a brilliant memory, a spell of a different kind. Alexander did not die under the eyes of Greece. He disappeared in the proud perspectives of Babylon. 
Bonaparte has not died under the eyes of France. He has vanished in the gorgeous horizons of the torrid zone. He sleeps like a hermit or like a pariah in a valley at the end of a deserted pathway. The magnitude of the silence which presses upon him equals the vastness of the noise that once surrounded him. The nations are absent, their crowd has withdrawn. The tropic bird, harness, says Buffon, to the chariot of the sun, precipitates itself from the orb of light. Where does it rest today? It rests upon ashes, whose weight tilted the globe. They all put crowns upon themselves after his death, and evils were multiplied in the earth. This summing up of the Maccabees on Alexander seems made for Napoleon. They have put crowns upon themselves, and evils have been multiplied in the earth. Scarce twenty years have passed since Bonaparte's death, and already the French monarchy and the Spanish monarchy are no more. The map of the world has changed. We have had to learn a new geography, parted from their lawful sovereigns. Nations have been flung to sovereigns taken at haphazard. Famous actors have stepped down from the stage to which nameless actors have climbed. The eagles have taken flight from the crest of the tall pine, fallen into the sea, while frail shellfish have fastened onto the sides of the still protecting trunk. As in the final result all runs to its end, the terrible spirit of novelty which was passing over the world, as the Emperor said, to which he had opposed the crossbar of his genius, resumes its course, the conqueror's institutions decay. He will be the last of the great individual existences. Nothing henceforth will predominate in low and levelled societies. The shade of Napoleon will tower alone at the extremity of the destroyed old world, like the phantom of the deluge at the edge of its abyss. A distant posterity will discern that shade across the gulf, into which unknown centuries will fall, until the appointed day of the social rebirth. Since it is my own life which I am writing, while busying myself with others, great and small, I am obliged to mix this life with men and things, when it happens to be recalled. Did I, in one flight, without ever stopping, pass through the memory of the transported one who, in his ocean prison, awaited the execution of God's decree? No. The peace which Napoleon had not concluded with the kings, his jailers, he had made with me. I was a son of the sea like himself. My nativity was one of the rock like his. I flatter myself to have known Napoleon better than they who saw him oftener and approached him more closely. Napoleon at St. Helena, ceasing to have occasion to maintain his anger with me, had abandoned his hostility. I, becoming more just in my turn, wrote the following article in the Conservateur. The nations have called Bonaparte a scourge, but the scourges of God retain something of the eternity and grandeur of the divine wrath whence they emanate. Ye dry bones, I will send spirit into you, and you shall live. Born in an island to go and die in an island, on the boundaries of three continents, cast in the midst of the seas in which Camoens seemed to foretell him by placing there the genius of the tempests. Bonaparte cannot stir on his rock, but we are apprised of it by a concussion. The step of the new Adamaster at the other pole makes itself felt at this. If Napoleon, escaping from the hands of his jailers, were to retire to the United States, his looks fixed upon the ocean would be enough to disturb the nations of the old world. His mere presence on the American shore of the Atlantic would oblige Europe to camp on the opposite shore. This article reached Bonaparte at St. Helena. A hand which he thought hostile poured the last balsam on his wounds. He said to M. de Montalon, If in 1814 and 1815 the royal confidence had not been placed in men whose souls were enervated by circumstances too strong for them, or who, renegades to their country, saw safety and glory for their master's throne only in the yoke of the Holy Alliance, if the Duke de Richelieu, whose ambition it was to deliver his country from the presence of the foreign bayonets, if Chateaubriand, who had just rendered such eminent services at Kent, had had the direction of affairs, France would have issued powerful and dreaded from those two great national crises. Chateaubriand has been gifted by nature with a Promethean fire. His works witness it. His style is not that of Racine, it is that of the prophet. If ever he arrives at the helm of state, it is possible that Chateaubriand may go astray. So many others have found their ruin there. But what is certain is that all that is great and national must be fitting to his genius, and that he would have indignantly rejected the ignominious acts of the then administration. Such were my last relations with Bonaparte. Why should I not admit that that opinion tickles my heart proud weakness? Many little men to whom I rendered great services have not judged me so favourably as the giant whose might I dared to attack. 
while the Napoleonic world was becoming obliterated, I inquired into the places where Napoleon himself had passed from view. The tomb at St. Helena has already worn out one of the willows, his contemporaries. The decrepit and fallen tree is daily mutilated by the pilgrims. The sepulchre is surrounded by a cast-iron grating. Three flagstones are laid crosswise over the grave. A few irises grow at the head and feet. The spring of the valley still flows in the spot where prodigious days dried up. Travellers brought by the tempest think it the proper thing to chronicle their obscurity on the brilliant sepulchre. An old woman has established herself close by and lives on the shadow of a memory. A pensioner stands sentry in a sentry box. The old Longwood, at two hundred steps from the new, is abandoned. Across an enclosure filled with dung, one arrives at a stable. It used to serve Bonaparte as a bedroom. A negro shows you a sort of passage occupied by a handmill and says, Here he died. The room in which Napoleon first saw the light was probably neither larger nor more luxurious. At the new Longwood, plantation house, inhabited by the governor, one sees the Duke of Wellington in portraiture and the pictures of his battles. A glass-doored cupboard contains a piece of the tree near which the English general stood at Waterloo. This relic is placed between an olive branch gathered in the Garden of Olives and some ornaments worn by South Sea savages, a curious association on the part of the abusers of the waves. It is useless for the victor here to try to substitute himself for the vanquished, under the protection of a branch from the Holy Land and the memory of Cook. It is enough that at St. Helena one finds solitude, the ocean, and Napoleon. If one were to search into the history of the transformation of the shores made illustrious by tombs, cradles, palaces, what variety of things and destinies would one not see, since such strange metamorphoses are worked, even in the obscure dwellings to which our puny lives are attached? In what hut was Clovis born? In what chariot did Attila see the light? What torrent covers Alaric's burying place? What jackal stands where stood Alexander's coffin of gold or crystal? How many times have those ashes changed their place? And all those mausoleums in Egypt and India, to whom do they belong? God alone knows the cause of those changes linked with the mystery of the future. For men there are truths hidden in the depths of time. They manifest themselves only with the help of the ages, even as there are stars so far removed from the earth that their light has not yet reached us. But while I was writing this, time has progressed. It has produced an event which would partake of greatness, if events did not nowadays tumble into the mud. We have asked in London to have Bonaparte's remains restored. The request has been entertained. What does England care for old bones? She will make us as many presents of that sort as we like. Napoleon's remains have come back to us at the moment of our humiliation. They might have undergone the right of search, but the foreigner showed himself compliant. He gave a pass to the ashes. The translation of Napoleon's relics is an offence against fame. No burial in Paris will ever be as good as Slain Valley. Who would wish to see Pompey elsewhere than in the furrow of sand thrown up by a poor freedman, assisted by an old legionary? What shall we do with those magnificent relics? In the midst of our miseries, will the hardest granite represent the perpetuity of Bonaparte's works? If even we possessed a Michelangelo to carve the funeral statue, how would one fashion the monument? To little men mausoleums, to great men a stone and a name if at least they had suspended the coffin on the coping of the Arc de Triomphe, if the nations had seen their master from afar borne on the shoulders of his victories, was not Trajan's urn in Rome set at the top of his column? Napoleon among us will be lost in the mob of those tattered Amalians of dead who steal away in silence. God grant that he may not be exposed to the vicissitudes of our political changes, protected though he may be by Louis XIV, Vauban and Turenne. Beware of those violations of tombs so common in our country. Let a certain side of the revolution triumph, and the conqueror's dust may go to join the dust which our passions have scattered. Men will forget the vanquisher of the nations to remember only the oppressor of their liberties. The bones of Napoleon will not reproduce his genius. They will teach his despotism to second-rate soldiers. Be this as it may, a frigate was applied to a son of Louis-Philippe. Her name dear to our ancient naval victories protected it on the waves. Sailing from Toulon, where Bonaparte had embarked in his might for the conquest of Egypt, the new Argo came to St. Helena to claim what no longer existed. The sepulchre, with its silence, continued to rise motionless in Slane or Geranium Valley. Of the two weeping willows, one had fallen. 
Lady Dallas, the wife of a governor of the island, had planted to replace the decayed tree eighteen young willows and four and thirty cypresses. The spring, still there, flowed as when Napoleon drank its water. During a whole night, under the direction of an English captain named Alexander, the men worked at opening the monument. The four coffins fitted one within the other, the mahogany coffin, the lead coffin, the second mahogany, or West Indian wood coffin, and the tin coffin were discovered intact. They proceeded to the inspection of those mummified moulds in a tent, in the centre of a circle of officers, some of whom had known Bonaparte. When the last coffin was open, says the Abbe Coquereau, our looks plunged in. They met a whitish mass which covered the whole length of the body. Dr. Gaillard, touching it, distinguished a white satin cushion, which lined the inside of the upper plank of the coffin. It had become unfastened and lay about the remains like a winding sheet. The whole body seemed as though covered with a light foam. One would have said that we were looking at it through a transparent cloud. It was certainly his head. A pillow raised it slightly, his wide forehead, his eyes, the sockets of which were outlined beneath the eyelids, still fringed with a few lashes. His cheeks were swollen, his nose alone had suffered. His mouth, half open, displayed three teeth of great whiteness. On his chin the mark of the beard was perfectly clear. His two hands, especially, seemed to belong to someone who still breathed, so quick were they in tone and colouring. One of them, the left hand, was raised a little higher than the right. His nails had grown after death, they were long and white. One of his boots had come unsewn, and let through four of his toes of a dull white. What was it that struck the disinterrors? The inanity of earthly things? Man's vanity? No, the beauty of the dead man. His nails only had lengthened to tear, I presume, what remained of liberty in the world. His feet, restored to humility, no longer rested on crown cushions. They lay bare in their dust. The son of Condé also was dressed in the moat at Vincennes, yet Napoleon, so well preserved, had been reduced to exactly those three teeth which the bullets had left in the jaw of the Duc d'Anguin. The eclipsed star St. Helena has reappeared to the great joy of the peoples. The world has seen Napoleon again. Napoleon has not seen the world again. The conqueror's vagrant ashes have been looked down upon by the same stars that guided him to his exile. Bonaparte passed through the tomb, as he passed through everything, without stopping, landed at the Havre. The corpse arrived at the Arc de Triomphe, a canopy beneath which the sun shows its face on certain days of the year. From that arch to the Invalide, one saw nothing but wooden columns, plaster busts, a statue of the great Condé, a hideous pulp which ran, deal obelisk commemorative of the victor's indestructible life. A sharp cold made the generals drop around the funeral car as in the retreat from Moscow. Nothing was beautiful, except the mourning barge which had carried Napoleon in silence on the Seine and a crucifix. Robbed of his catafalque of rocks, Napoleon has come to be buried in the dirt of Paris. Instead of ships which used to salute the new Hercules, consumed upon Mount Eta, the washerwomen of Vaugirard will roam around him with pensioners unknown to the Grande Armée. By way of prelude to this feebleness, little men were able to imagine nothing better than an open-air waxwork show. After a few days' rain, nothing remained of these decorations but squalid odds and ends. Whatever we may do, the real sepulchre of the triumpher will always be seen in the midst of the seas. The body is with us, the life immortal, at St. Helena. Napoleon has closed the era of the past. He made war too great for it to return in a manner to interest mankind. He slammed the doors of the Temple of Janus violently after him, and behind those doors he heaped up piles of dead bodies to prevent them from ever opening again. In Europe, I have been to visit the parts where Bonaparte landed after breaking his ban at Elba. I alighted at the inn at Cannes at the very moment when the guns were firing in commemoration of the 29th of July, one of the results of the Emperor's incursion, doubtless unforeseen by him. Night had fallen when I arrived at the Golf Douan. I got down at a lonely house, alongside the high road. Jacquemin, potter and innkeeper, the owner of the house, led me to the sea. We went by sunk roads between olive trees, under which Bonaparte had bivouacked. Jacquemin himself had received him and guided me. To the left of the cross-path stood a sort of covered shed. Napoleon, invading France alone, had deposited the luggage with which he had landed in that shed. On reaching the beach, I saw a calm sea wrinkled by not the slightest breath. The surge, thin as gauze, unrolled itself over the sand noiselessly and foamlessly, 
an astonishing sky, all resplendent with constellations, crowned my head. The crescent of the moon soon sank and hid itself behind a mountain. In the gulf lay only one bark at anchor and two boats. To the left appeared the Antibes lighthouse, to the right the Lerin Isles. Before me the main sea opened out to the south in the direction of Rome, to which Bonaparte had first sent me. The Lerin Isles, now called the Sainte Marguerite Isles, of old received a few Christians fleeing before the barbarians. St. Honoratus, coming from Hungary, landed on one of those rocks. He climbed a palm tree, made the sign of the cross, and all the serpents died, that is to say, paganism disappeared, and the new civilization was born in the West. Fourteen hundred years later, Bonaparte came to end that civilization in the parts in which the saint had commenced it. The last solitary of those hermitages was the man in the iron mask, if the iron mask is a reality. From the silence of the Gulf Juan, from the peace of the islands of the anchorites of old, issued the noise of Waterloo, which crossed the Atlantic to die out at St. Helena. One can imagine what I felt between the memories of two societies, between a world extinct and a world ready to become extinct at night on that deserted seaboard. I left the beach in a sort of religious consternation, leaving the billows to pass and pass again without obliterating them over the traces of Napoleon's last step but one. At the end of each great epoch of time, one hears some voice, doleful with the regrets of the past, sound the curfew. Thus moaned they who saw vanish Charmaine, St. Louis, Francis I, Henry IV, and Louis XIV. What could I not say in my turn, I witness that I am of two or three lapsed worlds? When one has met, as I have, Washington and Bonaparte, what remains there to look at, behind the plough of the American Cincinnatus and the tomb at St. Helena? Why have I survived the age and the men to whom I belong by the date of my birth? Why did I not fall with my contemporaries, the last of an exhausted race? Why have I remained alone to seek their bones in the dust and darkness of a full catacomb? I am disheartened at lasting. Ah, if only I possessed the indifference of one of those old longshore Arabs whom I met in Africa. Seated cross-legged on a little rope mat, their head wrapped in their burnous, they wile away their last hours in following with their eyes in the azure of the sky, the beautiful flamingo flying along the ruins of Carthage, lulled by the murmuring of the waves, they half forget their existence, and in a low voice sing a song of the sea. They are going to die. End of Book 6, Part 2 End of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume 3, by François René de Chateaubriand